Section 1 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ju. Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. In liquid murmurs, Yarrow sings her reminiscent tune of bygone autumn, bygone springs, and many a leafy June. No more the morning beacons gleam upon the silent hills. The far back years are years of dream. Now peace the valley fills. No more the reavers down the vale on raid and foray ride. No more is heard the widow's wail, or those who fighting died. When morning damns with all its joys, then from the meadows rise a hundred throbbing hearts to voice their anthems to the skies. When noontide sleeps where brackens wave, ere shadows yet grow long, no sound awakes the echoes save the yarrow's pensive song. And when the eve, with calm delight, betokens night is nigh, Beneath the first star's tender light is heard the owlet's cry. While Yarrow's liquid cadence swells by meadow, moor, and hill, At morn or noon or eve there dwells a mournful memory still. W. Cuthbertson Section 1 Introduction 1. The Character of the Borders The district called the Border is one of the most interesting in Great Britain. It consists of that part of England that is nearest Scotland and that part of Scotland that is nearest England, mainly the counties of Northumberland, Cumberland, Berwickshire, Roxburghshire and Dumfrieshire. The country is very picturesque and highly romantic. It abounds in great rolling breezy hills with swift streamlets or burns running down their sides to swell the rushing rivers. No part of our island has more beautiful valleys than those of the border. This bold rough district, well adapted to defence and situated also just where the island of Great Britain is almost at its narrowest, became, after many a struggle, the boundary between England and Scotland. The character of the country was suited to the rearing of hardy moorland sheep and cattle. Its inhabitants, therefore, were a tough, open-air race of men, strong, strapping fellows, fearless riders, always ready for an adventure, especially if it meant fight. In those days of border strife, there was hardly such a thing as international justice. That is to say, the people of one nation were not very particular as to what they did to people of another nation. Therefore, these bold, hardy border men, Englishmen and Scot alike, were fond of creeping across the boundary to steal the cattle of their neighbours. Men devoted to such raids were called freebooters or moss troopers, the name moss being given in the north country to boggy tracts that lie about the hillsides. So it happened that the border was in a perpetual state of petty warfare, conducted, it is true, with a certain amount of goodwill and a rough approach to chivalry and with the concurrence of the powerful border nobles of both nations who often played an important part therein. At times, these raids developed into important warlike expeditions, when a fierce noble or even a king had some reckless game to play. Hence, among the ballads which give us so vivid an account of border strife, we find descriptions not only of the minor doings of picturesque sheep-stealers, but also of pitched battles, such as Chevy Chase and Homildon Hill. The Union of England and Scotland in 1603 
naturally put an end to all the former excuses for raiding, and therefore terminated the true freebooter period. After this, despite one or two belated attempts, such as Elliot's big raid in 1611, sheep stealing ceased to be looked upon as an honourable calling and became mere thieving. The men who would have raided one another's farms in 1602 became friendly neighbours after the Border Commission of 1605. There had been little malice in their former freebooting. Both sides were of one race, and they had the pleasure of finding that their lands went up greatly in value in consequence of the border peace. Today, the border presents scenes of peaceful cattle farming, but romance is still in the air, hangs about the fine breezy moorlands and beautiful dales, and is seen clearly in the faces of the healthy border folk. A holiday at any border farm would prove a most enjoyable one. There are wonderful Roman remains, for here it was that the Romans built their wall. There are castles of the border barons, the views are wide and grand, the river valleys are unmatched for beauty, and delightful wild flowers are plentiful, chief among which are foxgloves, the giant wild Canterbury bells, the handsome North Country wild geranium, several interesting kinds of wild orchids, and a variety of others too numerous to mention. Last but not least, it is often possible in the evenings to see the farmer's sons engaged in friendly wrestling in the meadows, when we can realise that these great manly fellows are of the same vigorous race that kept the borders lively a few centuries ago. End of section one. Section two of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction to A Brief History of the Border. Before dealing in detail with the stirring stories of border history and legend, to retell which is the purpose of this book, we will first inquire what is it that settles exactly the position of the border line between two countries. To find the answer, we must think what happens when a country is invaded. If the invaders are stronger than the people whom they attack, they go on thrusting back their foes till these reach some strong position where, by the aid of mountain, river or marsh, they are able, at any rate for a time, to hold their own. Thus, a borderline is always determined by some natural feature of the country, which gives the defenders an advantage. The attackers will not always operate from the same locality, and the defenders will not always fall back in the same direction. The two sides also will vary in power from time to time. For these reasons, a borderline, especially in the old fighting days, was often altered. When the Romans invaded Britain, they gradually conquered the southern part of it, but they could not subdue the wilder north. One of their boundary lines was drawn from the Solway to the Tyne. Then they fought their way further north, and their next definite boundary was a line running from the Forth to the Clyde. Along each of these boundaries they built a great wall, and to this day parts of these Roman walls remain. But it is worth noting that neither of these wall borderlines stands upon the present border, one being all in England and the other all in Scotland. When the Romans left Britain, called back to defend their own native land from invasion, there followed a brief period for which we have no definite record of events in this island. This is the period of King Arthur, and none can say how much is true in the Arthurian legends. But history begins to become clear again 
about the time that the Angles came in their ships across the North Sea, bent on conquest. They landed on all the natural harbours of the east coast, driving the Britons back and taking the land for themselves. The fact that they landed on the east and drove the Britons westward leads us to think that sooner or later a boundary would have been formed dividing the island into the east side for the Angles and the west side for the Britons. Now that is exactly what did happen. The border lines were nowhere like the present ones. The northern kingdom of the Angles reached to the fourth, where these people founded Edinburgh, Edwinsburg. On the west, the Britons had sway in Cornwall, Cornwallis, Wales, Cumbria, which stretched from the Mersey to the Solway, and Strathclyde, from the Solway to the Clyde. North of the Forth was the country of the Picts, while the Scots were a race recently come from Ireland, and they only owned what we now call Argyleshire, and the islands lying near to it. Not one inch of the present border was at that day in the border line. Of the various races that lay round about where the border now is, the Northumbrians seemed at first to be the strongest. The capital of their kingdom was Bamborough, a place still famous for its castle, though today it is not important enough to have a railway station. But it still looks very picturesque on the wild coast with the Farne Islands, the first seat of Northumbrian Christianity, in the near distance. Ambition had much to do with the downfall of Northumbria. The famous King Edbert would not rest content till he had scaled Dumbarton, the capital of Strathclyde. This was to his career what the march to Moscow was to Napoleon's, for though Edbert got safely to Dumbarton, 756, his army was cut to pieces in getting back again. The Northumbrians seem to have lost some of their northern lands, for they moved their capital further south to the old Roman city of Corbridge, which stood on the Tyne, just where the delightful country town of that name stands today. In 844, a king of the Scots named Kenneth MacAlpin became, we don't quite know how, king of the Picts also, joining two strong races under one ruler, and thus was powerful enough to give great trouble to the weakened kingdom of Northumbria. He several times led his army through Lothian, the district belonging to the Angles between the Forth and the Tweed, but was never quite able to conquer it. It is important to remember that up to that date, Lothian had never belonged to Scotland. The appearance of the Danes added to the confusion of those restless days. For some few years, it was doubtful whether Scot, Dane or Angle would get the best of it in Northumbria. But at last, the genius of Athelstan of Wessex revived the power of the Angles over the whole of that large part of the island which they had settled, right up to the Forth itself. Edinburgh was still English in 957, and the borderline was still very far from the present one. But there was no longer a king of Northumbria, only an earl, who was subject to the will of the West Saxon kings. This fact of the dominance of the West Saxons, whose capital was far to the south at Winchester, must have added to the weakness of the Northumbrian border. By the year 963, the Scots had conquered Edinburgh, and it was now never again to return to English rule. Before very long, the whole of Lothian had passed under Scottish control, 
but it was not yet held to be part of Scotland. Nor must it be thought that this conquest of Lothian fixed the border line in its present position, for the King of the Scots was at that time ruler over Cumberland, which had never yet been English, and was all that was left of the old British kingdom of Cumbria. Frontier wars with varying successes between Scot, Angle and Dane mark the stormy history of this time. The power of Canute held back the Scotch attempts upon Northumberland, but during a lull in the wars, the grandson of the Scottish king married the sister of Earl Siward, and received as her dowry twelve towns in the valley of the Tyne, an astonishingly imprudent arrangement. At the time of the Battle of Hastings, the earldom of Northumberland was so far distant from Winchester as to be somewhat out of the control of the King of England. The power of the Scottish kings threatened it. They held twelve towns in Tynedale, and Cumberland was a part of Scotland. The Northumbrians refused to accept William the Conqueror as their king, and had they been able to make good their refusal, they must sooner or later have been conquered by the Scots, and the borderline between England and Scotland would then most probably have been formed by the Tees, the mountain boundary of Westmoreland and Morecambe Bay. But William was not a king to be played with. He reduced Northumberland to subjection and carried his army into Scotland as far as the River Tay, where he forced the King of Scotland to admit that he, William, was his overlord. Notwithstanding this humiliation, when King William returned to Winchester, the Scots several times went back to their favourite amusement of raiding unhappy Northumberland. One of these invasions took place in the reign of William Rufus, 1093, who went north in person. He doubtless recognised the fact that owing to the Scots possessing Cumberland, they were in the strong position of being able to attack Northumberland on two sides. He took Cumberland by force of arms, and thus for the first time it became a part of England. The word Cumberland means the land of the Cumbrians or Welsh, a Saxon form of the Welsh word Cymru. Rufus rebuilt the strong fortress of Carlisle to defend his new border at its weakest corner. For the most part, this border is excellently protected by the natural rampart of the wild Cheviot Hills and is in every way as good a border as could be devised. It runs in a fairly straight line from southwest to northeast across a narrow part of the island. But although this borderline proved to be a permanent one, it must not be thought that it remained undisputed. The times were rough and hardy fighting folk lived on the border. They had many grounds for quarrel and took advantage of them all. For one thing, the exact boundary of Northumberland was never quite defined till 1552, up to which year there was a tract of land between the rivers Esk and Sark, which was claimed by both countries, and therefore called the debatable land. Then the Scots maintained that they were overlords of Northumberland, while the English kings cherished the notion that they were overlords of the whole island of Britain and the wild spirits on both sides were always ready to fight. Out of this fighting spirit sprung the stirring history of the border, which forms the theme of the deathless ballads, the stories of which it is now our purpose to retell. End of section 2《Of Stories of the Scottish Border》by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ju. Introduction. 3. What the Border Names Tell Us. 
Many a name holds a meaning wrapped up within itself, like a nut in its shell. For instance, Edinburgh is a Saxon name, Edwin's Burg, and the word tells us that this noble city, though now the capital of Scotland, was originally founded by and belonged to a Saxon king of Northumbria. The Highlanders, in their own Gaelic language, called it Dunedin. This has the same significance as Edinburgh, but like most Gaelic names, it is arranged in the reverse order to that in which an English name is generally put together. Dun means Burg, Edin is Edwin. This is the same Dun that we have in Dundee, which means the Burg on the Tay, and might be translated as Tabra. Dumbarton means the Burg of the Britons, and teaches us another notable lesson, namely how far north in the old times the British influence extended. For British in this case means Welsh. Nowadays we associate the Welsh with Wales only. Formerly there must have been a numerous colony of Welsh in Scotland, as the name Dumbarton testifies, as also many Scottish family names. The great name of Wallace itself, for instance, suggests such an origin, for Wallace is merely a corrupt form of the word Welsh and proves that the great national hero was of Welsh extraction. Then Cumberland, Cymru land, means the land of the Welsh, or Cymru as they call themselves. The county of Cumberland did not really belong to the English till the time of William Rufus. The first syllable of Carlisle denotes a Celtic fortified town and must be compared with the first syllable of Carnarvon. The presence of the Roman wall is shown in many names in Northumberland, such as Wall's End, Wall Town, Walridge, Heddon on the Wall, Wall Houses and Thirlwall. For a very interesting instance of what a name tells us, we may leave the border for a moment and consider why the northernmost part of Scotland is called Sutherland. It must have been so named by people living in the Orkney and Shetland Isles of a different race from the Scotch, that is, North settlers in those islands. With regard to surnames, how many stop to think that Oliphant is merely a form of elephant, and was originally an allusion to a big, burly ancestor. Grant, which is the same as Grand, must also have been once applied to one who was a giant in size. The Frasers somehow got their name from the French word for a strawberry, fraise. The odd-looking scrimger means simply a scrimmager or skirmisher. Turnbull recalls one who turned the bull at a bull baiting. The well-known Gladstains or Gladstone has nothing to do with glad, but is from gleed, an old word for the kite, and commemorates some stone where these birds frequented. A clue is from the killing of a buck in a clue or ravine. The Christian names of the borderers are full of life and local colour and differ much from those of southern England. Bartram is the northern form of Bertram, Nigel of Neil, Jelen of Julian, Ringan of Ninian. It was the general custom to abbreviate Christian names or use them in the diminutive form as is constantly the practice in these border ballads. Hobby stands for Hulbert, a fine old name which must not be confused with Albert. Dandy or Dandry is Andrew. Ecky is Hector. Lammy is Lambert. Lenny is Leonard. Adam becomes in the familiar form Achy. Christian becomes Christy. Gilbert becomes Gibby. Another peculiarity of the ballads is the regular recurrence of such phrases as 
The Laird's Jock, The Laird's What, Ringan's What, etc. These expressions mean John the son of the Laird, Walter the son of the Laird, Walter the son of Ringan, or Ninian. End of section 3 of Stories of the Scottish Border Recording by Zhu Section 4 of Stories of the Scottish Border This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. Chapter 1. Bamburgh and its Coast. The little town of Bamburgh has two striking features, the great castle upon its stern rock and the wild coastline at its feet, where dash the storms of the North Sea. Today, it is not important enough to have a railway station of its own, yet once it was the capital of the great Saxon kingdom of Northumbria. Its original name was Bebumbra, so called after Queen Beba. Of its Saxon fortress, hardly a trace remains, the present building being partly the old Norman castle, with repairs and additions of a later date. The ancient pile has a strength, dignity and grandeur, which accords well with its truly noble situation. The North Saxons, in choosing such a spot for their capital, showed a very evident desire to keep in touch with the sea. Over the sea they had come, and over the sea would come both friends and enemies. Many a meeting of both friend and foe has taken place at Bamburgh. Perhaps the fiercest of the enemies was Ragnar of the Hairy Breeches, a famous Viking who plundered, ravaged and burnt without mercy. These Vikings, powerful men and fearless sea rovers, were a standing terror to Northumbria. Men with frames and muscles strong as iron, at home both on the sea and on the battlefield. Fair-haired, blue-eyed men, guarded by helmet, breastplate and shield, armed with heavy weapons, because at that date the art of the smith was not equal to making them sharp, light and strong at once. So these mighty warriors hewed their way through the field of battle with great strokes, and when their foes fled in terror, the Vikings took back to their ships all the treasure they could find, and away they went across the sea again. But with all their fierceness, they loved poetry, wild war poetry, most of it, and they loved their strong, brave women. Ragnar was a thorough Viking. He loved fighting, and his handsome wife, and the battle songs he made. But the Saxons had no cause to love him, and when his ship ran aground near Jarrow, they bound him and cast him into a pit of snakes, and watched him slowly die. The Viking had no fear of death. He sang as he lay there of his life and his deeds, of the great banquets he had given to the wolves and the vultures, and the fierce battles he had won, spreading the terrors of his name from the Orkneys to the Mediterranean, of his beautiful wife and strong sons, and of how they would avenge him, and of how Woden, the lord of all warriors, was calling him to his hall. Many a battle has been fought on that wild coast since Ragnar died. Much history has been made thereabouts, and many legends have attached themselves to Bamburgh. Like most famous places, it had its own special dragon, the Laidly Worm, or Loathsome Serpent of the ancient ballad. For seven miles east and seven miles west, and seven miles north and south, no blade of grass or corn would grow, so venomous was her mouth. And yet, when the gallant knight gave her kisses three, she changed at once into a beautiful lady. But despite its castles, 
its battles and its legends, Bamburgh slowly declined in importance. As the capital of Northumbria, it had been one of the chief towns in England, but the gallant Northumbria of the Saxons was more open to enemies than any other part of the country. Cumbrians were on the west and Scots on the north, and this was of all Saxon kingdoms the most exposed to the ravages of the Danes. From the capital of a kingdom it became the capital of a county, Bamburghshire, returning two members to Parliament in the reign of Edward I. But it grew of less and still less importance, till at last it was known only to the student of history. It shared this fate with Lindisfarne, called Holy Island, once the Canterbury of the North, on whose rocky shores still stand the ruins of the fine Norman cathedral, which took the place of the old Saxon one. Lindisfarne and Bambra, neighbours divided only by a narrow belt of sea, two names that conjure up vivid pictures of romantic history. Yet suddenly, early in the 19th century, the great deed of a splendid heroine lent new glory to the wild, sea-girt town. Grace Darling was born at Bambra in 1817, in a cottage on the south side of the village street, which can still be seen today. Her father became keeper of the lighthouse on the Langstone, a rocky islet five miles from the coast, guarding ships from the dangerous Farne Islands, a group of iron-bound rocks where seabirds dwell. In the early morning of September the 7th, 1838, during the raging of a most terrible storm, she heard the crash of a ship dashed upon the rocks and anguished cries. As soon as dawn enabled them to see, the girl and her father made out the dark outline of the wreck and the miserable forms of the mariners crouching on rocks from which the rising tide would sweep them inevitably to death. With superb heroism, Grace and her father pushed their small boat into the furious waters, and after strenuous and dauntless efforts, always at the peril of their own lives, they saved the whole ship's company, nine souls in all. So fierce was the storm that it was three days before a boat dared take them from the Langstone to the mainland. The roar of approbation which greeted her from the whole country found her as modest as she was brave. But for all her courage, this noble girl was not strong. She died four years later, and lies buried at Bambra, within sound of the sea. And the Langstone is known today as Grace Darling's Island, and the tomb of the brave girl rouses sweeter memories than the frowning fortress of Bambra. End of section four of Stories of the Scottish Border. Chapter one, Bambra and its coast. Section five of Stories of the Scottish Border. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. Chapter 2. Athelstan at Vinheath. Famous among the old Norse sea rovers was Egil, son of Skallagrim. In the course of his many voyages, he visited all the lands between the White Sea and the Bay of Biscay, and when at last he settled down in his Iceland home, where he lived on till well past the age of eighty, he loved to gather his children and grandchildren around him by the fireside during the long Icelandic winter, and tell the story of his adventures. He was a true Norseman, fond of the sea and the fight, fond of his wife and children, fond of song at which he was highly skilled, his songs and his stories of adventure were listened to with eagerness, and they were repeated after him, and were at last written down, probably between 150 and 200 years after his death. Books were scarce in those days, and stories were treasured and faithfully retold. So this story of Egil was probably written out very much in the simple, vigorous style in which the old warrior would have told it to his grandchildren, as they listened to him with wide-open, wondering eyes. 
and as the old man had taken part in an early battle between Saxon, English and Scots upon the border, we have here a fine picture of how fights were fought in the reign of King Athelstan. Egil was speaking to Icelandic children who knew little about England. So he began by telling them how, in the days when Harold Fairhair was King of Norway, Alfred the Great was the first supreme king over all England. When Alfred died, he was succeeded by his son Edward, who was followed by Athelstan the Victorious. In Egil's day, Athelstan was young and had but just been made king, and many chieftains, who had kept quiet before, now thought that the time had come when they could do as they pleased again. But Athelstan meant to show them that he too could rule England strongly and wisely. These were the days of brute force, and the king had first to get an army together. Besides his own English folk, many roving Norsemen came to take his pay, and among the number were Egil and his elder brother Thorolf with their men. They saw the king himself, who received them well. Athelstan was a good Christian, known as the Faithful, and he desired that Thorolf and Egil should submit to be marked with the cross, that they might take their place by his Christian soldiers without quarrel. This they agreed to, and the king gave them command over three hundred men. Now Olaf the Red was king in Scotland. His father was a Scot, but his mother was a Dane of the family of Ragnar with the hairy breeches, that savage old Viking. Northumberland, which in those days extended to the Humber and included York as its chief city, was half full of Danes, and King Olaf wished to claim it for his own and add it to Scotland. Athelstan had set Earl Afgir and Earl Gudrek to rule Northumberland and defend it from the Scots, but Olaf of Scotland came south with his mighty host. There was a fierce battle. Earl Gudrek was slain, and Earl Afgir fled. When Athelstan heard of the triumph of Olaf, he began at once to march northward with all the men he could get together. But he was yet young, and some of the treacherous earls, hearing that Olaf had so far been victor, deserted King Athelstan. Chief among these traitors were Earl Hring and Earl Adils, who should have been in the very front of the English army, but who basely went over to the Scots. Thus Olaf's host became exceeding great, greater by far than the English army. Then Athelstan called together his captains and his counsellors. Egil was there and heard all the grave talk as to what should be done. At last a plan was made that all thought good, and this is what followed. First, Messengers were sent to King Olaf, saying that King Athelstan would meet him in fair fight at Vinheath by Vinwood in Northumberland, where he would mark out the field of battle with rods of hazel. He who won the battle should be king over all England. The armies should meet a week hence, and whichever was first on the ground should wait a week for the other. King Olaf should bide quiet and not harry the land, till the battle was ended. North of the heath was a town. There King Olaf stayed, for there he could best get provisions for his army. But some of his men he sent to the heath to view it. The hazel poles were already set up on the large level plain. A river was on one side, and a wood was on the other. And where river and wood were nearest to one another, there King Athelstan's tents were pitched. Many tents there were, but the front line of tents stood high, so that the Scots could not see how many were behind. Every third tent was empty, but many men were sleeping on the grass in the open, so that the Scots might think that the English had a large army there. Every day more English troops came in, and when the time was come that was fixed for the battle, English envoys went to the King of the Scots, asking if there need be the great fight and bloodshed that threatened. If Olaf would go peaceably home, 
Athelstan would give him a shilling of silver for every plough that ploughed in England. The Scots took counsel together and said they must have more than this. Then the messengers begged a three days' truce to consider this. On the third day they came again, saying that King Athelstan would give what he offered before, and also to the Scottish army, a silver shilling for every free man soldier, a silver mark for every lesser officer, a gold mark for every captain, and five gold marks for every earl. But the Scots asked not only for this, but also for Northumberland to be yielded to them. Then the English messengers answered that Scottish messengers must ride back with them to take the answer from Athelstan himself. Now the truth is this, that the Scottish king had taken Athelstan by such surprise that he needed time to get his men together. All these messages were but a trick to gain time till the king should come up himself with all the men he could gather. When, therefore, the messengers rode up to King Athelstan, he had but just arrived on the scene of battle. And when he heard the message, he said, Tell King Olaf this, that I will give him leave to return to Scotland safely, if only he give back all he has unjustly taken from this land, and if he own himself my under-king, holding Scotland for me at my behest. This proud answer made the Scottish messengers at once see what had been going on, so they hastened back to their king to tell him how they had been received and what the meaning of it was. When the Scots found that the English had thus outwitted them, they took counsel together in some anger. Earl Adils, he who had deserted the English, said that he and his brother, Earl Hring, would that very night make a surprise attack. If it succeeded, well and good. If not, then they could easily withdraw, and the main battle could begin in the morning. This the King of Scots held to be good advice. So the two traitor earls and their men moved southward under cover of the darkness. But Thorolf the Norseman was used to the ways of war, and his sentries were alert and blew a great war blast on their horns, and thus the fight began. Thorolf was armed with a massy halberd that stood taller than a man. Broad was its blade and thick its socket, and it ended in a four-edged spike. He had a strong sword by his side and a big heavy shield on his left arm. He had a helmet, but no shirt of mail. His brother, Egil, was armed in much the same way. The Norseman's standard was borne by Thorfid the Strong. Next to the Norseman, in the first rank also, was the division led by Earl Alfgeir, he who had once before fled from the Scots. King Athelstan gave him this chance to redeem himself. Now when the first onslaught of the Scots took place, Earl Adils came against Earl Alfgeir, while Earl Hring came against the Norsemen. And now the battle began. The two traitor earls urged on their men who charged with spirit. The fight was fierce, and soon Alfgeir gave ground. This made the foe press on the fiercer, and before long Alfgeir was in full flight. He avoided the town where Athelstan was, and fled night and day to the coast, where he took ship out of the country he had served so ill. Adils did not dare to pursue him far, for fear of being himself cut off from his friends, so he returned to help his brother Hring against the Norsemen. Thorolf, like a true general, saw the danger of this, and at once told Egil to turn aside with half their force to prevent Adils from joining his brother. The Norsemen fought a grand fight, but were badly outnumbered, and the battle seemed to be going against them. Then Thorolf became furious. Disdainful of life, he cast his shield behind his back, grasped his great halberd with both hands and sprang forward, hacking down all who opposed him. Straight for Hring's standard he went, nothing could stop him. He slew the standard-bearer, 
cut through the standard pole, and with a mighty stroke thrust his halberd right through the body of Hring, the traitor earl, and lifted him up in the air, that all might see that he was slain. Then Adils and the rest of the men fled to the wood, and thus ended the first part of the fight. More was to come on the morrow. At dawn, the next day, King Athelstan came forward with his main army. He had heard of the great deeds of the brothers Thorolf and Egil. Most courteously he thanked them, and said he would always reckon them as his friends. Then, with his captains, he made his plans for the battle. Egil he put in command of the front ranks of his men, and Thorolf he set aside to face those of the Scots who might charge the English in loose array. For this is the way of the Scots, he said. They dash to and fro, rush forward and hither and thither, and are dangerous except to a commander who is both wary and bold. Egil said, I would rather that Thorolf and I were near together, but Thorolf answered, as the king commands, so will we do. The battle began, and soon waged furiously. Thorolf and his men pressed forward along the woodside, hoping to take the enemy on the flank. Now, unknown to him, Adils and his followers were hiding among the trees, and of a sudden Adils sprang out and smote him down. Thorfid too, the brave standard-bearer, was pressed back, but rallied the men who fought desperately. The Scots had raised a great shout at the fall of Thorolf, and this was heard by Egil, who, when he saw the standard force back, feared that his brother was dead, for Thorolf had never drawn back from any foe. So with a fierce cry, Egil hacked his way through to that part of the field, and when he learnt the truth from his men, he never rested, till he had slain Adils with his own hand. The followers of Adils then fled, and Egil and the Norsemen hewed their way through the flank of the Scottish force towards the place where King Olaf's standard was. Noting this, King Athelstan, that wary general, caused his own standard to be set forward, and all his army to attack at once. Fierce and furious was the fight, and great was the slaughter, King Olaf was slain with great numbers of his men, and the rest fled in confusion. The English victory was complete. As soon as Athelstan saw that victory was his, he left the pursuit to his captains, and hastened to the town to make his arrangements. Egil pursued far and fiercely, and when at last he came back to the battlefield, his first thought was for his dead brother. Worn out though he was, he would take no rest until he had buried the warrior with full honours, with his arms and his raiment. And before the sad farewell was said, Egil clasped a gold bracelet on both of Thorold's wrists to show his deep love. Then they buried the hero deep and put a high cairn of stones over him. Then one last tribute Egil paid to his brother, the greatest of them all. Among these old Norse warriors, there existed a great love of song. The great fighters strove also to be great song-makers, and Egil was famous above most for this power. The Norsemen's poems had not rhymes like ours. They had short, vigorous lines, and in each pair of lines, three of the important words had to begin with the same letter. Wild, strong chants they were. This is the song that Egil sang at the burial of his brother, Thorolf Skallagrimson. The halberg of the hero hewed down the foe before him. Then in the brunt of battle was spilt brave Thorolf's blood. The grass is green on Vinheath, where sleeps my great-souled brother, but death in doubled sorrow our doleful hearts must bear. When Egil got to the town, he found the king and his army making merry over their victory at a huge feast. The courteous king saw Egil and bade him come and sit near to him. The king watched the burly Norseman who was tall with broad shoulders, a powerful head and mighty strength. But now his head was bent forward and he kept his sword across his knees 
and now and again half drew it and then clashed it back into its scabbard like a man who fights with heavy thoughts. He ate little and drank less. Then King Athelstan, watchful and courteous, took a gold ring from his arm and placing it on his sword point, handed it thus to where Egil sat. At this mark of honour, the Norseman's face grew brighter. Then the king sent round his own horn for Egil to drink. So he drank to the king and sang a verse of wild poetry in his praise, made on the spur of the moment. And with this the king was much pleased. Then the king sent also for two chests full of silver, and said to Egil, These chests carry to thy father. It is fitting that King Athelstan make him some gift for the loss of his son. And do thou stay with me long, and I will give thee honour and dignity. Thus the great king, in kindness and courtesy, did what he could to soothe the grief of the warrior, and Egil stayed the winter with Athelstan. But when the summer came, he wished to go back to his own people. But he had much respect for King Athelstan, and ere he bade him farewell, he made a long poem to his glory. From the song of Egil Skallagrimson to the glory of King Athelstan. See how the kingly warrior, land warder, battle wakener, smites even to the earth the earls who rise against him. Glad is now Northumberland, this the king she needed, wise and bold of race and blood, dauntless in the battlefield. Many were the verses of this stirring song, and after each came the refrain. Scottish hills where reindeer roam own the rule of Athelstan. The king gave Egil two heavy gold rings and a handsome cloak that he himself had worn. Then the Norseman sailed away, for always near to his heart was the welfare of his dead brother's wife and child. Yea, for the rest of his long life he loved this child even as he loved his own. End of section 5, Stories of the Scottish Border Chapter 2, Athelstan at Vinheath Section 6 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3. Monks and Minstrels The wild borderland was the scene of the labours of many of the first great Christian leaders. Where the arts of war were so much practised, it was needful that the arts of peace should flourish also. Great was the influence, even in the wildest times, of these able, serious, devoted leaders of early religious thought, men like Ninian and Kentigan. Christianity first came into Britain in Roman times, and some of the Britons were converted. After the Romans quitted the country, King Arthur was the leader of the Christian Britons, and he is said to have fought with the pagan Britons, the pagan Picts, the pagan Saxons, who had begun their invasions, and the disorderly soldiers of various races, probably pagans whom the Romans left behind along the wall. In due time, the fight developed into a struggle between Christian Britons and pagan Saxons, and then the Saxons themselves began to accept the new religion. Oswald, a Northumbrian prince, had in a time of peril hidden in the island of Iona, to where the great Irishman Columba had come from Ireland as a missionary. When Oswald returned to power, he summoned to his kingdom Aidan, a high-minded Christian teacher whom he made first bishop of Lindisfarne, Holy Island. Aidan, being a Celt, had to do his work through interpreters, but he did it well and laid the foundations of Christianity and learning in Northumbria. Cuthbert was another famous missionary. Rising from shepherd boy to bishop, he impressed both king and peasant 
by the dignified simplicity and sincerity of his life. His place of meditation was a sea-girt rock by Lindisfarne, lonely and picturesque, and still called after his name. A curious fossil with the mark of a cross is plentiful there, and goes by the name of St Cuthbert's Beads. Other famous teachers were Wilfred of York, who founded the churches of Hexham and Ripon, Boisel, who founded Melrose, and Biscop, who founded Jarrow. But perhaps the most celebrated of all was Bede, the venerable Bede who lived at Jarrow and wrote 45 learned books on all subjects, including music, astronomy and medicine. All the scholars in England flocked to hear his teachings, and he was justly called the father of English learning. He it was who first introduced into England the art of making glass. His last work was to translate the Gospel of St John into Northumbrian English. This was in the year 735. Being too ill to hold a pen, he dictated to his favourite pupil. Write quickly, he said, for he felt that he was dying. It is finished, answered the lad, and the old man's heart was satisfied. In a faint, brave voice he chanted the Gloria, and so died singing. In those days there was, of course, no such thing as printing. Every manuscript was written and rewritten carefully by hand, and treasured as a sacred possession in the seats of learning. So proud were they of their manuscripts that they beautified them with illustrations in colour, Many of these manuscripts have, of course, been destroyed. For instance, the Danes in 875 burnt the priceless library of Bishop Acker at Hexham, destroying in one day the treasured collection of a lifetime. But many remain to show the love of learning which existed even then. Bishop Edfred, who lived in the little rocky island of Lindisfarne, made a copy of the Gospels, which is looked upon with wonder even today. Strings of beautiful birds and quaint animals are drawn upon his pages. Evangelists with mantles of purple and tunics of blue, pink or green. With the writing clear and beautiful, the decorations showing the greatest care and devotion, this manuscript of 1,200 years ago has been the delight of thousands and comes down to us to witness to the loving care of the scholars of old in the days before printing was known. Great as was their love of beautiful manuscripts, they had an equally noble passion for grand buildings. A superb monument of simple dignity and religious grandeur is the Norman Cathedral at Durham. Commenced by Bishop Carilef in 1093 and finished by Bishop Flambard in 1128. Occupying a wonderful position at the top of a wooded hill around which flows the beautiful River Weir, Durham Cathedral is in itself one of the noblest buildings in the world. While the church in those troublous times kept thus a storehouse of learning for serious scholars, other methods kept the people informed of the more stirring events of their day. In the old days, when no newspapers existed to tell people the news, when books were scarce and history was not taught to every lad as a part of his training, the ballad writer and the wandering minstrel played a very important part. Ballads, sometimes really fine pieces of poetry, sometimes a mere halting troop of lame lines, were made upon every occasion of local or general interest. They were sung to simple and often beautiful tunes or chants. The best of the minstrels were welcomed to the halls of the nobles and even to the king himself. The poorest of them sang on the village green. The ballads were learnt and repeated by the folk of the countryside. Some were, in later times, printed on loose sheets, but at first they were handed on from mouth to mouth. Alterations and errors often crept in, mistakes due to a sameness of sound. For instance, in the old ballad of Mary Ambry, a soldier is referred to as Sir John Major, probably meaning Sergeant Major. In one of the versions of the Battle of Chevy Chase, 
Henry Percy was said to have been killed there, whereas he really lived on to be slain at Shrewsbury. But, despite such occasional blunders, the ballads on the whole throw a vivid light on the manners and customs of the old days, as well as being usually stirring and sometimes strikingly noble and pathetic pieces of poetry. They deal as a rule rather with the side currents than with the mainstream of history, but they express themselves with such homely force and directness that they bring home to us with wonderful clearness the character of the vigorous manly men with whose doings they are chiefly concerned. During the last 150 years, many able men have laboured to collect old ballads, writing them down from the mouths of the country folk and printing them in books with notes of explanation. One of the earliest thus to collect ballads seriously was Bishop Percy. The best known is Sir Walter Scott, of whose interest in the subject Lockhart, his biographer, writes very pleasantly. Preface to many of the stirring tales in this present book are lines from the old border ballads from which they are taken. It is to be hoped that readers will be tempted sooner or later, to read the rest of these fine ballads for themselves. End of section 6 of Stories of the Scottish Border Section 7 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4. Sir Patrick Spens The king sits in Dunfermline town, drinking the blood-red wine. Oh, where shall I get a well-skilled skipper to sail this new ship of mine? Almost every collection of Scottish songs contains this picturesque old ballad, which refers to a very remote time in Scottish history, probably the end of the 13th century. King Alexander III of Scotland died in 1285. He had the bitter grief of seeing all his children die before him. His daughter, Margaret, had been married to Eric, King of Norway, and she left a daughter also called Margaret, and known as the Maid of Norway. This maid was now heiress to the Scottish throne, and it is natural to suppose that the lonely king should wish her to return to Scotland and should send a richly appointed ship to fetch her back. And although there is no strictly historical record of such an expedition, the truth of the ballad is made more probable by the fact that it opens in the fine old town of Dunfermline. Dunfermline was a favourite residence of Alexander, who was killed in its neighbourhood by a fall from his horse and was buried in the abbey there, the ruins of which beautiful structure still remain. In this ballad, the king is feasting at Dunfermline town, and calls for a skilful mariner to sail his new ship. An old knight at the king's right hand answers that the best sailor who ever sailed the sea is Sir Patrick Spens. So the king writes the letter, sealing it with his own hand, and sends it to Sir Patrick, commanding him to sail away to Norway over the white sea foam and bring home the maid. Now every good sailor dreaded the rough northern seas in winter, so though the brave Sir Patrick laughed aloud when he began to read, he wept blinding tears before he had ended. "'Who has done this deed?' he cried. Who has told the king of me and urged him to send us out at this time of year to sail on the stormy sea? Yet wind, wet, hail or sleet, we must set out, for tis we who must fetch home the maid. So they set sail on a Monday morning and reached Norway on a Wednesday. History tells us that Eric of Norway was very unwilling to part with his daughter. This probably accounts for the fact that the old ballad tells us that the Scotsman had only been there a fortnight 
when the lords of Norway began to say that Sir Patrick and his men were spending the gold of their king and queen. "'Ye lie!' cried Sir Patrick. "'Loudly I hear ye lie, for I brought with me over the sea enough red gold and white money to supply the wants of my men. Make ready, make ready, my merry men. We will sail at daybreak. Alack, quoth the men, a deadly storm is brewing. Yesterday evening the new moon was seen carrying the old moon in her arms. We shall certainly come to harm if we go to sea. Barely had they sailed three leagues, when the sky darkened, the wind blew loudly, and the sea grew boisterous. Soon they were in the midst of a terrible storm. The anger of the sea was far more dreadful than the anger of the lords of Norway. The anchors broke away, the topmasts snapped, and the waves came over the broken ship, tearing her sides asunder. Oh, where shall I get a good sailor to take the helm while I climb the tall topmast to see if I can espy land? That I fear ye never will, cried a sailor as he took the helm. And scarcely had Sir Patrick gone a step when a plank started in the ship's side and the water came pouring in. Fetch a web of silken cloth and fetch a web of twine, cried Sir Patrick and cast them down to our ship's side. For it was the custom in those days, when a leak could not be reached from inside the vessel, to cast down some closely woven stuff in the hope that the suction of the water would drag it across the leak and stop thus the fatal inrush of water. Alas, all their efforts failed. Then the ballad writer says somewhat grimly of the dandies among the Scottish lords that whereas at first they grumbled to see the water spoil their fine cork-heeled shoes, when the storm had done its fatal work, the sea was above their hats. And many was the feather bed that fluttered on the foam, and many was the good lord's son that never mair came home. The ladies rang their fingers white, the maidens tore their hair, all for the sake of their true loves, for them they'll see nae mair. O oh, lang lang may the ladies sit with their fans into their hand, before they see Sir Patrick Spens come sailing to the strand. And lang lang may the maidens sit with their good combs in their hair, or waiting for their ain dear loves, for them they'll see nae mair. O forty miles off Aberdeen, tis fifty fathoms deep, and there lies good Sir Patrick Spens, with the Scots lords at his feet. End of section seven. Section 8 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 Old Maitland. Wha holds this house? young Edward cried. O oh, wha is it o'er to me? Tis I will keep my good old house, while my house will keep me. The story of Old Maitland is said to be taken from a very old ballad and known chiefly to the people who lived in the neighbourhood of Ettrick Forest. The old folks there would while away the long winter evenings by singing of the deeds of their ancestors. And the ballad of Old Maitland, as thus chanted, was written down by the mother of James Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd. The castle of Thirlstane stood on the river Leader, and still, in its restored form, deserves its name of the Darksome House. It may have often withstood the English during the Balliol Wars, 
and hatred of the English and of Edward I is expressed with extreme virulence throughout the poem. Here is the story. There lived in the South Country a king named Edward, who wore the crown unworthily for fifty years. This king had a nephew, strong in blood and bone, who bore the same hateful name. One day, the young man came before the king, and kneeling low, he said, A boon, a boon, I crave of thee, my good uncle. Oft have I wished to take part in our long wars in fair Scotland. Grant me fifteen hundred chosen strong men to ride there with me. Certainly, thou shalt have them, and more, and I myself, though old and grey, will see thy host arrayed for battle. King Edward sent hither and thither, and assembled fifteen hundred men on Tyneside, and three times as many at North Berwick, all bound for battle, burning the Mers and Teviotdale, and up and down the Lammermoor Hills, till they came to the darksome house, called by some Leader Town. "'Who holds this house?' cried young Edward, or who gives it over to me? He was answered as proudly by a grey-haired knight. I hold my house of Scotland's king, who pays me in meat and fee, and I will hold it as long as it will stand together. Thereupon the English brought up their sows to the wall, with many a heavy sound. But the soldiers on the wall cast down blazing pitch and tar-barrels to consume the formidable machine. They also threw down stones and beams and darts from their springolds, and slew many of the English. Fifteen days they besieged the castle of Old Maitland, but left him at the end of that time unhurt within his stone stronghold. They loaded fifteen ships with as much spoil as they could carry away from the district around, and claimed that now they had conquered Scotland with buckler bow and brand. So they sailed away to France to meet the old King Edward, who was burning every castle, tower and town that he met with. They came at last to the town of Billop Grace, where old Maitland's three sons were at school. Edward had quartered the arms of Scotland with his own. "'Seest thou what I see?' said the eldest son to the youngest. "'If that be true that yonder standard says, then we are all three fatherless, and Scotland conquered up and down. Never will we bow to the conqueror. Let us go, my two brothers, and try our chance in an adventure. Thereupon they saddled two black horses and a grey, and rode before day dawn to King Edward's army. Arrived there, they hovered round, and Maitland begged to be allowed to carry the king's standard, the golden dragon. "'Where was thou born and bred, and in what country?' demanded the knight who bore the banner. "'I was born in the north of England,' answered Maitland. "'My father was a knight, and my mother a lady, and I myself am a squire of high renown, and may well carry the banner of a king.' "'Never had the son of an Englishman such an eye or brow,' answered the knight. "'Thou art more like old Maitland than any man I have ever seen. "'Yet God grant that such a gloomy brow I never see again. "'He slew and wounded many of our men.' "'At the mention of his father's name, Maitland's anger burst out, "'and lifting up a gilded dagger that hung low by his knee, he struck fiercely at the standard-bearer, and catching hold of the corner of the standard, rode swiftly away with it, crying to his brothers, "'Is it not time to flee?' "'Ay, by my sooth,' they both shouted, "'we will bear you company.' So they rode off at hot speed, the pursuers following. The youngest Maitland, turning round in the path, drew his brand, and killed fifteen of the foremost, and the rest fell back. Then he dug his spurs into the sides of his faithful grey, until both the sides ran blood. 
"'Thou must carry me away, or my life lies in pledge,' he cried. About daybreak, the brothers arrived at their uncle's castle, who, seeing the three Scottish lads with pursuers riding hard at their heels, ordered the portcullis to be drawn up and the drawbridge let down, for that they should lodge with him that night, in spite of all England. When the three came inside the gate, they leapt down from their horses, and taking three long spears in their hands, they fought till it was full daylight, killing and wounding many of the Englishmen round the drawbridge. Some of the dead were carted away in wagons, and stones were heaped upon the rest as they lay in the gutter. King Edward proclaimed at his pavilion door that three lads of France, disguised and with false words, had come and stolen away the standard, and had slain his men in their lawful attempt to regain it. "'It ill befits a crowned king to lie,' said the youngest Maitland, "'and he shall be reproved for it before I taste meat or drink.' Straightway he went before King Edward, and kneeling low, begged leave to speak a word with him. "'Man, thou shalt have leave to speak, even though thou should speak all day,' answered the king. "'Ye said,' spoke the youngest Maitland, "'that three young lads of France had stolen away the standard with a false tale and slain many men. "'We are not lads of France, and never have pretended to be. "'We are three lads of fair Scotland, and the sons of old Maitland, nor are there men in all your host, dear fighters, three to three. Now, by my sooth, said the young Edward, who stood by, ye shall be well fitted, for Percy shall fight with the eldest, and Egbert Lunn with thee, and William of Lancaster with the other, and the surviving brother shall fight with me. Remember, Percy, how oft the Scot has cowered before thee. I will give thee a rig of land for every drop of Maitland blood. So they set to, and the eldest Maitland clanked Percy over the head and wounded him so deeply that the best blood of his body ran down his hair. I have slain one, shouted Maitland to his brothers. Slay ye the other two and that will be good company. And if the two shall slay ye both, ye shall get no help from me. But Egbert Lunn was like a baited bear, and had seen many battles. And when Maitland saw that his youngest brother was having the worst of it, he could not restrain himself longer, and shouting, I am no king, my word shall not stand, he struck Egbert over the head and slew him. Now I have slain two. Slay ye one for good company, he cried. Neither shall you get any help from me, even if the one shall slay ye both. So the two brothers slew the third, and hung him over the drawbridge for all the host to see. Then they rode and ran, but still got not away, but hovered round, boasting, we be three lads of fair Scotland that fain would see some fighting. When young Edward heard this, he cried wrathfully, I'll take yon lad and bind him and bring him bound to thee. Now God forbid that ever thou shouldst try that, said the king. We have lost three worthy leaders. Wouldst thou be the fourth? Never again would I be happy if thou wert to hang on yonder drawbridge. But Edward struck fiercely at Maitland, cleaving his stout helmet and biting right near his brain. When Maitland saw his own blood flowing, he threw away his weapon, and springing angrily at young Edward's throat, he swung him thrice about and flung him on the ground, holding him there though he was of great strength. Now let him come up, cried King Edward. Let him come to me, and for thy deed thou shalt have three earldoms. Nay, replied Maitland, never shall it be said in France or in Scotland that Edward once lay under me and got up again. And with that he pierced him through the heart 
and hung him over the drawbridge with the other three. Now take from me my bed of feathers, said the king. Make me a bed of straw. Would that I had not lived to see the day that makes my heart so sad. End of section 8「Section 9 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 The Mystery of the Eldons. Before their eyes the wizard lay, as if he had not been dead a day. His hoary beard in silver rolled, he seemed some seventy winters old. High and majestic was his look, at which the fellest friends had shook. As all unruffled was his face, they trusted his soul had gotten grace. Scott, Lay of the Last Minstrel Just above Melrose, the ruined abbey of which is one of the beauties of Scotland, there rises a striking mass of three hills known as the Triple Eildons. They rise very high above the surrounding land and are steep enough to need a very hard scramble to mount to the very summit. But once at the top, the view is wonderful indeed. On a fine day, the tweed can be seen winding in and out most picturesquely till it loses itself in the low distant haze of the North Sea, 30 miles away. But even grander is the view of the entire line of the Cheviots like a huge wall, fifty miles long, seen to immense advantage from Eildon, which towers over the rich valleys of Tweed and Teviot that lie between. One of the legends of the triple Eildons is that King Arthur lies sleeping beneath them, some day to awaken. Tradition says that he fought a great battle near here by Gala Water in the Vale of Woe. However that may be, it is certain that at the foot of Eildon lie many famous dead. In Melrose Abbey lies the heart of Robert Bruce and also the body of the strong king, Alexander II. He who first subdued and made obedient the wild tribes of Argyll. Here too is buried the brave Douglas, who died so gallantly on the field of Otterburn and also of another brave Douglas, who got his death wound at Poitiers. Sir Walter Scott, who did more than any other man to spread all over the world the knowledge of Scotland, Scottish history, Scottish romance and Scottish character, lies buried on the southern side of Eildon, in the rival abbey of Dryborough. But Melrose can claim a man who in his day was an object of the deepest wonder and terror. Michael Scott, the famous wizard of the 13th century, he who brought the learning of Aristotle to expound to Western Europe, he whom Dante described as learned in every deep spell of the magic arts. Perhaps he was only a scientist, born before his time, yet even today old folk in the country remember that it was he who is said to have cleft the head of Eildon Hill into three. One of the many strange tales told of Michael Scott is this. They say that the Lord of Morpeth in Northumberland promised the great wizard a rich reward if he would only make the sea roll up the valley of the pretty river Wansbeck till it reached Morpeth, so that vessels could sail up to the town. The distance is seven miles, and the wizard, declaring the matter a most simple one, prepared his magic spell. He then said that if a certain man would run from the sea to the town, and on no account look back, whatever he heard, the desire of the Lord would be satisfied. The man no sooner started to run 
than he heard the waters following him. Faster and faster he went, and faster and faster came the ocean, dashing and roaring, never overtaking him, but always so near his heels as to fill him with ever greater and greater terror. Before he had finished the third mile, he was in such a state of alarm that he could not resist the impulse to see what was happening. He turned round, and the spell was broken. The waters had followed him thus far, but would come no further. Even the best of wizards will fail when his instructions are not obeyed. So says the story. People are free to believe it or not as they please. It is certain that the sea runs nearly three miles up the Wandsbeck Valley, and there stops. But many people think that that is explained by the natural rise of the land. The story of how Michael Scott came to divide the Eildon Hill into three runs as follows. The wizard had one very active little demon who was always bothering his master to give him something to do. First, Michael commanded him to put a barrier across the Tweed at Kelso, thinking to keep him quiet for at least a week. It was done in a single night, and again the demon demanded work. Then Michael set him to divide Eildon into three. This also was done in a night, and again the demon came clamouring for employment. So in despair, the wizard ordered him to make ropes out of sea sand. This, of course, is impossible, as the sand will not hold together. But if you go down to the shore on the southeast coast of Scotland on a dark and stormy night, you can still hear what sounds like the demon moaning and groaning over his impossible task. And there is certainly a barrier across the Tweed at Kelsco, and the Eildon Hill is certainly divided into three. So you may believe as much as you please of this story. Another tale that is told of the magic powers of this famous man relates that he was once chosen to go as ambassador from the King of Scotland to the King of France on urgent business. Instead of going, as is usual in such cases, with a number of followers, he conjured up a demon shaped like a huge black horse and rode away over the sea. When halfway across the North Sea, the horse said to his rider, What do the old women of Scotland say at bedtime? Had the magician fallen into the trap and named a prayer, the demon would have disappeared and the wizard would have drowned. But Michael Scott merely commanded his horse to go on quickly and not to talk. Very soon he came to Paris, tied his horse to the gate of the French king's palace and boldly entered and stated his business. The French king sneered at an ambassador who was not followed by a train of knights, and began at once to refuse all he asked. "'Wait a moment, Your Majesty,' said Michael, "'till you have seen my horse stamp three times.' At the first stamp, the ground so shook that every steeple in Paris rocked, making all the bells ring loudly. At the second stamp, the king heard behind him a loud crash that made him leap three feet in the air. Looking round, he saw that three of the towers of his palace had fallen. The horse raised his foot to stamp a third time, but the king was so terrified that he shouted hastily that he would grant all that Michael asked him, if only he would keep his horse from stamping. Whether this tale is true or not, Michael Scott was certainly one of the ambassadors sent to bring back the Maid of Norway to Scotland on the death of King Alexander III. He wrote many learned books and possessed many others, and they say that when he was buried at Melrose, many of these same magic books were buried with him. To this romantic district of the Eildons belonged True Thomas, Thomas the Rhymer, or Thomas of Ursel Doon, as he was variously called, who was held in awe by border folks as a prophet. The ruins of his tower are still shown by the pretty river leader, 
just about two miles above the spot where it joins the Tweed. The Rhymer seems to have died a few years before 1300, but despite the passing of six centuries, he is still remembered. The story of how he gained his prophetic powers is quite worth hearing, whether we believe it or not. The tale goes that Thomas was on Huntley Bank, near the Eildon Hills, when he saw a wonderful lady approaching him. She was dressed in grass-green silk, with a mantle of fine velvet, and the noble horse on which she rode had silver bells in its mane. Thomas was so surprised at this remarkable sight, that when the lady came near, he dropped on his knee and pulled off his cap and cried out reverently that she must be the Queen of Heaven. But she answered that she was the Queen of Fair Elfland, and dared him with a witching glance to kiss her lips. The bold and gallant Thomas did not need a second invitation, and promptly kissed the fairy when she seized upon him and fled away with him swifter than the wind. Soon all living land was left behind, and they came to a wild place where three roads met. One was a narrow path, beset with thorns and briars, and this, the fairy said, was the road of righteousness, which very few people ever troubled to find. Another was a broad and attractive road, which was the way of sinners, while the third, a pretty winding road, led to Elfland, and thither they went together. Soon there was neither sun nor moon to lighten the way, and Thomas and his companion waded through rivers above the knee. The sea moaned and roared in the dread darkness, and Thomas somehow found that they had waded oft through streams of red blood, blood that had been shed on earth. Then they came to a beautiful garden, and the Elfland Queen gave Thomas an apple to eat, saying, Take this for thy wages, true Thomas, it will give thee the tongue that can never lie. Poor Thomas turned pale at the thought of such a gift. Let my tongue be my own, he pleaded. How shall I buy or sell in any market? Flatter a prince or compliment a lady if you give me such a tongue? But the Elfland Queen would take no denial and Thomas had to do her behest. Wherefore, for the rest of his life, Thomas carried with him this gift of truthfulness. End of section nine. Section 10 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Black Agnes of Dunbar The fortress of Dunbar was always a very important one to the Scots. It commanded the coast road from England across the border to Edinburgh. Not only one of the best routes in itself, but one which had the additional advantage to the English that by following it, they could keep in touch with their ships. So it is not surprising that many stirring events in history took place at this historic town. King Edward I of England won a very important victory at Dunbar during his first invasion of Scotland, and to the place which had witnessed the triumph of the father, his son Edward II fled for safety after his defeat at Bannockburn, taking ship thence back to England. In the time of Mary, Queen of Scots, the fortress was held by Earl Bothwell. From here, he consented to the surrender of poor Mary, and here he rested in safety before his final flight to Scandinavia. Oliver Cromwell fought and won at Dunbar, his desperate battle with the Scottish Presbyterians, the fate of which for some time hung in the balance. 
Cromwell considered the place so valuable that he had new harbour works made there, and a portion of his work, forming part of the east pier of the present much larger harbour, is still to be seen. The last time that Dunbar resounded to the march of an army bent on immediate fight was in 1745, when the boastful English general, Sir John Cope, landed here to engage the highland followers of Prince Charles Edward, called the Young Pretender. Prince Charlie was at Edinburgh, and Dunbar Castle commanded the road into England. Cope asserted that the Highlanders would run away at the mere sight of his army. He marched westward, but was surprised in the early morning by his enemies when near Preston Pans. In less than ten minutes, it was the unprepared English who were flying in disorder, utterly routed. The foregoing is but a brief outline of the stormy history of those grey and ruined battlements overlooking the bleak North Sea at the southernmost point of entrance to the noble Firth of Forth. The mention of these stirring incidents, however, will serve to show what a very important place Dunbar was, and that it was necessary to Scottish safety that a strong hand should have charge of its fortress. We are now to see how at one of the most critical hours a woman was to hold command, and to hold it worthily. Early in the reign of King Edward III of England, Scottish affairs were in some confusion. King Robert Bruce had lately died, leaving a son, King David II, then only five years old. That great leader and friend of Bruce, Randolph, Earl of Moray, was appointed guardian of Scotland, but he too soon died. Edward III, anxious to interfere in Scottish affairs, agreed to help Edward Balliol to make himself King of the Scots. So an English army was again in Scotland, and one of the places they were keenest to take was the fortress of Dunbar. The castle was a very strong one. It was built on a chain of great rocks that stretched out to sea, and could only be reached from land by one road, which was, of course, strictly guarded. The lord of the castle was the Earl of March. The word March in those days meant a borderland. But he was away with the Scottish army, and his wife was in charge of the castle. She was the daughter of that brave Earl of Moray, guardian of Scotland, who has just been mentioned. The English army was led by an experienced general, the Earl of Salisbury, and he probably thought that he would not have much trouble in overcoming Black Agnes, as the dark-haired countess was called. He soon discovered that she was of heroic mould, however, for though he himself led the storming parties, she on her side, urging on her men in person, hurled back his every attack. The Lady Agnes was quite fearless and treated the siege as if it were a pastime to be enjoyed. When the English, with machines made for the purpose, hurled heavy stones against the walls, Black Agnes would call one of her maidens with a napkin to wipe off the dust that they made. The biggest of all the English war machines was called a sow, and when it was brought to the walls, the Countess cried out in rough jest that it was surrounded by little pigs. At the same moment, a mass of rock which she had caused to be loosened was hurled by her men onto the English, crushing their sow and many soldiers with it. At last, there seemed a chance for the English. Near midnight, a Scot came into their camp, saying that he was ready to betray the castle for reward. The Earl of Salisbury and some chosen knights rode carefully forward and found the gate open and the portcullis raised, as the man had promised. But for all that, they doubted if Black Agnes could so far relax her vigilance. Wherefore, instead of the Earl entering first, he sent forward a retainer. His caution was soon justified, for no sooner had this man passed the gate than the portcullis fell. It was a trick to capture the Earl, 
but the Scots were disappointed this time. The gallant English lord was loud in admiration of the brave Scottish lady who was thus defying him. Once, when examining the defences with the lieutenant, an arrow struck his companion dead. The countess's love arrows pierced to the heart, said Salisbury on his return to the camp. Despite the courtly manner in which the well-bred baron referred to the lady, however, he did not relax his efforts to overcome her. Salisbury's land forces had now surrounded the castle on the land side, while his ships at sea completed the blockade. The garrison was threatened with starvation. Greater and greater became the privations of the heroic defenders. The countess, no less brave than ever, hoped on, though ground for hope grew less and less. She could not bring herself to think of defeat, and her brave, bright face still gave courage and inspiration to all. Meantime, the story of the struggle and difficulties of the defenders was raising up helpers, and Sir Alexander Ramsay of Dalhousie got ready a light vessel filled with provisions and manned by forty brave Scots, who only waited for a dark night to make the attempt to steal past the English fleet. They lay hidden by the Bass Rock, a lofty islet at the mouth of the Firth of Forth, some seven or eight miles from Dunbar. Until one starless night they stole very cautiously down the wild coastline of Haddingtonshire, sometimes all but bumping into an English vessel in the dark. Fortune favours the brave, and despite dangers and difficulties, they got safely at last to the castle, whose distant light had been their guide. Be sure Black Agnes welcomed them. This proved to be the turning point of the long siege. With fresh hope, the garrison made a sudden sally on the English, driving back their advance guard, and after five months of fierce but fruitless attempts, Salisbury was compelled to withdraw his forces and admit defeat. Nevertheless, the English were gallant enough to sing their praises of this Scottish heroine. Their minstrels made songs in her honour, in one of which Salisbury is made to say, Came I early, came I late, I found Black Agnes at the gate. End of section 10「Section 11 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 The Young Tamlane He's ta'en her by the milk-white hand among the leaves so green. This tale belongs to the romantic side of the border minstrelsy and illustrates some of the common superstitions of olden times concerning elves and fairies. The scene is laid in the Selkirk or Ettrick Forest, a mountainous track covered with the remains of the old Caledonian Forest. About a mile above Selkirk is a plain called Carter Hoff, and here may still be seen those fairy rings of which it was believed that anyone sleeping upon one will wake in a fairy city. And here was, and perhaps still is, an ancient well. The ballad opens by telling how all young maids were forbidden to come or go by way of Carterhoff. The young Tamlane, or Tomalin, is there. And everyone going by Carterhoff is obliged to leave him something in pledge. But the Lady Janet, the fairest of the Selkirk lasses, was obstinate and declared that she would come or go to Carterhoff as she pleased, and ask no leave of him, since the land there belonged to her by hereditary right. She kilted her green mantle above her knee, and braided her yellow hair above her brow, and off she went to Carterhoff. When she got to the well, she found the steed of the elfin knight, Tamlane, standing there, but he himself was away. She had nae pulled a red, red rose, a rose but barely three, 
till up and starts a wee wee man at Lady Janet's knee. Says, why pu ye the rose, Janet, that gars makes ye break the tree, or why come ye to Carterhoff without an leave of me? Says, Carterhoff, it is mine ain, my daddy gave it me. I'll come and gang to Carterhoff, and ask nae leave o' thee. But Tamlane took her by the hand and worked upon her his spells, which no maiden might resist, however proud she might be. When she came back to her father's hall, she looked pale and wan, and it seemed that she had some sore sickness. She ceased to take any pleasure in combing her yellow hair, and everything she ate seemed like to be her death. When her ladies played at ball, she, once the strongest player, was now the faintest. One day her father spoke out and said he, Full well I know that you must have some lover. She said, If my love were an earthly knight, as he's an elf in grey, I wouldna give my own true love for no lord that ye hae. Then she prinked herself and preened herself all by the light of the moon alone and went away to Carterhoff to speak with Tamlane. When she got to the well, she found the steed standing, but Tamlane was away. She had barely pulled a double rose when up started the elf. Why pull ye the rose, Janet, says he? Why pull ye the rose within this garden green? The truth ye'll tell me, Tamlane. Were ye ever in holy chapel, or received into the Christian church? The truth I'll tell thee, Janet. A knight was my father, and a lady was my mother, like your own parents. Randolph, Earl Moray, was my sire. Dunbar, Earl March, is thine. We loved when we were children, which yet you may remember. When I was a boy, just turned nine, my uncle sent for me to hunt and hawk and ride with him and keep him company. There came a wind out of the north, a deep sleep came over me, and I fell from my horse. The queen of the fairies took me off to yon green hill, and now I'm a fairy, lithe and limber. In fairyland we know neither sickness nor pain. We quit our body or repair unto them when we please. We can inhabit earth or air as we will. Our shapes and size we can convert to either large or small. We sleep in rosebuds, revel in the stream, wanton lightly on the wind or glide on a sunbeam. I would never tire Janet to live in Elfland, were it not that every seven years a tithe is paid to hell, and I am so fair of flesh I fear it will be myself. If you dare to win your true love, you have no time to lose. Tonight is Halloween, and the fairy folk ride. If you would win your true love, bide at Miles Cross. Miles Cross is about half a mile from Carterhoff, and Janet asked how she should know Tamlane among so many unearthly knights. The first company that passes by, let them go. The next company that passes by, let them go. The third company that passes by, I'll be one of those. First let pass the black steed, Janet, then let pass the brown, but grip the milk-white steed and pull down the rider. For I ride on the milk-white steed, and I nearest the town. Because I was a christened knight, they gave me that renown. Tamlane went on to explain that his fairy comrades would make every effort to disgust her with her captive, they would turn him in her very arms into an adder. They would change him into a burning faggot, into a red-hot iron goad. But she must hold him fast. In order to remove the enchantment, she must dip him in a churn of milk and then in a barrel of water. She must still persevere, for they would shape him in her arms into a badger, eel, dove, swan, and last of all into a naked man, but cast your green mantle over me, 
I'll be myself again. So fair Janet, in her green mantle, went that gloomy night to Miles Cross. The heavens were black, the place was inexpressibly dreary, a north wind raged, but there she stood, eagerly wishing to embrace her lover. Between the hours of twelve and one, she heard strange eldritch sounds and the ringing of elfin bridles, which gladdened her heart. The oaten pipes of the fairies grew shrill, the hemlock blew clear. The fairies cannot bear solemn sounds or sober thoughts. They sing like skylarks, inspired by love and joy. Fair Janet stood upon the dreary heath, and the sounds waxed louder as the fairy train came riding on. Will-o'-the-wisp shone out as a twinkling light before them, and soon she saw the fairy bands passing. She let the black steed go by, and then the brown, but she gripped fast the milk-white steed and pulled down the rider. Then up rose an eldritch cry, He's one among us all! As Janet grasped him in her arms, the fairies changed him into a newt, an adder, and many other fantastic and terrifying shapes. She held him fast in every shape. They turned him at last into a naked man in her arms, but she wrapped him in her green mantle. At last her steadfast courage was rewarded. She redeemed the fairies captive, and by so doing won his true love. Then up spoke the Queen of Fairies. She that has borrowed young Tamlane has got a stately groom. She's taken the bonniest knight in all my company. But had I known, Tamlane, said the Fairy Queen, had I known that a lady would borrow thee, I would have taken out thy two grey eyes and put in wooden eyes. I would have taken out thy heart of flesh, Tamlane, and put in a heart of stone. I would have paid my tithe seven times to hell, ere I would have let her win you away. End of section 11. Section 12 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 The Gay Goshawk. In the opening lines of this old ballad, Lord William is talking to the goshawk, who tells his master that he is looking pale and thin and seeks to know the cause. O waley waley, my gay goshawk, gin your feathering be sheen, and waley waley, my master dear, gin ye look pale and lean. O have ye tint, lost, at tournament, your sword or yet your spear, or mourn ye for the southern lass, whom ye may not win near? I have not tint at tournament, my sword nor yet my spear. But sore I mourn for my true love, we monny a bitter tear. But wheels on ye, my gay goss hawk, ye can baith speak and flee. Ye shall carry a letter to my love, bring an answer back to me. But how shall I your true love find, or how should I her know? I bear a tongue, ne'er we her spake, an eye that ne'er her saw. O oh, weel shall ye, my true love, ken, say soon as ye her see, for of all the flowers of fair England, the fairest flower is she. The red that's on my true love's cheek is like blood drops on the snow, the white that is on her breast bare like the down of the white sea moor. And even at my love's boudoir, there grows a flowering birk, and ye man sit and sing thereon as she gangs to the kirk. And four and twenty fair ladies will to the mass repair, but weel may ye, my lady, ken the fairest lady there. Lord William has written a love letter, put it under his pinion grey, 
and he is awa to southern land as fast as wings can gay. And even at the lady's bower there grew a flowering birk, and he sat down and sung thereon as she gaed to the kirk. And will he kent that lady fair among her maidens free, for the flower that springs in May morning was not so sweet as she. He lighted at the lady's gate and sat him on a pine, and sang full sweet the notes of love till all was cush within. And first he sang a low note, and soon he sang a clear, and I the awe word o' the sang was, Your love can no win here. Feast on, feast on, my maidens o'er, The wine flows ye among, While I gang to my shot window, And hear yon bonny bird sang. Sing on, sing on, my bonny bird, The sang ye sung yestreen, For weel I can by your sweet singing, Ye are frae my true love send. O oh, first he sang a merry song, and soon he sang a grave, and soon he picked his feathers grey, to her the letter gave. Have there a letter from Lord William, he says he sent ye three. He can await your love languor, but for your sake he'll die. Gay, bid him bake his bridal bread, and brew his bridal ale, and I shall meet him in Mary's kirk. Lang, lang, ere it be stale. The lady's gone to her chamber, and a moanful woman was she, as gin she had taken a sudden brash, and were about to die. A boon, a boon, my father dear, a boon I beg of thee. Ask not that haughty Scottish lord, for him ye ne'er shall see. But for your honest asking else, will granted it shall be, then gin I die in southern land, in Scotland, gar bury me. And the first kirk that ye come to, ye's gar the mass be sung. And the next kirk that ye come to, ye's gar the bells be rung. And when ye come to St. Mary's kirk, ye's tarry there till night. And so her father pledged his word, and so his promise plight. She has taken to her bigly bower as fast as she could fare, and she has drunk a sleepy draught that she had mixed with care. And pale, pale grew her rosy cheek that was sae bright of blee, and she seemed to be as surely dead as any one could be. Then spak her cruel step Minnie, Take ye the burning lead, and drop a drop on her bosom to try if she be dead. They took a drop of boiling lead, they dropped it on her breast. Alas, alas, her father cried, she's dead without the priest. She neither chattered with her teeth nor shivered with her chin. Alas, alas, her father cried, there is nae breath within. Then up arose her seven brethren, and hewed to her a beer. They hewed it frae the solid oak, laid it with silver clear. Then up and got her seven sisters, and sewed to her a kell shroud, and every steek that they put in, sewed to a silver bell. The first Scots kirk they came to, they guard the bells be rung, the next Scots kirk that they came to, they guard the mass be sung. But when they came to St Mary's kirk, there stood spearmen all on a row, and up and started Lord William, the chieftain among them all. Set down, set down the beer, he said, let me look her upon. But as soon as Lord William touched her hand, her colour began to come. She brightened like the lily flower, till her pale colour was gone. With rosy cheek and ruby lip, she smiled her love upon. A morsel of your bread, my lord, and one glass of your wine, for I have fasted these three long days 
all for your sake and mine. Go home, go home, my seven bold brothers, go home and blow your horn. I trow you would ha gin me the scathe, the harm, but I've given ye the scorn. Commend me to my grey father that wished my soul good rest, but way be to my cruel stepdam, guard burn me on the breast. O oh, woe to you, you light woman, an ill death may ye die, for we left father and sisters at home, breaking their hearts for thee. End of section 12《Section 13 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 The Corbies. Two ancient songs have come down to us in which the principal speakers are supposed to be corbies, carrion crows or ravens, birds which feed on the flesh of the dead. In both songs, the birds discuss a dead knight upon whose rich body they wish to feed. But deep interest lies in the fact that the two songwriters present entirely different views of the case. One appeals to our feelings with a beautiful and touching picture of devotion, the knight's companions proving true to him in death. The other is far more grim and causes us to shudder at the utter loneliness of the dead man deserted by all those who in life were beholden to his friendship. Both are powerful and striking examples of ancient vigour and directness. The Twa Corbies As I was walking all alone, I heard Twa Corbies making a moan. The ton and to the t'other say, Where shall we gang and dine today? In behind yond old fail dyke, I wot there lies a new slain knight, and naebody kens that he lies there, but his hawk, his hound, and lady fair. His hound is to the hunting gone, his hawk to fetch the wild fowl home, his lady's tain another mate, so we may mak our dinner sweet. Ye'll sit on his white house bone, and I'll pick out his bonny blue een. We'll locker his golden hair, we'll seek our nest when it grows bare. Mony a one for him makes moan, but none shall ken where he is gone. O'er his white bones when they are bare, the wind shall blow for ever mare. The Three Ravens There were three ravens sat on a tree, They were as black as they might be. The one of them said to his mate, Where shall we our breakfast take? Down in yonder green field There lies a knight slain under his shield. His hounds they lie down at his feet, So well they their master keep. His hawks they fly so eagerly, There's no fowl dare come him nigh. Down there comes a fallow doe, As great with young as she might go. She lift up his bloody head, And kissed his wounds that were so red. She got him up upon her back, And carried him to earthen lake. She buried him before the prime, she was dead herself, ere even song time. God send every gentleman such hawks, such hounds, and such a le man. End of section 13. Section 14. Of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 Otterburn and Chevy Chase. It fell about the Lammas tide when more men win their hay that doughty Douglas bound him to ride into England to drive a prey. The ballads of Otterburn and Chevy Chase record the Scottish and English versions of a most stubborn border battle. Whichever of the two contains the greater amount of truth, it's clear that the day was a bloody one, and that, moreover, it was fought on both sides with a chivalrous admiration for the powers of the other, which is characteristic of those strife-loving days. Sir Philip Sidney wrote of it, I never heard the old song of Percy and Douglas, that I found not my heart moved more than with a trumpet. The ballad of Chevy Chase is of later date than its rival, and it contains certainly one misstatement of historical fact. Since Hotspur outlived the fight at Chevy Chase, 1388, and was slain some fifteen years later at the Battle of Shrewsbury, 1403. The Scottish version of the Battle of Otterburn tells us that it was about the Lammastide or haymaking time of the year 1388, when the brave Earl of Douglas, with his brother, the Earl of Murray, made a foray into England with a gay band of Gordons, Grahams and Lindsays. He burned Tyndale and half of Bamborough and Otterdale, and marching up to Newcastle, rode round the castle, crying, Who is the lord of this castle, and who is its lady? Then up spake proud Lord Percy, known as Hotspur, and said, I am the lord of this castle, and my wife is the gay lady of it. That pleases me well, answered Douglas, yet ere I cross the border hills, one of us shall die. Then Percy took his long spear shod with metal and rode right furiously at the Douglas. But his lady, looking from the castle wall, grew pale as she saw her proud lord go down before the Scottish spear. Had we two been alone with never an eye to see, I would have slain thee. But thy lance I will carry with me, said Douglas. And to complete the disgrace, this lance bore attached to it the Percy pennon. Go then to Otterburn, said Percy, and wait there for me. And if I come not before the end of three days, call me a false knight. Otterburn is a pleasant and bonny place, answered Douglas. But though the deer run wild among the hills and dales, and the birds fly wild from tree to tree, yet is there neither bread nor kale, nor aught else to feed me and my men. Yet will I wait thee at Otterburn, and give thee welcome, and if thou come not in three days' time, false lord will I call thee. By the might of Our Lady, I will come, cried the proud Percy, and I, answered Douglas, plight thee my troth, that I will meet thee there. So Douglas and his men encamped at Otterburn, and sent out their horses to pasture. But before the peep of dawn, up spake a little page. Waken ye, waken ye, my good lord, the Percy is upon us. Ye lie, ye lie, shouted Douglas. Yesterday Percy had not men enough to fight us, but if thou lie not, the finest bower in Otterburn shall be thy reward, and if what thou sayest prove false, Thou shalt be hanged on the highest tree in Otterburn. Yet I have dreamed a dreary dream. I dreamed that a dead man won a battle, and that I was that dead man. So Douglas belted on his good broadsword and ran to the field, but forgot his helmet. And Percy and the Douglas fought with their swords together till the blood ran down like rain, and the Douglas fell, wounded on the brow. Then he called to him his little foot-page, and told him to run quickly, and bring to him his sister's son, Sir Hugh Montgomery. 
"'My good nephew,' said Douglas, "'the death of one matters not. "'Last night I dreamed, O oh, dreary dream, "'but yet I know the day is thine. "'My wound is deep. "'Take thou the vanguard. "'Bury me in the bracken high "'that grows on yonder lee, "'and let no man living know "'that a Scot lies there. "'And know that I am glad to die in battle "'like my good forefathers, "'and not on a bed of sickness.' Montgomery lifted up his noble lord, while his eyes wept salt tears, and hid him in the bracken bush that his followers might not see. And before daylight the Scots slew many a gallant Englishman. The good Gordons steeped hose and shoes in the blood of the English. The Lindsays flew about like fire till the battle was ended, and Percy and Montgomery fought till the blood ran down between them. "'Now yield thee, yield thee, Percy,' cried Sir Hugh, "'or I vow I will lay thee low. "'Since it must be,' quoth Earl Percy, "'to whom shall I yield? "'Thou shalt not yield to me, nor to any lord, "'but to the bracken bush that grows on yonder lee. "'I will not yield to briar or bracken bush, but I would yield to Lord Douglas, or to Sir Hugh Montgomery, if he were here. Then Montgomery made himself known, and as soon as Percy knew that it was Montgomery, he struck the point of his sword into the ground, and Montgomery, who was a courteous knight, took him up by the hand. This deed was done at Otterburn at daybreak, where Earl Douglas was buried by the bracken bush, and Percy led captive into Scotland. And it is said that Hotspur, for his ransom, built for Montgomery the castle of Penoon in Ayrshire. But the English version of these stirring events can also claim to be heard. The ballad upon it is called Chevy Chase, which means the chase on the Cheviots. And so popular was this ballad that its name was given to a boy's game, which is so called even to this day. It tells how the Percy, from his castle in Northumberland, vowed that within three days he would hunt on the mountains of Cheviot in spite of the doughty Douglas and his men, and that he would kill and carry away the fattest deer in Cheviot. By my faith, said Douglas, when he heard of the boast, but I will hinder his hunting. Percy left Bamborough Castle with a mighty company, no less than fifteen hundred bold archers chosen out of three shires. The foray began on a Monday morning in the high Cheviot hills, and many a child yet unborn was to rue the day. The drivers went through the woods and raised the deer, and the bowmen shot them with their broad arrows. Then the wild deer rushed through the woods, only to be met and killed by the greyhounds, and before noontide a hundred fat deer lay dead. The bugle sounded, Amor! And on all sides Percy and his men assembled to see the cutting up of the venison. Said Percy, The Douglas promised to meet me here this day, yet right well did I know that he would fail. But a Northumberland squire saw the doughty Douglas coming with a mighty company, with spear and battle-axe and sword. Never were men hardier of heart and hand seen in Christendom. Two thousand spearmen bore along the banks of the Tweed and Teviotdale. Then said Lord Percy, Now leave off the cutting of the deer, and take good heed to your bows, or never had ye more need of them since ye were born. Earl Douglas rode before his men, his armour glittering like a burning coal, and never was such a bold baron. Tell me whose men ye are, said he, and who gave ye leave to hunt in Cheviot without word asked of me. Then answered Lord Percy, We will not tell thee whose men we are, and we will hunt here in spite of thee. We have killed the fattest hearts in Cheviot 
and will carry them away. By my troth, said Douglas, one of us shall die this day. Yet it were great pity to kill all these guiltless men. Thou, Percy, art a lord of land, and I am called an earl in my own country. Let our men stand by, and we will fight together. Now a curse on his crown who says nay to that, cried Lord Percy. By my troth, Douglas, thou shall never see the day either in England, Scotland, or France, when I fear to meet one man to man. Then spoke Richard Witherington, a squire of Northumberland. Never shall this be told in England, to the shame of good King Harry the Fourth. I wot ye be two great lords, and I but a poor squire. Yet would I never stand and look on while my captain fought. While I can wield a weapon, I will not fail, both heart and hand. So the English, with good heart, bent their bows, and slew seven score spearmen with the first arrows they shot. Earl Douglas stayed on the field, but that he was a good captain was truly seen, for he wrought great woe and mischief. He parted his host in three, like a proud chieftain, and they came in on every side with their mighty spears, wounding the English archers and slaying many a brave man. Then the English pulled out their brands, and it was a heavy sight to see the bright swords light on the helmets, striking through the rich mail and the cloth of many folds under it, and laying many low. At last the Douglas and the Percy met, and fought with swords of Milan steel, till the blood spurted like rain and hail from their helmets. Hold thee, Percy, said Douglas, and I will bring thee to James, our Scottish king, where thou shalt have an earl's wages and free ransom, for thou art the manfulest man that ever yet I conquered, fighting in the field. Nay then, said Lord Percy, I told thee before that never would I yield to any man of woman born. With that there came an arrow hastily from a mighty man, and struck Earl Douglas through the breastbone, and never more did he speak a word, but only this, Fight, my merry men, while ye may, my life's days are done. Then Percy leaned on his hand, and when he saw the Douglas die, he said, Woe is me! I would have parted with my land for three years to have saved thy life, for a better man of heart and hand was not in all the north country. But Sir Hugh Montgomery, a Scottish knight, when he saw the Douglas done to death, grasped a spear and rode through a hundred archers, never slackening his pace till he came to Lord Percy, whom he set upon, sending his mighty spear clean through his body, so that a man might see a long cloth yard and more at the other side. There were no two better captains in Christendom than were that day slain. When one of the Northumberland archers saw this, he drew an arrow to his bow and set upon Montgomery, until the swan feathers of his arrows were wet with his heart's blood. Not one man gave way, but still they stood hewing at each other while they were able. This battle began in Cheviot an hour before noon, nor was it half done at evensong, but they fought on by moonlight, though many had scarce the strength to stand. Of fifteen hundred English archers, only fifty-three remained, and of two thousand Scottish spearmen, only fifty-five remained, all the rest being slain in Cheviot. With Lord Percy were slain Sir John of Agaston, Sir Roger the Gentle Hartley, 
Sir William the bold heron, Sir George the worthy Lovell, a renowned knight, and Sir Ralph the rich rugby. Woe was it that Witherington was slain, for when both his legs were hewn in two, he kneeled and fought on his knees. With the brave Douglas were slain Sir Hugh Montgomery and worthy Sir Davy Liddell, that was his sister's son. Sir Charles, a Murray who refused to flee, and Sir Hugh Maxwell. On the morrow they made beers of birch and grey hazel, and many widows bore weeping from the field the bodies of their dead husbands. Well may Teviotdale and Northumberland wail and moan for two such great captains. Word came to James, the Scottish king at Edinburgh, that the brave Douglas, lieutenant of the marchers, lay slain in Cheviot, and he wept and wrung his hands, and said, Alas, woe is me, there will never be such another captain in Scotland. Word also came to London to Harry the Fourth, that Lord Percy, lieutenant of the marchers, lay slain in Cheviot. God have mercy on his soul, said King Harry. I have a hundred captains in England, as good as he, yet I wager my life that his death shall be well avenged. And this vow he kept at the Battle of Homolden Hill, where he beat down six and thirty Scottish knights on one day. But so real to the borderers was their grief over their dead, that the ballad ends with a quaint but heartfelt appeal to the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ, our ills abate, and to his bliss us bring. Thus was the hunting of the Cheviot. God send us all good ending. End of section 14section 15 of stories of the scottish border by mr and mrs william platt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 12 the douglas clan the douglas clan was at one time the strongest of all the great scotch families on the border they were wild and proud and recklessly brave and no account of the borders would be complete without the broad details of their tragic history. The first to raise the fame of the family to the highest place in honour was the brave Sir James Douglas, the friend of Bruce, and after Bruce himself, the greatest hero among the Scots of that stormy period. He was a powerful, black-haired man with a dark complexion, and was called by the English the Black Douglas. So great was the terror of his name that English mothers on the border, when their children were naughty, would tell them that the Black Douglas would get them, or, if they were fretful, they would comfort them with the assurance, Hush ye, hush ye, little pet ye, hush ye, hush ye, do not fret ye, the Black Douglas shall not get thee. Sir Walter Scott relates how, when the garrison of Roxburgh Castle were making merry at Shrovetide, the castle was surprised by the Douglas, who mounted to the ramparts where a woman was crooning the refrain to her babe. You are not so sure of that, he said, laying his hand upon her shoulder. It's pleasant to read that on this occasion the Black Douglas did not turn out so black as he was painted, and beyond her fright the woman came to no harm at the hands of Sir James and his followers. At one time the English had seized the Douglas Castle in Lanarkshire, and Sir James and his men disguised themselves and came to church on Palm Sunday when the English soldiers were worshipping there. Suddenly, in the midst of the service, Douglas dropped his cloak and drew his sword and shouted, A Douglas! A Douglas! The English soldiers were taken by surprise, 
and were killed before they could recover themselves. This deed brought Douglas great fame, but after all, it was hardly a fair fight. In 1327, when Edward III was only 15 years old, Douglas led a raid into Northumberland and Durham, which did the English much damage. Edward came after them with an English army, and the Scots, being outnumbered, were compelled to dodge up and down in order to avoid a pitched battle. But in one bold night attack, Douglas and 500 of the Scots penetrated to the king's tent and almost succeeded in taking him prisoner. Failing in this, they returned unharmed to their own country, and shortly afterwards, at the Treaty of Northampton in 1328, King Edward III agreed to acknowledge Robert Bruce as King of Scotland, and the long war between Scotland and England ended. A year later, Douglas died, but after a romantic custom of that day, he bequeathed his heart to his gallant friend, Sir James Douglas. Douglas had this heart enclosed in a silver casket and carried it hung about his neck. The war with England being over, this restless knight sought adventures in Spain, fighting against the Saracen followers of Mahomet. In one fierce battle, he and his men were surrounded by their enemies. Douglas, probably realising that this was his last fight, took the casket and flung it into the midst of his foes, crying, Go first in fight, as thou wert used to do. Douglas will follow thee, or die. He then rushed desperately after it, fighting his way on, till at last his dead body fell on this dearly prized relic, which he had guarded to the end. The casket lies buried in the Abbey of Melrose, but Douglas' body was laid in his own church. Of the bold Earl Douglas who fought and died at Otterburn, the tale is told in our last chapter. We may pass on to another famous Douglas, this time a heroine who lived in the reign of James I of Scotland, quite a different king from James I of England. When James was only 12 years old, he was taken prisoner by Henry IV of England and kept captive till he was 30. But he was given an education fit for a king, and in England he met the lady he devotedly loved, Lady Joan Beaufort, daughter of the Earl of Somerset. He addressed a beautiful poem to her and married her, and these two always most dearly loved one another. When at last his long captivity came to an end, he got back to Scotland to find the kingdom in disorder and the nobles defying the law and acting as they pleased. James, a strong and able king, set his strength against their strength and gradually got his whole kingdom into order and ruled with wisdom and justice. But in these days it was impossible to be firm without sternness and James made enemies. When he was staying at Perth one Christmas time, these enemies, led by a bold villain called Sir Robert Graham, secretly encircled the house where he was staying. The unarmed king only heard of their presence when they were advancing, fully armed to his room. He tore up a plank in the floor, seeking thus to find a hiding place. The enemies were almost at the door, and it was necessary to delay their entrance, for one minute might save his life. All the bars of the door had been removed beforehand, but a brave heroine, Kate Douglas, thrust her arm through the staples. The villains were angered to find the door barred against them and hurled their weight upon it. The Douglas heroine stood there, her pale face set hard without a cry as the crash broke the bone of her brave strong arm and the would-be murderers staggered in. But alas, the sacrifice of Kate Douglas availed nothing except to place her name upon the immortal roll of the heroes of the age, for after a brief search, the murderers found the king 
and slew him. The queen who had loved James with the utmost devotion found her love give added fierceness to her hate against his murderers. They were all tracked down, and she caused them to die with terrible tortures, the cruelest of which she reserved for Graham. Thus did great King James, milk-white dove, revenge the slaying of the husband she loved dearer than life itself. Till this time, it had seemed as if the Douglases were devoted to the good of Scotland, but in those wild, reckless times, qualities that were strong for good could also be strong for evil. When James I of Scotland was murdered, his young son was only six years old. This meant that for many years there would be no strong king able to cope with the lawless spirit of the nobles, strongest among whom were the proud, bold Douglases. The lawlessness of the times is well shown by an act of foul treachery committed by Sir William Crichton, Governor of Edinburgh, and an enemy of the Douglas family. He invited one of the earls to dinner at the castle, and while there had him seized and beheaded. It said that a bull's head was placed on the dish in front of Douglas, this being a sign that he was to be killed. The people called this Douglas's Black Dinner, and sang of the wicked deed in sorrowful verse. Edinburgh Castle, Town and Tower, God grant thou sink for sin, and even for that black dinner Earl Douglas got therein. But the new King James found, before he was twenty years old, that the Douglases themselves could act with equal cruelty and lawlessness. The king was fond of a brave young soldier named McClellan, who, having some quarrel with Earl Douglas, was thrown by him into a dungeon in his castle. So the king wrote a letter to Douglas, saying he must set McClellan free, and sent this letter by McClellan's uncle, Sir Patrick Grey. When Douglas saw Grey riding up to his castle, he at once guessed the errand. So he came out, as though he were delighted to see him, and insisted on his sitting down and having dinner with him before the king's letter was opened and discussed. But the treacherous earl had given secret orders that McClellan should be beheaded while they were dining, so that after dinner was over and the letter was read, he could say that this had been done before he had seen the king's message. Grey dared not show his anger, for fear that he too should be killed. He mounted his swift horse and rode away, but the moment he was outside the castle walls, he shook his mailed fist at Douglas and cried out, Treacherous Earl, disgrace to knighthood! Some day you shall pay for this black, base deed! Douglas mounted his men, and they pursued Grey almost to the gates of Edinburgh, but he rode for his life, and faster than they. When Douglas and the king next met, there was a stormy scene. The earl was so proud and willful that he would not bend to any of the king's wishes, or heed the king's anger in the least. So King James, mad with rage, stabbed the reckless earl with his dagger, and Sir Patrick Grey, seeing this, struck him a death blow with his axe. The king was in Stirling Castle, a powerful fortress at the top of a steep hill, when the new earl, the younger brother of the murdered man, rode up with six hundred followers and burnt and plundered the town before the king's very eyes, and added to the insult by publicly declaring that King James the Second was a lawbreaker. For three years the quarrel went on between the king and the Douglases, but it was then evident that there could be no peace between them. So at last the king's army attacked the collected forces of the strong Douglas family at a place on the borders then called Arkinholm, where the picturesque little town of Langham now stands. Here the beautiful river Esk receives the water of two smaller streams, and so it was a good place to make a stand for a fight. 
the battle was long and desperate. Three brothers of the bold Black Douglases were there, and they withstood the king's men till the rivers ran red. But their cause was hopeless. One was slain in battle, one was taken and executed, one escaped into England, and the power of the Black Douglases was gone. Thus it was that the strongest and most famous family of the Borders was broken up, because its proud leaders dared to dictate to the King himself. End of section 15section 16 of stories of the scottish border by mr and mrs william platt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 13 annick castle and the percies the castle of annick stands on a hill on the south bank of the river alm being protected on one side by the river and on another by a deep gorge it stands in a strong natural position there are traces of earthworks that seem to show that the spot was fortified in the old British days, but the earliest fact which we know certainly is that there was a Saxon fortress here held by a Gilbert Tyson, when William the Conqueror claimed England. Tyson hastened south to fight on Harold's side and was killed at the Battle of Hastings. The fortress seems to have got into the hands of a Norman knight, Ivo de Vesci, who married the granddaughter of Gilbert Tyson. King Malcolm of Scotland was killed in front of it in 1093, with 3,000 of his men. De Vesci's son-in-law was probably the knight who rebuilt the castle in the Norman style, some portions of which still remain. In 1174, William the Lion, King of Scotland, who had claimed Northumberland as his own, attacked the castles of Wark, and of Annick. Wark was defended by a gallant knight named Roger de Stuteville. William's brave men tried in vain to force their way through the portcullis, but were beaten back. Then William ordered up his perriere, a machine made for hurling stones. This, said the king, will soon smash down the gate for us. With great expectations, the machine was set in motion, but it acted so badly that it threw the stones onto William's own men and nearly killed one of his best knights. William raved in his fury and swore he would rather have been captured in fair fight than be made to look so foolish in the eyes of his enemies. He gave word to burn the castle, but the wind was in the wrong quarter and blew back the flames. So he had to give up the siege. Stutfil, like a gallant enemy, told his men not to shout taunts and jeers at the departing Scots, but instead they blew trumpets and horns and sang songs and called out a very loud and hearty goodbye. Shortly afterwards, William came before Annick, and it was then de Vesci's turn. It was Saturday morning on a hot July day, and the Scottish king's knights flatteringly told him that the English were bound to give way to him and Northumberland would be his. The king was dining in front of the castle with no helmet on, when suddenly a part of the English army made a surprise attack. The bold king leapt onto his grey charger and unhorsed the first knight he met. So quick and brave were the Scots that they had almost defeated the English, when an English foot soldier stabbed the king's horse with his lance and it fell, bringing William down to the ground and pinning him there. This turned the course of battle, the Scots were beaten back and William taken prisoner. It was in 1309 that the great Percy family first obtained possession of Annick and its domain. Henry Percy purchased it from Anthony Beck, Bishop of Durham, who had somehow obtained power over it, and the brave de Vesci family disappear. About this date, Northumberland was in a miserable condition. It was the reign of the feeble Edward II, and Bruce had invaded the four northernmost counties of England and was exacting tribute from them. The English were safe only within their fortresses. However, the brave Sir Thomas Grey, who held Norham Castle, 
did much to uphold the falling honour of England, and Henry Percy almost rebuilt the castle of Annick, which in his son's time successfully withstood a siege. But at last, peace was restored by the Treaty of Northampton in 1328, by the terms of which the English king renounced all claim to Scotland. The Percy family were of Norman origin, deriving their name from a Norman village. William de Percy crossed to England just after the Battle of Hastings and received grants of land in Yorkshire. Agnes de Percy married Jocelyn, Count of Louvain, and their son, Henry, took his mother's surname. From that year onward, the Christian name of Henry was always given to the eldest son. There were 14 Henry Percys. Even in these wild times, the Percys were distinguished by the boldness of their spirits. One of the Counts of Louvain, grandfather of the first Henry Percy, shocked the men of his day by hanging some of his enemies with the church bell ropes. It was not the hanging that was objected to. Hanging was common enough, but the use of church ropes for the purpose was thought very wicked. After they had rebuilt Annick Castle and settled down there, the Percys soon established their power in the north. At the coronation of Richard II in 1377, a Henry Percy was Marshal of England, and he was then made Earl of Northumberland. His son, Hotspur, was the most famous of all the Percys. In their time, the battles of Otterburn and Homelden Hill were fought, but they rebelled against Henry IV, and Hotspur was killed at the Battle of Shrewsbury, 1403, while his father was slain a few years later at Branham Moor, his head set up on London Bridge and quarters of his body on the gates of Berwick, Newcastle, Lincoln and London, to discourage others from following in his footsteps. Henry, son of Hotspur, was the second earl. He repaired and added to the castle and was present at the Battle of Agincourt. It was not the habit of the Percys to die in their beds, and this one was killed in the Wars of the Roses, at the First Battle of St Albans in 1455. The fact of their having taken the losing Lancastrian side in these wars kept the family under a cloud for a number of years. One of them was beheaded at York in 1572 for taking part in the Rising of the North. One of them was found shot in his bed in 1585, and another died in the Tower in 1632, so that the family could hardly be said to be quieting down. They sided with Parliament during the Civil War, but later on they favoured the Restoration. At last, there came a time when there were no male heirs left in this great line, but only a daughter, Elizabeth. She married the Duke of Somerset and had 13 children, the eldest surviving of whom was created Earl of Northumberland in 1748. But he died the year after, leaving only a daughter who had married a very able baronet, to whom was given the title of Duke of Northumberland in 1766. He very wisely took the surname of Percy and again restored the castle of Annick, putting the family estates and affairs in good order, so that the Percys of Annick Castle are Dukes of Northumberland to this day. End of section 16. Section 17 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 Hexham and Queen Margaret. The town of Hexham stands on the south bank of the Tyne, rising gradually up the hill and presenting a most picturesque appearance. About two miles above Hexham, the North and the South Tyne meet, and the combined river is broad and noble, and the hills around Hexham give strength and beauty to the scene. The commanding appearance and central position of the Priory Church adds its note of dignity, and the total effect of the town is very pleasing to the eye. 
There is no doubt that from very early times there was a town in this fine natural position. The burial grounds of primitive races have been discovered here with stone and bronze implements. The Romans had a town here of some importance, although it was four miles south of their great wall. A Roman tombstone was discovered here, nine feet by three and a half feet, showing a Roman officer on horseback, overthrowing in fierce fight a savage and scowling foe. This fine relic is set up in the church and is not the only thing to see there. The original church upon this spot was built in 674, in the reign of King Egfrid of Northumbria. Wilfred, the very able and influential Bishop of York, was the man who presided at the building of it. And there were bishops at Hexham for a couple of centuries. In 875, the Danes ruthlessly burnt the town. And nearly 1,000 years later, in 1832, there was found, buried in the ground, a bronze vessel containing about 9,000 Saxon coins of the 8th and 9th century, evidently buried to protect this treasure from the invaders. Those who buried them were probably slain before they had time to dig them up again. There was a legend of another treasure hidden between Hexham and Corbridge, and King John came to Hexham in 1201 to search for it. He returned in 1208 and in 1212, but found nothing. Time passed, and this tale of hidden treasure ceased even to be local gossip. But in 1735, by accident, it was found. The present handsome priory church must have been built about the time of King John's visits to Hexham. It is a noble building, well worth a visit. In 1725, when some work was being done in the church, a wonderful discovery was made. It was found that there was an old Saxon crypt, a narrow vault with several passages underneath the church. This was so carefully hidden that it was evidently intended as a place of refuge in danger. It was built of Roman stones, several of which have Roman inscriptions. The Scots several times attacked Hexham. Once, Sir William Wallace came there with his army, but he would not let his Scots damage the church. So that Hexham, on the whole, had a less stormy life than many of the border towns, although in 1537, when Henry VIII caused the monastery to be suppressed, the prior and five of the leading monks were hanged before the gates as a gentle reminder that they were to live there no longer. But by far the most stirring event in Hexham's history was the battle which raged there in 1464. The Wars of the Roses do not form a pleasing episode in English history. They were pitiless, and treachery was mingled with bloodshed. Desertions and executions were the accompaniment of every battle. Edward IV was coldly cruel and unscrupulous, one of the blackest figures of a black time, but romance centres round Queen Margaret, the dauntless and resourceful wife of the feeble king, Henry VI, with whom Edward disputed the throne. She it was who, making up for her husband's weakness, urged ever bravely and hopefully the cause of her son. Thus she pressed on to the very end, till that son, worthy of his heroic mother, proudly answered the taunts of his base enemies even though in their power, preferring speedy death to any lessening of his tragic dignity and dying before the eyes of the successful and exultant Edward. In this fierce drama, Hexham was but an episode. The Lancastrians had scattered after their heavy defeat at Towton. Margaret, in person, had begged a little help of the King of Scotland, a little more of the King of France, the borderland was favourable to her, and she gathered her forces together there, King Henry VI staying in Annick Castle. Lord Montague, brother to the powerful but crafty Earl of Warwick, was warden of the East Marchers for Edward, and he hastily collected the Yorkist forces. He was swift, able, and unscrupulous. 
he attacked a small body of Lancastrians on Hedgley Moor, only ten miles from Annick, and defeated them, killing their leader, Sir Ralph Percy, son of Hotspur. As this gallant man died, he consoled himself by saying, I have saved the bird in my bosom, by which poetical phrase he meant that he had saved his honour by being true to his queen. In May, the greater battle of Hexham was fought. King Henry was there in person with the dauntless Queen Margaret and her son, and their brave general, the Duke of Somerset. They marched out of Hexham to attack Lord Montague. The battle began by the village of Linnells, on the south side of Devil's Water, a stream that runs into the Tyne. The fight was desperate, for both sides knew that no quarter would be given. It's said by some that the Scots, having no interest in the war, deserted Margaret. Anyway, bit by bit the Lancastrians were forced back to the very streets of Hexham itself, two miles away. In these narrow streets, in the quarter that is still called Battle Hill, the last desperate fighters on the side of the Red Rose made their final and unavailing stand. At last the remnant fled, and no doubt many a Hexham maid and dame at the risk of her own life or limb hid that day some devoted follower of Margaret. The gallant Duke of Somerset was taken prisoner, and there and then was brought to the block in the marketplace and beheaded. The cruel Montague had not the true soldier's respect for a brave enemy, whose blood thus mingled with that of his men. Other nobles were taken as prisoners to Newcastle, but Edward also was devoid of mercy, and all perished. Till the last moment, the Queen hoped on. She was not daunted by scenes of strife and bloodshed. When defeat was an accomplished fact, she and her young son fled to the Dipton Woods, where they fell into the hands of rough men, some say a party of Yorkist stragglers. Whilst these men were eagerly dividing and quarrelling over the Queen's jewels, she and the Prince slipped away, for worse than robbers were hunting for them around Hexham. Suddenly an outlaw stood in their path with drawn sword. Even after that day of stir and terror, Margaret's courage did not fail her. She boldly declared to the man that she was the Queen of England, and with her was her only son. Now, if he chose to betray them, he could do so, but if he had that natural nobility that hailed gladly great chances to do great deeds, now was his time to prove himself a man and to save the ill-fated prince and his queen. The robber bowed before her as though she were on her throne and as if the trees were her army around her. He swore to die a hundred deaths rather than betray his rightful sovereign and her prince. He honourably kept his word, and through his safe guidance and steady devotion, both Queen and Prince were able to join King Henry in Scotland, to which place he had safely escaped. Thus, the bandit of Hexham proved himself to be a truer man than either Lord Montague or Warwick, the Kingmaker, or King Edward IV of England. End of section 17「Fair Helen of Kirkconnell » Very simple, very touching is the story of Fair Helen of Kirkconnell. This beautiful maiden had two lovers, one rich, one poor. Her friends favoured the rich one. She loved the poor one. She and her chosen lover used to meet secretly in the romantic churchyard of Kirkconnell by the side of the river Kirtle. Learning this, the rejected lover crept up one evening with his carbine to shoot his lucky arrival. Helen saw him at the moment of firing and threw herself forward to receive the shot in her bosom 
and so save her lover's life at the cost of her own. The ballad describing the grief of her lover is one of the most beautiful and touching pieces of poetry in existence, and must be given here entire. Fair Helen I wish I were where Helen lies, Night and day on me she cries, Oh that I were where Helen lies, On fair Kirkconnell Lee. Cursed be the heart that thought the thought, and cursed the hand that shot the shot, when in my arms bird Helen dropped, and died to succour me. O oh, think ye not my heart was sair, when my love dropped, and spake no more. There did she swoon we mickle care, on fair Kirkconnell Lee. As I went down the water side, none but my foe to be my guide, None but my foe to be my guide on fair Kirkconnell Lee. I lighted down my sword to draw, I hacked him in pieces small, I hacked him in pieces small, For her sake that died for me. O Helen, fair beyond compare, I'll make a garland of thy hair, Shall bind my heart for evermore, Until the day I die. Oh, that I were where Helen lies, Night and day on me she cries, Out of my bed she bids me rise, Says, haste and come to me. O oh, Helen fair, O oh, Helen chaste, If I were with thee, I were blest, Where thou lies low and takes thy rest, On fair Kirkconnell Lee. O oh, that my grave were growing green, A winding sheet, drawn o'er my een, and I in Helen's arms were lying on fair Kirkconnell Lee. I wish I were where Helen lies, night and day on me she cries, and I am weary of the skies for her sake that died for me. End of section 18「19 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Johnny of Bredisley Johnny of Bredisley, outlaw and deer stealer, was one of the broken men, as they were called, the Ishmaels of the border. Johnny rose up one May morning and called for water to wash his hands. He ordered to be unleashed his good grey dogs that were bound with iron chains. When his mother heard that he had called for the dogs, she wrung her hands. Oh, Johnny, she cried, for my blessing, do not go to the greenwood today. Ye have enough of good wheat bread, enough blood-red wine. Therefore, Johnny, I pray, stir not from home for any venison. But despite his mother's tears, Johnny busked up his good bent bow and his arrows, and went off to Durry's deer to hunt down the dun deer. As he came by Merrimass, he spied a deer lying beneath a bush of firs. Johnny let fly an arrow, and the deer leapt as the pitiless shaft found its mark, and between the water and the bray his good hounds laid her pride. So Johnny cut up the venison, giving the liver and lungs to his faithful hounds, as if they had been Earl's sons. With such zest did they eat and drink that Johnny and the dogs fell asleep, as if they had been dead. Then, as they lay, there came by a silly old man, and as soon as he saw the poachers, he ran away to Hislington, where the seven foresters were. What news, they asked, what news bring ye, ye grey-headed carl? I bring no news, said the grey-headed carl, save what my eyes did see. As I came down by Merrimass among the stunted trees, 
the bonniest child I ever saw, lay asleep among his dogs. The shirt upon his back was of fine Holland, his doublet over that was of Lincoln twine, his buttons were of the good gold, the mouths of his good grey hounds were dyed with blood. Now Johnny, like many another free-hearted outlaw, was a well-liked man. So the chief forester said, If this be Johnny of Bredisley, we will draw no nearer. But this was not the spirit of his men. Quoth the sixth forester, If it indeed be he, rather let us slay him. Cautiously they went through the thicket, and when they saw their man, asleep and helpless, they shot a flight of arrows. Johnny sprang up, sore wounded on the knee. The seventh forester cried out, The next flight will kill him. But little chance did the outlaw give them for such an easy victory. He set his back against an oak and propped his wounded leg upon a stone. With bow or with sword, he was a better man by far than any of his foes. In the short, sharp fight that followed, he killed six of the foresters, some with arrow and some with steel. And when the seventh turned to flee, Johnny seized him from behind and threw him to the ground with a force that broke three of his ribs. Then he laid him on his steed and bade him carry the tidings home. But Johnny himself was hurt to death. Is there no bonny singing bird, he cried, that can fly to my mother's bower and tell her to fetch Johnny away? A starling flew to his mother's window sill and sang and whistled, and the burden of its tune was ever the same. Johnny tarries long. So the men made a litter from rods of the hazel bush and of the thorn and fetched Johnny away. Then his old mother's tears flowed fast, and she said, Ye would not be warned, my son Johnny, to bide away from the hunting. Oft have I brought to Bredisley the less or greater gear, but never what grieved my heart so sorely. But woe betide that silly old grey-headed carl, an ill death shall he die, the highest tree in Merry Mass shall be his reward. Now Johnny's good bent bow is break, and his good grey dogs are slain, and his body lies dead in Durry's deer, and his hunting it is done. End of section 19「Section 20 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17. Catherine Janfari. This ballad is evidently the original of Sir Walter Scott's Loch in Var, though Sir Walter reversed the names of the two leading male characters. In Catherine Janfari, Lochinvar plays the part of the craven bridegroom. There was a may and a wilfard may lived high up in yon glen. Her name was Catherine Janfari. She was courted by money men. Up there came Lord Lauderdale, up frae the lowland border, and he has come to court this may, all mounted in good order. He told na her father, he told na her mother, and he told no one of her kin, but he whispered the bonny lassie hersel, and has her favour won. But out there come Lord Lochinvar, out frae the English border, all for to court this bonny may, wheel mounted and in order. He told her father, he told her mother, and all the lave of her kin, but he told no the bonny may herself, till on her wedding even. She sent to the Lord of Lauderdale, 
Gin he wad come and see, and he has sent back word again, we'll answered he should be. And he has sent a messenger right quickly through the land, and raised mony an armoured man to be at his command. The bride looked out at a high window, beneath baith dale and down, and she was aware of her first true love, with riders many a one. She scoffed him and scorned him upon her wedding day, and said it was the fairy court to see him in array. O oh, come ye here to fight, young lord, or come ye here to play, or come ye here to drink good wine upon the wedding day. I come na here to fight, he said, I come na here to play. I'll but lead a dance with a bonny bride and mount and go my way. It is a glass of the blood-red wine was filled up them between, and I she drank to Lauderdale, where her true love had been. He's ta'en her by the milk-white hand and by the grass-green sleeve. He's mounted her high behind himself, at her kinsman's speared na leave. Now take your bride, Lord Lochinvar, now take her if ye may, but if you take your bride again, we'll call it but foul play. There were four and twenty bonny boys, all clad in the Johnson grey. They said they would take the bride again, by the strong hand, if they may. Some of them were right willing men, but they were no willing all. And four and twenty leader lads bid them mount and ride awa. Then wingers flew frae gentle sides, and swords flew frae the chaise, and red and rosy was the blood, ran down the lily braes. The blood ran down by Cadden Bank, and down by Cadden Bray, and sighing said the bonny bride, O oh, ways me for foul play. My blessing on your heart, sweet thing, way to your wilful will. There's many a gallant gentleman, whose blood ye have guard to spill. Now all the lords of fair England, and that dwell by the English border, come never here to seek a wife, for fear of sick disorder. They'll track ye up, and settle ye by, till on your wedding day, they'll gi ye frogs instead of fish, and play ye foul, foul play. Lochinvar in Sir Walter Scott's poem, Lochinvar is the hero, and the story has a happier ending. The song was supposed to have been sung to James IV by Lady Heron at Holyrood shortly before the fatal battle of Flodden. O oh, young Lochinvar has come out of the west, through all the wide border his steel was the best, and save his good broadsword he weapons had none. He rode all unarmed, and he rode all alone, so faithful in love and so dauntless in war, there never was knight like the young Lochinvar. He stayed not for break and he stopped not for stone, he swam the Esk River where ford there was none, but ere he alighted at Netherby Gate, the bride had consented, the gallant came late. For a laggard in love and a dastard in war was to wed the fair Ellen of brave Lochinvar. So boldly he entered the Netherby Hall, among bride's men and kinsmen and brothers and all. Then spoke the bride's father, his hand on his sword, for the poor craven bridegroom spake never a word. O come ye in peace here, or come ye in war, or to dance at our bridal, young Lord Lochinvar. I long wooed your daughter, my suit you denied, Love swells like the Solway, but ebbs like its tide. And now I am come with this lost love of mine, to lead but one measure, drink one cup of wine. There are maidens in Scotland, more lovely by far, that would gladly be bride to the young Lochinvar. The bride kissed the goblet, the knight took it up. He quaffed off the wine, and he threw down the cup. She looked down to blush, and she looked up to sigh, with a smile on her lips and a tear in her eye. He took her soft hand ere her mother could bar. Now tread we a measure, said young Lochinvar. So stately her form, and so lovely her face, that never a hall such a galliard did grace. 
while her brother did fret and her father did fume and the bridegroom stood dangling his bonnet and plume and the bride maidens whispered twere better by far to have matched our fair cousin with young lochinvar one touch to her hand and one word in her ear when they reached the hall door and the charger stood near so light to the croup the fair lady he swung so light to the saddle before her he sprung she is one we have gone over bank bush and score they'll have fleet steeds that follow quoth young lochinvar there was mounting mangraims of the netherby clan fosters fenix and musgraves they rode and they ran there was racing and chasing on Canaby Lee, but the lost bride of Netherby ne'er did they see. So daring in love and so dauntless in war have ye e'er heard of gallant like young Lochinvar. End of section 20《Of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 by Lauder Bridge. The ancient royal borough of Lauder, a quaint little border town with hardly more than one street, is on the banks of the River Leader, on the high road between Edinburgh and Kelso. It stands very picturesquely among the bold hills and fine woods of Berwickshire, and the valley is called Lauderdale, extending to where the leader joins the Tweed, just below Melrose. Peacefully beautiful is the spot, and yet it was once the scene of a harsh, grim tragedy. It was in the reign of King James the Third of Scotland, who offended his subjects in two particulars. First, to get wealth for himself, he mixed brass and lead with his silver money and put it into circulation as pure silver. Next, he chose favourites from the common people and set these above the proud noblemen of Scotland. This latter would not have been so bad a fault if the king had always chosen wisely, but, as often in such cases, he was led by flatterers rather than by worthy men. In 1482, the king declared war against England. And as in these warlike days the nobles were the leaders of the army, this brought the discontented lords together. When the Scottish army reached Lauder in their southward march, the proud nobles met in Lauder Church. All were angry with the king. Yet each was afraid to make the first move. So Lord Grey told them a mocking fable. Do you remember, said he, how all the mice got together and agreed that it would be a splendid thing if a bell were hung round the cat's neck, so that wherever she went, she could be heard? The only difficulty was to find a mouse to bell the cat. These warlike nobles did not like to be spoken of as if they were mice, and it roused them to deeper rage. Then out spoke Archibald Douglas, Earl of Angus, the head of the younger branch of the Douglas family. Trust me, I'll bell the cat. There was a knock at the door. Cochrane, the architect, whom the nobles said had been a mason, but was now the king's chief favourite, entered dressed in black velvet with a heavy chain of gold round his neck, a horn of gold tipped with precious stones, and all his attire of the costliest. Angus caught the chain in his hands and said, A rope would suit that neck better. Then the nobles laid violent hands on all the king's low-born favourites and hanged them by the bridge of Lauder in front of the king's very eyes. Cochrane was proud and brave to the last. He said that as the king had made him an earl, he should be hanged with a rope made of silk. Little did the nobles care for his protests. The halter of a horse was, in their opinion, good enough for him. From this time onward, the headstrong Earl of Angus was known by the nickname of Bell the Cat. It may be taken for granted that neither he nor the nobles who supported him would have dared to act so arrogantly and violently 
unless they felt quite sure that the king had not the power to punish them. He returned sullenly to Edinburgh, more the captive of the nobles than their master. A parliament appointed the Duke of Albany lieutenant-general of the kingdom, but he in turn soon lost favour, for he was suspected of too great a friendship for Edward IV, King of England, and fled for safety to France, giving James another chance to govern his kingdom for himself. This weak and unhappy monarch, however, was not destined to have much peace. Before very long, another quarrel with his nobles led to their taking up arms with a view of deposing him and placing his son on the throne. The king and his nobles met in battle near Stirling, but at the very beginning of the fight, James was thrown from his horse and stabbed by a soldier, whose name remained unknown. Thus died this weak but amiable and unfortunate king. End of section 21Section 22 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 The Battle of Flodden Field. One of the most tragic episodes in the history of the borders was the Battle of Flodden Field, when the flower of the Scottish nobility fell around their sovereign James IV while fighting against the English under Surrey. The causes of the war were many. Henry of England refused to give up the jewels which had been promised as the dowry of his sister Margaret on her marriage with James IV. The Lord High Admiral of England, Sir Edmund Howard, had attacked and taken two Scottish ships and slain their captain, Sir Andrew Barton. James, who was fond of Barton, demanded redress, but Henry insolently replied that kings should not quarrel about pirates. But the immediate cause was the friendship between France and Scotland. Henry was preparing for war with France, and James stood by his ally, declaring that if Henry warred with France, he would lead an army into England. The Queen of France sent James a turquoise ring, asking him to carry out his threat to serve her interests. James had been warned that his action would have terrible consequences. A man appeared to him at Linlithgow, clad in a long blue gown, with bare head and carrying a pike staff, and having told the king that his dead mother had sent him to warn him not to go to war against England, he disappeared as suddenly as he had come. Also at the dead of night, a voice had been heard proclaiming aloud at the market cross in Edinburgh, the names of those who, within forty days, would be no more. It was thought at the time that these happenings were instigated by Queen Margaret, but the king still persisted in his policy and led his army across the border in spite of the warnings of his councillors and his queen. A fine description of his army is given by Sir Walter Scott when Lord Marmion watches the scene from Blackford Hill. Thousand pavilions, white as snow, spread all the borough moor below, upland and dale and down. A thousand, did I say? I ween, thousands and thousands there were seen, that chequered all the heath between the streamlet and the town, in crossing ranks extending far, forming a camp irregular, oft giving way where still there stood some relics of the old oak wood that darkly huge did intervene and tamed the glaring white with green. In these extended lines there lay a martial kingdom's vast array. For from Hebodes, dark with rain, to eastern Loden's fertile plain, and from the southern red swire edge to farthest Ross's rocky ledge, from west to east, from south to north, Scotland sent all her warriors forth. Marmion might hear the mingled hum of myriads up the mountain come, the horses tramp 
and tingling clank, where chiefs reviewed their vassal rank, and chargers shrilling neigh, and see the shifting lines advance, while frequent flashed from shield and lance the sun's reflected ray. They saw slow rolling on the plain, full many a baggage cart and wain, and dire artillery's clumsy car by sluggish oxen tugged to war. Nor marked they less where in the air a thousand streamers flaunted fair, various in shape, device, and hue, green, sanguine, purple, red, and blue, broad, narrow, swallow-tailed, and square, scroll, pennon, pencil, bandrol there, over the pavilions flew. Highest and midmost was descried, the royal banner floating wide, the staff a pine tree, strong and straight, pitched deeply in a massive stone, which still in memory is shown, yet bent beneath the standard's weight. Whene'er the western breeze unrolled, with toil the huge and cumbrous fold, and gave to view this dazzling field, wherein proud Scotland's royal shield, the ruddy lion, ramped in gold. Marmion wondered that with such a glorious army at his back, anyone should try to dissuade James from battle. Yet Sir David Lindsay of the Mount answered him, "'Twere good that kings would think withal when peace and wealth their land has blessed. Tis better to sit still at rest than rise perchance and fall. Men at arms were there, sheathed in plate armour, with battle axe and spear, and mounted on Flemish steeds. Young knights and squires practised their charges on the plain. Hardy burghers marched on foot, armed with long pikes and two-handed swords and bright bucklers. The yeoman, too, was on foot, dressed in steel jack, quilted well with iron, and bearing at his back provisions for forty days. He seemed sad of cheer, and loath to leave his humble cottage, wondering who would till the land during his absence. There too was the borderer. Bred to war, he knew the battle's din afar, and joyed to hear it swell. His peaceful day was slothful ease, nor harp nor pipe his ear could please, like the loud slogan yell. For war's the borderer's game, their gain, their glory, their delight, to sleep the day, maraud the night, or mountain, moss, and moor. There too were the Celts, with savage eyes, looking out wildly through red and sable hair, with sinewy frames and legs bare above the knees, their chiefs known by the eagle's plumage. They wore the skin of the red deer, a graceful bonnet, and a plaid hung from the shoulders, and carried as weapons a broadsword, a dagger, and quivers, bows, and shafts. The Isles men too were there, carrying the ancient Danish battle axe. While the army was mustering together, James feasted the chiefs in Holyrood Palace, for at dawn they were to march southward. Well loved that splendid monarch I, the banquet and the song, by day the tourney and by night, the merry dance, traced fast and light, the maskers quaint, the pageant bright, the revel loud and long, this feast outshone his banquets past, it was his blithest and his last. And hazel was his eagle eye, and auburn of the darkest dye, his short curled beard and hair, light was his footstep in the dance, and firm his stirrup in the lists. And oh, he had that merry glance that seldom lady's heart resists. Yet no fair lady was as dear to James as his own Queen Margaret, who sat alone in the tower of Linlithgow, weeping for the war against her native country and for the danger of her lord. On the morrow, James marched south, crossed the Tweed, and encamped on the banks of the Till, near Twisel Bridge. The Scottish army moved down the side of the Tweed to Flodden Hill, taking Norham Castle and the border towns of Etel, 
Walk and Ford. Much time was wasted in these petty enterprises, time which should have been spent in marching to Newcastle before the English were prepared to offer resistance. When the castle of Ford was stormed, Lady Heron, wife of Sir William Heron, then a prisoner in Scotland, was taken, and this beautiful and artful woman induced James to idle away his time until all chance was lost of defeating the enemy. The army suffered severely from want of provisions, and many of the Highlanders and Islesmen returned home, many who had come only for booty, deserted, and the numbers were reduced to about 30,000. Meanwhile, the Earl of Surrey had raised 26,000 men and received other enforcements as he came north from Durham. He therefore challenged James to fight and charged him with violating the treaty of peace between the two kingdoms. The Scottish nobles were unwilling to fight and said it was impossible to remain in a country so plundered. Also, if fight the king must, he would fight to much greater advantage in his own country to whose welfare the loss of this battle would be fatal. While he had sufficiently indicated his honour by crossing the border, James would not listen to the counsel of his nobles, though even the aged Earl of Angus expostulated with him. To this old warrior he angrily said, Angus, if you are afraid you may go home, at which insult the aged Earl burst into tears. The English army crossed the till by Twisel Bridge and pressed on while the Scottish army stood idly by, the Scottish nobles in vain entreating the king to attack the English while they were crossing. When the English army had drawn up in order of battle on the left bank of the river, the Scots, setting fire to their temporary huts, came down the ridge of Flodden. The clouds of smoke from the burning huts were driven into the face of the English so that the Scots had got to within a quarter of a mile of them before they perceived them. No martial shout, nor minstrel tone announced their march, their tread alone, at times one warning trumpet blown, at times a stifled hum, told England from his mountain throne, King James did rushing come. Scarce could they hear or see their foes, until at weapon point they close, with clanging blows, and arrows that fell like rain, with yelling and clamour and sword sway and lance thrust, the battle continued until the evening, and when even fell, the Scots still fought in an unbroken ring round their king. But when darkness came, and Surrey withdrew his men, the flower of Scotland's chivalry had fallen, and the king lay dead on the field. Afar the royal standard flies, and round it toils and bleeds and dies our Caledonian pride. But yet, though thick the shafts as now, though charging knights like whirlwinds go, though billmen ply the ghastly bow, unbroken was the ring. The stubborn spearmen still made good their dark impenetrable wood, each stepping where his comrade stood the instant that he fell. No thought was there of dastard flight, Linked in the serried phalanx tight, Groom fought like noble, squire like knight, As fearlessly and well, Till utter darkness closed her wing, O'er their thin host and wounded king. Then skilful Surrey's sage commands, Led back from strife his shattered bands, And from the charge they drew, As mountain waves from wasted lands Sweep back to ocean blue. Then did their loss his foemen know, their king, their lords, their mightiest low, they melted from the field as snow, when streams are swollen and south winds blow, dissolves in silent dew. Still from the sire the sun shall hear of the stern fight and carnage drear of Flodden's fatal field, where shivered was fair Scotland's spear and broken was her shield. And well in death his trusty brand, firm clenched within his manly hand, beseemed the monarch slain. End of section 22 Section 23 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Chapter 20 After Flodden So deeply did the tragic result of Flodden touch the hearts of the Scottish people that no Scot could for many a long day hear it mentioned without a heart thrill. Many are the songs written about it, the most famous perhaps being The Flowers of the Forest, written two centuries later, though partly founded upon an older and almost forgotten song. The Flowers of the Forest I've heard them lilting at our you milking, lasses are lilting before dawn a day, but now they are moaning on ilka green loaning, the flowers of the forest are all weed away. At buttes in the morning, nay blithe lads are scorning, the lasses are lonely and dour and way, way daffing, nay gabbing, but sighing and sobbing, Ilkan lifts her leglin and hies her away. In her stood the shearing, nay youths now a jeering, the banster's are uncled and liart or grey, at fair or at preaching, nay wooing, nay fleeching. The flowers of the forest are all weed away. At e'en in the gloaming, nay yonkers are roaming, bout stacks with the lasses at bogle to play, but ilk maid sits dreary, Lamenting her dearie, the flowers of the forest are all weed away. Dull and way for the order, sent our lads to the border. The English for once by guile won the day. The flowers of the forest that fought I the foremost, the prime of our land are cold in the clay. We'll hear nae lilting at the ewe milking, Women and bairns are heartless and way, sighing on moaning on ilka green loaning. The flowers of the forest are all weed away. Jean Elliot, 1727 to 1805. Following poem also gives eloquent and touching expression to the deep gloom which descended upon the border after the fatal battle and tells of the despair felt in almost every Ettrick home. Selkirk after Flodden, A Widow's Dirge, October 1513 It's but a month the morn sin, all was peace and plenty. O Hurst was Hufflin shorn, aidant men and lassies denty, but now it's all distress. Never mere a merry meeting, for half the bairns are featherless, and all the women greeting of Flodden Field. Miles and miles round Selkirk town, where forest flowers are fairest, ilka lassie's stricken down with the fate that furs the sairest. All the lads they used to meet by Ettrick Braes or Yarrow, lie in thrammelt head and feet in Brankston's deadly barrow. O oh, Flodden Field! Frae every cluck and clan, the best of the braid border, rose like a single man to meet the royal order. O a burg town itself sent its seventy doon the glen, ask Fletcher how they fell. Brae fechtin an to ten o Flodden Field. Round about their gallant king for country and for crown, Stood the dauntless border ring till the last was hackett down. I blame no what has been, they mon far that canna flee, but o oh, to see what I ha seen, to see what now I see, O oh, Flodden Field. The suitors are full cruce, or their leather and their lingle, with their shoes in ilka hoose sat contented round the ingle. No, there's nothing left but dool. Never mere their work will cheer them in Flodden's bloody pool. They'll neither wait nor wear them o Flodden Field. While the weavers used to meet in Ilka Bildi Corner, no there's none in all the street, save in here and there a mourner, walking lonely as a wraith, or if she meet another, just a word below their breath, or some slaughtered son or brother. Or Flodden Field. There stands the goodman's loom, 
that used to gang sae cheery, untented noo and tomb, making all the house sae eerie, till the sicht I canna dree, for the shuttles lying dumb speak the loudlier to me, o him that wunna come, o flodden field. Said nicht I covet over, just to hold it frae my een, but I hanna yet the power to forget what it has been, and I listen through the hoose for the chappin' o' the lay, till the scraping o' a moose takes my very breath away, O oh, flodden field. Then I turn to Sister Jean, and my arms are boot her twain, and I kiss her sleepless een, for her heart's as sair as mine, a heart once full of fun, and hands that ne'er were idle. We o'er her cleedin' spun against her Jamie's bridle, O oh, flodden field. Now we've neither hands nor hurt, in our grief the walk's forgotten, though it's wanted every ert, and the craps are lying rotten. Was awesome blasts gone by, and left a land forlorn, in death stool hurst they lie, the shearers and the shorn of flodden field. We winter creeping near us, when the nichts are drear and lang, nane to help us, nane to hear us, on the weary gate we gang. Lord o' the quick and deed, sin o'er ain we canna see, in mercy mak good speed, and bring us where they be, far, far frae flodden field. J. B. Selkirk, James B. Brown by permission of W. Cuthbertson, Esquire. Another lyric relating to the fatal battle of Flodden refers to the gallantry of the suitors or shoemakers of Selkirk, who, to the number of eighty, and headed by their town clerk, joined the army as it entered England. They distinguished themselves greatly, and few returned. The yellow and green are the liveries of the House of Hume, taxed by some with being the cause of the defeat. Up with the suitors of Selkirk, and doon with the Earl of Hume, and up we all the braw lads that sew the single-souled shoon. Fie upon yellow and yellow, and fie upon yellow and green, but up with the true blue and scarlet, and up with the single-souled sheen. Up with the suitors of Selkirk, for they are both trusty and leal, and up with the men of the forest, and down with the merce to the deal. In Aiton's Lays of the Scottish Cavaliers, the following well-known poem tells how the news of the disaster at Flodden Field was received in Edinburgh. Edinburgh after Flodden. 1. News of battle, news of battle, hark tis ringing down the street, and the archways and the pavement bear the clang of hurrying feet. News of battle, who hath brought it? News of triumph, who should bring tidings from our noble army, greetings from our gallant king. All last night we watched the beacons blazing on the hills afar, each one bearing as it kindled message of the opened war. All night long the northern streamers shot across the trembling sky, Fearful lights that never beckon, save when kings or heroes die. 2. News of battle, who hath brought it? All are thronging to the gate. Warder, warder, open quickly. Man, is this a time to wait? And the heavy gates are opened, then a murmur long and loud, and a cry of fear and wonder bursts from out the bending crowd. For they see in battered harness only one hard-stricken man, and his weary steed is wounded, and his cheek is pale and wan. Spearless hangs a bloody banner in his weak and drooping hand. God, can that be Randolph Murray, captain of the city band? 3. Round him crush the people, crying, Tell us all, O oh, tell us true, where are they who went to battle, Randolph Murray sworn to you? Where are they, our brothers, children? Have they met the English foe? Why art thou alone unfollowed? Is it weal or is it woe? Like a corpse the grisly warrior looks from out his helm of steel, but no word he speaks in answer. 
only with his armoured heel, Chides his weary steed, and onward up the city streets they ride, Fathers, sisters, mothers, children, shrieking, praying by his side, By the God that made thee, Randolph, tell us what mischance hath come, Then he lifts his riven banner, and the asker's voice is dumb. Four. The elders of the city have met within their hall, the men whom good King James had charged to watch the tower and wall. Your hands are weak with age, he said, your hearts are stout and true, so bide ye in the maiden town while others fight for you. My trumpet from the border side shall send a blast so clear that all who wait within the gate that stirring sound may hear. Or if it be the will of heaven that back I never come, and if instead of Scottish shout ye hear the English drum, then let the warning bells ring out, then gird you to the fray, then man the walls like burghers stout, and fight while fight you may. T'were better that in fiery flame the roofs should thunder down, than that the foot of foreign foe should trample in the town. Then in came Randolph Murray, his step was slow and weak, and as he doffed his dinted helm, the tears ran down his cheek. They fell upon his corslet and on his mailed hand, as he gazed round him wistfully, leaning sorely on his brand. And none who then beheld him, but straight were smote with fear, for a bolder and a sterner man had never couched a spear. They knew so sad a messenger some ghastly news must bring, and all of them were fathers, and their sons were with the king. Six. And up then rose the provost. A brave old man was he, of ancient name and knightly fame, and chivalrous degree. He ruled our city like a lord who brooked no equal here, and ever for the townsman's right stood up against prince and peer. And he had seen the Scottish host march from the borough muir, with music storm and clamorous shout, and all the din that thunders out when youths of victory sure. But yet a dearer thought had he, for with a father's pride he saw his last remaining son go forth by Randolph's side, with casque on head and spur on heel, all keen to do and dare, and proudly did that gallant boy Dunedin's banner bear. Oh, woeful now was the old man's look, and he spoke right heavily. Now, Randolph, tell thy tidings, however sharp they be. Woe is written on thy visage, death is looking from thy face. Speak, though it be of overthrow, it cannot be disgrace. 7. Right bitter was the agony that wrung that soldier proud. Thrice did he strive to answer, and thrice he groaned aloud. Then he gave the riven banner to the old man's shaking hand, saying, That is all I bring ye from the bravest of the land. Aye, you may look upon it. It was guarded well and long by your brothers and your children, by the valiant and the strong. One by one they fell around it, as the archers laid them low, grimly dying, still unconquered, with their faces to the foe. Aye, ye may well look upon it. There is more than honour there, else be sure I had not brought it from the field of dark despair. Never yet was royal banner steeped in such a costly dye. It hath lain upon a bosom where no other shroud should lie. Sirs, I charge you, keep it holy, keep it as a sacred thing, for the stain ye see upon it was the lifeblood of your king. 8. Woe and lamentation! What a piteous cry was there! Widows, maidens, mothers, children, shrieking, sobbing in despair. Through the streets the death word rushes, spreading terror, sweeping on. Jesu Christ, our King, has fallen. O oh, great God, King James is gone. Holy Mother, shield us, thou who erst did lose thy son. O oh, the blackest day for Scotland that she ever knew before. O oh, our King, the good, the noble, shall we see him never more. Woe to us, 
and woe to Scotland, O oh, our sons, our sons and men, Surely some have scaped the Southron, Surely some will come again. Randolph Murray describes how the monarch lies dead on the field, with his nobles around him. All so thick they lay together when the stars lit up the sky, that I knew not who was stricken, or who yet remained to die. A hollow knell is rung, and the miserere is sung, and all is terror and disorder, until the provost rouses them. If our king be taken from us, we are left to guard his son. Up and haste ye through the city, stir the burghers stout and true, gather all our scattered people, fling the banner out once more. Randolph Murray, do thou bear it as it erst was born before. Never Scottish heart will leave it when they see their monarch's gore. End of section 23section 24 of stories of the scottish border by mr and mrs william platt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 21 graham and buick good lord graham and sir robert buick were friends they met one day in carlisle and went arm in arm to the wine and as was too oft the custom of these days they stayed and drank till they were both merry. Good Lord Graham took up the cup. Sir Robert, and here's to thee, he said, and here's to our two sons at home, for they like us best in our own country. Oh, were your son a lad like mine, answered Buick boastfully, and learnt some books that he could read. They might be two brothers in arms, and lord it over the border side. But your son's a lad, and he's but bad, and Billy to my son he cannot be. You sent him to school, and he would not learn. You bought him books, and he would not read. Lord Graham called angrily for the reckoning. My blessing shall he never earn, said he, till I see how his arm can defend his head. He threw down a crown and went to the stable, took his horse and rode home. "'Welcome, my old father,' said his son, Christy Graham. "'But where were you so long from home?' "'I've been at Carlisle Town, and a shamed man I am by thee,' answered his father with a black look. "'I have been at Carlisle Town, where Sir Robert Buick met me. "'He says you are but a bad, wild youth.' and can never be Billy to his boy. I sent you to the school, and you would not learn. I bought you books, and you would not read. Therefore you shall never have my blessing till I see you save your head in fight with young Buick. Now God forbid, my old father, that ever such a thing should be. Billy Buick was my master, and I his scholar, in spite of the pains he wasted in teaching me. Oh, hold thy tongue, thou foolish lad. If thou dost not soon end this quarrel, there's my glove. I'll fight with thee myself. Then Christy Graham stooped low. Father, put on your glove again. The wind has blown it from your hand. What's that thou sayest, thou limaloon? How darest thou stand to speak to me? If thou do not end this quarrel soon, there's my right hand, thou'lt fight with me. Then went Christie to his chamber to consider what should happen. Should he fight with his own father or with his brother in arms, Buick? If I should kill my Billy dear, God's blessing I shall never win. But if I strike at my old father, I think twould be a mortal sin. But if I kill my Billy dear, it is God's will, so let it be. But I make a vow ere I go from home that I shall be the next man's die. He put a good old jacket or quilted doublet on his back, and on his head he put a cap of steel, 
and well did he become them with his sword and buckler by his side. Now young Buick had taken his father's sword under his arm and walked about his father's close. He looked between himself and the sun to see some approaching object and was aware of a man in bright armour riding that way most hastily. Oh, who is yon that comes this way so hastily that hither came? I think it be my brother, dear. I think it be young Christy Graham. You're welcome here, my Billy, dear, and thrice you're welcome unto me. Christy explained that he was come to fight, that his father had been to Carlisle and had met with the elder Buick. He retailed what had passed, and so I'll never earn my father's blessing till he sees how my arm can guard my head in fight against thee. Oh, God forbid! Bid, my Billy dear, that ever such a thing should be. We'll take three men on either side, and see if we can our fathers agree. Christy shook his head. He knew that it was useless. Oh, hold thy tongue, Billy Buick. If thou art a man, as I'm sure thou art, come over the dyke and fight with me. But I have no harness, Billy, as I see you have. As little harness as is on your back shall be on mine. With that, Christy threw off his coat of mail and cap of steel, stuck his spear into the ground, and tied his horse up to a tree. Buick threw off his cloak and cast aside his psalter book. He laid his hand upon the dyke and vaulted over. The two fought for two long hours. The sweat dropped fast from them both but not a drop of blood could be seen to satisfy the requirements of honour. At last, Graham hit Buick under the left breast, and he fell to the ground, wounded mortally. Rise up, rise up now, Billy dear, arise and speak three words to me, whether thou's gotten thy deadly wound, or if God and good leeching may succour thee. Buick groaned, Get to horse, Billy Graham, and get thee hence speedily. Get thee out of this country, that none may know who has done this. Oh, have I slain thee, Billy Buick? But I made a vow ere I came from home that I would be the next man to die. Thereupon he pitched his sword hilt downwards into a molehill, took a run of some three and twenty feet, and on his own sword's point, he fell to the ground, dead. Then up came Sir Robert Buick. Rise up, my son, he said, for I think you have got the victory. Oh, hold your tongue, my father dear. Let me be spared your prideful talking. You might have drunken your wine in peace and let me and my billy be. Go dig a grave both wide and deep and a grave to hold us both. But lay Christy Graham on the sunny side, for full sure I know that the victory was to him. Alas, cried old Buick, I've lost the liveliest lad that ever was born unto my name. Alas, quoth good Lord Graham, my loss is the greater. I've lost my hopes, I've lost my joy, I've lost the key but and the lock, I durst have ridden the world around had Christy Graham been at my back. End of section 24section 25 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 The Song of the Outlaw Murray Word is gone to our noble king in Edinburgh, where that he lay, that there was an outlaw in Ettrick Forest, counted him naught, nor all his court so gay. The king, mentioned in the ballad, is supposed to have been either James the Fourth or James the Fifth, 
This places the date somewhere in the early part of the 16th century. The outlaw Murray and his lady kept royal state in Ettrick Forest. Here he lived with 500 men, all gaily clad in livery of Lincoln Green. His castle, built of lime and stone, stood fair and pleasantly in the midst of the forest, surrounded by pine trees under which wandered many a hart and hind, many a doe and roe, and other wild creatures. In the forefront of the castle stood two unicorns, with the picture of a knight and lady with green holly above their brows. The king in Edinburgh heard of all this royal state, and that the outlaw in Ettrick Forest cared naught for the king of Scotland and his court. I make a vow, said the king, that either I shall be king of Ettrick Forest, or the outlaw shall be king of Scotland. Then up spoke Lord Hamilton to the noble king, my sovereign prince, take counsel of your nobles and of me. I counsel ye to send to the fine outlaw, and see if he will come and be your man, and hold the forest in fee from you. If he refuse, we will conquer both him and his lands, throw his castle down, and make a widow of his gay lady. Then the king called to him James Boyd, son of the Earl of Arran, and when Boyd came and knelt before him, "'Welcome, James Boyd,' said the noble king. "'You must go for me to Ettrick Forest, where bides yonder outlaw. "'Ask him of whom he holds his lands, and who is his master, "'and desire him to come and be my man, and hold the forest free from me. "'I will give him safe warrant to and from Edinburgh, "'and if he refuse, we will conquer him and his lands, "'and throw down his castle, and make a widow of his gay lady, and hang his merry men, pair by pair, wherever we see them. James Boyd took leave of the king, and went blithely on his way, until he came to the fair Ettrick Forest, the first view of which he got coming down Birkendale Bray. He saw the doe and roe, the hart and hind, and wild beasts in plenty, and heard blows ringing boldly, and arrows whizzing near by him. He saw too the fair castle, the like of which he had never seen before, with the two gay unicorns on the forefront, and the picture of the knight and lady with the green holly above their brow. Then he spied the five hundred men, all clad in livery of Lincoln Green, and shooting with their bows on Newark Lee. In the midst of them was a knight armed from head to foot, mounted on a milk-white steed, with bended bow, all fine to look upon, whom Boyd knew at once to be the outlaw himself. "'God save thee, brave outlaw Murray, thy lady and all thy chivalry. "'Murray, thou art welcome, gentleman. Thou seemst to be a king's messenger. "'The King of Scotland sent me here, good outlaw, to know of whom you hold your lands and who is your master.' These lands are mine. I know no king in Christendom. I won this forest from the English, when neither the king nor his knights were there to see. The king desires that you come to Edinburgh, and hold the forest then of him. If you refuse, he will conquer your lands and you, and he has vowed to throw down your castle, make a widow of your gay lady, and hang your knights pair by pair wherever he finds them. Aye, by my troth, I should indeed be far behind. Before the king should get my fair native land, many of his nobles would be cold, and their ladies right weary. Then spoke the lady of the outlaw fair of face, That an outlaw should come before the king without my consent makes me fear much that there is treason. Bid him be good to his lords at home, for my lord shall ne'er see Edinburgh. James Boyd took leave of the bold outlaw and went back to Edinburgh, and when he came to the king, knelt lowly on his knee. "'Welcome, James Boyd,' said the noble king. "'Of whom is Ettrick Forest held?' "'Ettrick Forest is the fairest forest that ever man saw. There are doe and roe and hart and hind and wild beasts in plenty. 
There's a fine castle of lime and stone standing there pleasantly, and in the forefront of the castle, two unicorns, all fine to see, with a picture of a knight and a lady, and the green holly above their brows. There the outlaw keeps a royal company, five hundred merry men, all gaily clad in Lincoln green, and the outlaw and his lady in purple. Surely they live right royally. He says that the forest is his own, that he won it from the English, and that as he won it, so will he keep it against all the kings in Christendom. Go warn me, Perthshire and Angus, cried the king. Go warn Fife up and down and the three Lothians, and harness my own horse, for I will myself to Ettrick Forest. When the outlaw heard that the king was coming to his country to conquer him and his lands, I make a vow, said he, I make a vow, and that truly, that the king's coming shall be a dear one. Then he called messengers and sent them in haste hither and thither. One of you go to Halliday, Laird of Corhead, my sister's son. Tell him to come quickly to my aid, for that the king comes to Ettrick Forest, and we shall all be landless. What news, what news, man, from thy master, said Halliday. No news thou carest to hear. I come seeking your aid. The king is his mortal enemy. By my troth, I am sorry for that. If Murray lose fair Ettrick Forest, the king will take Moffatdale from me. I'll meet him with five hundred men and more if need be, and before he gets to Ettrick Forest, we will all die on Newark Lee. Another messenger went from the outlaw to Andrew Murray of Cockpool, his dear cousin, to desire him to come and help him with all the power he could get together. It is hard, said Andrew Murray, very hard to go against a crowned king and put my lands in jeopardy, but if I come not by day, I shall be there at night. A messenger went also to Sir James Murray of Traquair. What news? What news, man, from your master to me, said James Murray? What need I tell? Well ye know that the king is his mortal enemy, and that he is coming to Ettrick Forest to make ye all landless men. By my troth, said James Murray, with yonder outlaw will I live and die. The king has long ago given away my lands, so matters can be no worse for me. So the king came on with five thousand men through Cadden Ford. They saw the dark forest before them and thought it awesome to look upon, and Lord Hamilton begged that the king should take counsel of his nobles and should desire the outlaw to meet him at Perman Score with four of his company, and that the king should go there also accompanied by five earls. If he refuse to do that, we'll conquer both him and his lands. There shall never a Murray after him hold lands free in Ettrick Forest. The Laird of Buxclew, a man stalwart and stern, thought it beneath the state and dignity of a king to go and meet an outlaw. The man that lives in yonder forest lives by robbery and felony. Wherefore, ride on, my liege, we will follow thee with fire and sword, or if your courtier lords fall back, our borderers will make the onset. But the king spoke forth, casting a wily glance around. Thou mayest hold thy tongue, Sir Walter Scott, nor speak more of robbery and felony, for if every honest man had his own cattle, thy clan would be a poor one. The king then called to him a gentleman, a royal banner-bearer, James Hopringle of Torsens, by name, who came and knelt before him. Welcome, James Pringle of Torsens. Ye must take a message for me. Go to yonder outlaw, Murray, where he bideth so boldly. Bid him meet me at Perman's Gore with four of his company. I myself will come to him with five earls. If he refuse, bid him look for no favour from me. There shall never a Murray after him have free land in Ettrick Forest. So James Pringle came before the outlaw. Welcome, James Pringle of Torsons. What message brings thou from the king to me? He bids ye meet him at Perman Score with four of your company, and he will go there himself with no more than five earls. If you refuse, he will cast down your bonny castle, make a widow of your gay lady, and loose on you the bloodhound borderers to harry you with fire and sword. 
Never shall a Murray after you hold free land in Ettrick Forest. It goes hard with me, said the outlaw. Judge if it go not very hard. I mind not the losing of myself, but when I think of my offspring after me, my merry men's lives, my widow's tears, that is the pang that pinches me. Yonder castle will be right dreary when I am laid in bloody earth. Old Holiday, young Holiday, ye too shall go with me, with Andrew and James Murray. When they came before the king, they fell on their knees. Mercy, mercy, noble king, for his sake who died on the cross. Such mercy shall ye have, ye shall be hanged on the gallows. May God forbid, and may your mercy be better than that. Else, when ye come to the port of Edinburgh, ye shall be thinly guarded. These lands of fair Ettrick Forest I won from the Southrons, and as I won them, so will I keep them against all the kings in Christendom. The nobles round the king thought it a pity that he should die. Grant me mercy, sovereign prince, and extend me favour. If thou wilt make me sheriff of Ettrick Forest, and my offspring after me, I will give thee the keys of my castle, and the blessing of my gay lady. If thou wilt give me thy castle keys, and the blessing of thy gay lady, I'll make thee sheriff of Ettrick Forest, as long as the trees grow upward, and never shalt thou forfeit it, if thou be not a traitor to the king. But prince, what shall become of my men? When I go back, they will call me traitor. I had rather lose both life and land than be rebuked by my merry men. I will pardon them all if they amend their lives. Name thy lands where they lie, and I will render them back to me. Philip Hoare and Lewin Hope are mine by right. Newark, Foulshields, and Tinnies I won by my bow and arrow. I have farms at Newark Lee and Hanging Shore, which are mine by birth, and I have many farms in the forest, whose names I do not know. Thereupon he gave the king the key of his castle, with the blessing of his fair lady, and the king made him sheriff of Ettrick Forest, for as long as the trees should grow upward, never to be forfeited, while he and his descendants remained faithful to the king. Much of this land belongs to Murray's heirs even to this day. Whoever heard in ony times, sicken an outlaw in his degree, sick favour got before a king, as did the outlaw Murray of the forest free. End of section 25Section 26 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23 Johnny Armstrong. When Johnny came before the king, with all his men so brave to see, the king he moved his bonnet to him. He knew he was a king as well as he. In 1529, James V visited the border country to execute justice on the wild freebooters. Of these, the chief was Johnny Armstrong of Gilnocky, who levied blackmail for many miles round his residence at the Hollows and spread the terror of his name as far as Newcastle. Acting on the evil counsel of false friends, Johnny presented himself before the king in all the pomp of border chivalry. According to the old ballad, the king wrote with his own hand a loving letter to Johnny Armstrong, laird of Gilnocky, bidding him come and speak with him speedily. Whereupon the Elliots and Armstrongs convened a meeting, to which they came in gallant company, and decided to ride out to meet the king and bring him to Gilnocky. "'Make ready rabbits and capon and venison in plenty,' said Johnny, and we'll welcome home our royal king to dine at Gilnocky. So they ran out their horses on Langham Down and broke their spears, and the ladies, looking from their high windows, cried, God send our men safe home again. When Johnny came before the king with all his brave fellows, the king took off his bonnet to him as to an equal. My name is Johnny Armstrong, said the freebooter, 
your subject, my liege. Let me find grace for my loyal men and me. But the king cried, Away with thee, thou traitor, out of my sight. Never have I granted a traitor's life, nor will I now begin with thee. Grant me my life, my king, and I will give thee a bonny gift, four and twenty milk-white steeds newly foaled. I'll give thee four and twenty milk-white steeds that prance and neigh at a spear, and as much English gold as four of their broad backs able to bear. Away with thee, thou traitor, out of my sight. Never have I granted a traitor's life, nor will I now begin with thee. Grant me my life, my king, and I will give thee a bonny gift, four and twenty mills that are working all the year round for me, four and twenty mills that shall go for thee all the year round, and as much good red wheat as all their happers are able to bear. Away with thee, thou traitor, out of my sight. Never have I granted a traitor's life, nor will I now begin with thee. Grant me my life, my king, and I will give thee a great gift. Four and twenty sisters' sons shall fight for thee, though all should flee. Away with thee, thou traitor, out of my sight. Never have I granted a traitor's life, nor will I now begin with thee. Grant me my life, my king, and I will give thee a brave gift. All between here and Newcastle town shall pay thee yearly rent. Away with thee, thou traitor, out of my sight. Never have I granted a traitor's life, nor will I now begin with thee. Ye lie, calling me traitor. Ye lie now, king, although ye be king and prince. Well dare I say it that all my life I have loved naught but honesty, a fleet horse, a fair woman, and two bonny dogs to kill a deer. Yet had I lived for another hundred years, England should still have found me meal and malt and plenty of beef and mutton. Never would a Scot's wife have been able to say that I robbed her of aught. But surely it is great folly to seek for hot water, beneath cold ice. I have asked grace of a graceless king, but there is none for me and my men. But had I known before I came how unkind thou wouldst prove to me, I would have kept the board aside in spite of thee and thy nobles. How glad would be England's king if he but knew that I was taken, for once I slew his sister's son and broke a tree over his breastbone. Now Johnny had a girdle around his waist, embroidered and spangled with burning gold, very beautiful to look upon, and from his hat hung down nine tassels, each worth three hundred pounds. What wants that knave that a king should have but the sword of honour and the crown? cried the king. Where did you get those tassels, Johnny, that shine so bravely above your brow? I got them fighting in the field where thou darest not be, replied Johnny, and had I now my horse and good harness, and were I riding as I am used to do, this meeting between us should have been told these hundred years. God be with thee, my brother Christie, long shalt thou live laird of Mangatown on the border side, ere thou see thou brother ride by again. God be with thee, my son Christy, where thou sitst on thy nurse's knee. Thou'lt ne'er be a better man than thy father, though thou live a hundred years. Farewell, bonny hall of Gilnocky, standing strong on Eskside. If I had lived but seven more years, I would have gilded thee round about. Then Johnny Armstrong was slain by the king's orders at Carlin Rig, with all his gallant company, and Scotland's heart was sad to see the death of so many brave men who had saved their country from the Englishmen. None were so brave as they, and while Johnny lived on the border side, no Englishman durst come near his stronghold. End of section 26
Section 27 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24 The Lament of the Border Widow. How King James V of Scotland in 1529 set forth to strike terror into the border freebooters has already been told in the account of Johnny Armstrong. A less celebrated moss trooper, Coburn of Henderland was hanged by the pitiless king over the gate of his own tower. The wife of Coburn loved him most dearly, and when she found the king would show no mercy, fled away to the rocks behind the castle while the cruel sentence was carried out. She sat by a roaring torrent of the Henderland burn, the noise of which in her ears drowned the savage shouts of the king's soldiers. The beautiful song which describes the grief of this loving woman is one of the gems of ancient poetry and is here printed entire. The Lament of the Border Widow My love he built me a bonny bower and clad it all wi' lily flower a brower bower ye ne'er did see than my true love he built for me. There came a man by middle day he spied his sport and went away, and brought the king that very night, who brake my bower and slew my knight. He slew my knight to me, say dear, he slew my knight and took his gear. My servants all for life did flee, and left me in extremity. I sewed his sheet, making my moan, I watched the corpse myself alone. I watched his body night and day, no living creature came that way. I took his body on my back, and whiles I gaed and whiles I sat, I digged a grave and laid him in, and happed him with the sod sigreen. But think na ye my heart was sair, when I laid the mould on his yellow hair. O oh, think na ye my heart was way, when I turned about away to gay. Nay living man I'll love again, since that my lovely knight was slain. We a lock of his yellow hair, I'll chain my heart for ever mare. End of section twenty seven. Section twenty eight of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25 The Raid of the Curs. The spirited ballad that describes this raid is quite modern, since it was written by Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd, in 1830. But the rash raid it describes took place in 1549. The Curs were an important border family the leaders of whom afterwards became Earls of Roxburgh. Sir Andrew Kerr was warden of the border at the time of the raid, but he proved that it took place without his consent. The Kerrs were all left-handed men, and puzzled their enemies by their left-handed swordsmanship. Even today, in some parts of the borders, a left-handed man is called Kerr-handed. On a fine September evening, Tam Kerr rode out with fifty in his company. They were armed for a fight, and their swords were keen. They rode by the Maiden Crags and down the Osway Burn, going carefully till the daylight closed, for they were soon in Northumberland. Their bold plan was to get down the valley of the Cocket, even as far as Rothbury, where Witherington, the English warden, kept a magnificent herd of cattle. They had one castle to pass, that of Biddleston, which had been held by the Selby family since the reign of Henry III, and still belongs to them to this day. Biddleston Castle guarded the Allenton or Alwinton Ford, where the Alwyn stream enters the Cocket. So they sent the reckless Mark Kerr first to scout along by the ford, and told him to set up marks on the cairns to show his progress. Having nothing else to mark with, he tore the shirt off his back and left strips of it on the cairns. At the ford, 
A sentry challenged him, and he answered that he had a message for Witherington. The sentry demanded his sealed warrant, and the Scot drew his sword. They fought bravely and long before the Englishman was killed, and the Scot marvelled that a common soldier should so withstand him, for he was the best swordsman of his race. On he galloped, on and on, till he met a comely maiden, and addressing her he tried to imitate the Northumberland speech, saying that he had lost his way. She told him at once that she knew he was a Scot, but so also was she. She had been taken captive, but word had come by an English spy that the curs were out upon a raid, and while the English had set a hundred soldiers to guard their cattle, she had slipped away to warn the Scots and to return with them. Being a gallant after the manner of that day, he sprang from his horse, kissed her, and invited her to mount his saddle, even if he had to run beside till he could capture another steed. But an English soldier came up and warned him roughly off the road. Mark Kerr had been brought up to answer rough words with rougher blows, out leapt his sword, and he cut the rude words short by slashing the man's head off. Then he disguised the maid in the dead man's clothes, and they retraced their steps that he might warn his companions. They very soon came upon them, and all together hid in the lowest dell of the Larbottle Burn, while they made their plans. Tam Kerr, with twenty of the men, was to draw off the English, while Mark, with thirty others, slipped round and drove off the cattle unperceived. This was done until after midnight Tam, aided by the darkness and by the difficulties of the wild locality, held the English at bay. Then he heard the bugle signal, and knew that Mark was well on the road with the beasts, and that he must follow quickly. But Witherington also guessed what the signal meant, and pursued with all the speed he knew. Mark had not long crossed the ford at Biddleston before the English were on him. First Mark and Witherington fought in single combat, hand to hand, all their men watching eagerly. It was still very dark, but the clash of sword against sword lit the air with sparks. Witherington was badly wounded, but Mark was killed. With desperate shouts, the Scots fell upon the English. Then up came Tam and his men from behind to help the Scots, but the captain of Biddleston had also been awakened and galloped down with his men to aid the English. Tam smote his head off with his sword, but the horse galloped on with his headless body, right into the ranks of the Scots. They thought it must be a demon, and began to scatter in full flight to the border. Tam was slain, trying to follow them, and his men, seeing that they had work enough to gallop for their lives, slew the cattle they could no longer hope to steal. On and on the hard-pressed remnant spurred their weary horses. It was daylight now, and the English along the road shot arrows at them as they galloped past. Out of fifty-one hardy, healthy curs who had started forth in the raid, only seventeen, weary and wounded, saw their homes again. And back in the south country, the comely Scottish maiden lay dead across the breast of the gallant Mark, their heart's blood mingling in a common stream. Small wonder that a Scot should make a ballad of the story and that borderers should sing it even to this day. End of section 28section 29 of stories of the scottish border by mr and mrs william platt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 26 mary carlisle the city of carlisle stands in the midst of a beautiful and fertile district with pleasant but not too steep hills around in the old days an easy water supply was the first essential and at carlisle three rivers meet, the Coldew and the Petterill, running here into the broad stream of the Eden. These three rivers almost enclose the ground upon which the city is built, so that it is most probable that there was an ancient British settlement upon so advantageous a site before the Roman invasion. Our earliest record, however, goes back no further than Roman days, and it is certain there was then a Roman city here called Lugovalium. 
the trench of the legion. Even today, when new gas pipes are being laid in the ground, it is by no means rare to dig up Roman relics. The long Roman name became gradually corrupted into Luel, or Lille, and the Britons added their word Caer, which means a city. Hence, Caer Luel, an earlier form of the modern Carlisle. The Roman city stood, as might be expected, by the great Roman wall, guarding the spot where the wall crossed the River Eden. And visitors may see today that the centre of Carlisle consists of a marketplace with two main streets leading therefrom, the usual plan in cities of Roman origin. Carlisle was destined to have a stormy history. Draw a line from the Solway eastward, straight through Carlisle, and it will be seen that here the mainland of Britain is about at its narrowest, hardly so much as 70 miles wide as the crow flies. Note, too, that the wild hills of the Pennines and the Cheviots fill in most of this narrow district, and that the mainland of Scotland strikes sharply off to the west. It's plain from these facts that Carlisle commands the main road between Scotland and England, and they provide the reason why at the present day seven different railways, most of them important ones, run their trains into Carlisle station. The very same reason was responsible for the fact that in the good old times no English town was more often burnt down by enemies than Mary Carlisle. Even in Roman days, during the reign of Nero, Carlisle was burnt down at least once by the wild Picts, who were brave enough to venture against the well-armed troops of Rome. After the Romans left Britain, this town was one of the strongholds of King Arthur. To be sure, nothing very definite is known about this romantic king, but the old ballads tell us that he was victorious over Gauls, Dacians, Spaniards and Romans. This sounds very unlikely to those who do not realise that when Rome called home her best men for her own defence, she may have left behind many rough soldiers of various nations to guard the wall. Although we know nothing about King Arthur, save what is vague and legendary, we do know that the Roman legions were recruited from all the provinces of the empire. Cumberland had many connections with King Arthur. Within 20 miles of Carlisle, near Penrith, is a big round hill called King Arthur's Table, while nearer still, on the Penrith and Carlisle Road, is shown the spot where stood Turn Waddling Lake and Castle, where King Arthur was bewitched and taken prisoner by the foul, discourteous knight, only to be released, provided one of his men would consent to marry the hideous lady with hair like serpents. When at last Sir Gawain married this hag for his king's sake, she of course changed at once into a beautiful young woman. This doesn't sound very convincing, it is true, but in the old days many tales, just as unlikely, were told of famous men. At any rate, the ballad begins with the lilting line, King Arthur lives in Merry Carlisle. And all that concerns us at the moment is that perhaps he really did live there and did do some very real fighting along the debatable line of the wall. We next learn of Carlisle that King Egfrid of Northumbria rebuilt the city about the year 675. Wherefore, we can only suppose that it had suffered its somewhat usual fate, perhaps at the hands of that savage Saxon warrior called the Burner. But in any case, Carlisle never belonged to the Northumbrians for any considerable space of time, but was the capital of the Celtic or Welsh kingdom of Cumbria, from which the present name of Cumberland is derived. In 875, the Danes had a turn at pillaging and harrying Carlisle, which was again in sorry plight. Both Cumbria and Northumbria were faring very badly in the struggle between the various kingdoms which then divided up Britain, and for a while it looked as if the energetic kings of the Scots would annex both these Norman dominions. But the coming of the strong-handed Normans altered all this, and by far the most noteworthy event in the history of Carlisle was the fact that during 1092 and 1093, William Rufus seized Cumberland and for the first time added it definitely to England. Recognising at once the strength and value of Carlisle, Rufus caused a strong Norman castle to be built where the old Roman fort used to stand. 
Today, despite the many rough adventures which have befallen this northern city, there yet remain portions of William Rufus's castle, side by side with fragments of the old Roman walls. Many of the modern buildings put up in King George's day are crumbling, but the old Norman and Roman remains are firm as a rock. The castle was strengthened by King Henry I, but this did not prevent its seizure in 1135 by King David of Scotland, who added to it in turn. The Scots held the keep till 1157, when it was retaken by Henry II. But a few years later, in 1173, William the Lion, King of Scotland, besieged it, and for the next 50 years it changed hands several times, according to the fortunes of war. It is significant that a main street in the northern part of Carlisle is called Scotch Street, while another in the southern part is called English Street. Edward I held a parliament here after defeating Wallace at Falkirk, and it was from Carlisle that this English king conducted his later operations against Scotland. It is a pathetic picture, that of this stern warrior in his old age, on his last march, trying to carry out his pet scheme of uniting the entire island under one rule. He was so ill that he had to be carried in a litter as far as Carlisle. Finding himself again so near the border, he felt the old fire glow within him and sprang upon his horse. But at Burg-on-Sands, on the shore of the Solway, whence he could view the goal of his ambition, the brave king died. During the next thirty years, Carlisle was frequently attacked by the Scots, but they were usually defeated. In 1337, however, they partly, and in 1345, almost entirely burnt it down. Again, in 1380, they burnt part of what had been rebuilt. Had there been fire insurance in these wild days, the premiums in Carlisle would have been heavy. After the Wars of the Roses, the city seemed to settle down somewhat, and was chiefly known on the border as the place where Scottish freebooters were hanged if caught. In one of the border villages, there is a famous churchyard, where of old only the graves of women and children were to be seen. The explanation was given to a passing traveller by an old woman, who said that the men were all buried in Mary Carlisle, meaning, that is, that they had all been hanged there. In 1537, there was a rising in England in opposition to the savage policy of Henry's minister, Thomas Cromwell. And no less than 80,000 insurgents are said to have attacked Carlisle. But after much fighting, the rebels were defeated, and 74 of their leaders were executed on city walls. When Mary, Queen of Scots, was imprisoned in Carlisle in 1568, it was vainly besieged by a force that sought to rescue her. But less than 30 years afterwards, in 1596, by a bold stroke of daring, Lord Scott of Buccleuch succeeded in surprising the castle and in liberating the well-known freebooter, Kinmont Willie. When King James united England and Scotland, the troubles of Carlisle might have been thought to be over. But in the civil war between King and Parliament, it was again a storm centre and was held alternately by each of the parties. The last warlike operations against this much besieged city were undertaken in 1745, when it was first taken by Prince Charlie, who made a triumphal entry without any serious fighting, and afterwards retaken, almost as easily, by the cruel Duke of Cumberland whose entry into the place was followed, as usual, by a series of executions. Among those who suffered was Sir A. Primrose, a gallant ancestor of the present Lord Rosebery. The victims were executed with the cruelties of the old law against treason on the celebrated Gallows Hill at Harraby and were buried in nameless graves in the kirkyard of St Cuthbert's. Passing down the Botchergate, the London Road, past the site of the old Roman cemetery, the wayfarer may see Gallows Hill rise where a deep cut has been made to avoid a steep rise in the road. It was just outside the boundary of Old Carlisle, and executions were witnessed from the walls by men and women alike. Climb the hill, it is worthwhile. The little river Petrel sparkles at our feet, 
The view, fresh and green, stretches away nobly to the Pennines and the border hills. Keep a warm thought in your heart for all the gallant fellows who met death bravely in this place. No history of Carlisle could omit to mention the cathedral. English cathedrals are shaped like a cross lying on the ground. The long stem of the cross is the nave of the cathedral, the two arms are the transepts, and the upper end that continues the main stem is the choir. Where choir, nave and transepts meet, the tower rises. But unlike every other English cathedral, that of Carlisle has height and width, but is too short in length, two-thirds of the nave having been hurled down by the Scots. Every cathedral has its history written in its stones, for those who know how to read it. That of Carlisle shows a stormy history, stormier than any other. It is not a peaceful building, carried out very much in one style and undisturbed. It is a building full of signs and disturbance, the builders of which were interrupted in their plans by war, and frequently had their buildings seriously damaged by their enemies. It is a mixture of styles, a mass of rebuildings and afterthoughts, but for that very reason it is a fitting symbol of the much harassed city. With all its signs of storm and stress, it has much beauty, and possesses the finest window in all England, one of the finest in the world. Just outside the cathedral is a noble stretch of the old west wall of the city, which gives a vivid idea of its strength in the old days. The bishops of Carlisle live at Rose Castle, five miles south of the cathedral. This has been their residence for over 600 years. No doubt they thought it advisable not to live in the merry city. In this castle, King Edward I stayed. It was once partly burnt by Bruce, and again partly by the Puritans. But this is a comparatively clean record for such a district. In 1745, Captain MacDonald and his Scots came down to besiege it, but hearing that the bishop's baby daughter was about to be christened, the gallant captain would not let warfare spoil so peaceful a ceremony, and not only withdrew his men, but also left a white cockade behind him as a sign that the place was not to be molested. In all this, he showed that true courtesy that always marks the real Highland gentleman. Standing today in this bustling, breezy, pleasant little city, it is not easy to realise the wild scenes it has witnessed. The charming rivers that hem it in show no traces of the bloodshed of the past, yet here have contended, painted picked, and war-trained Roman. Here the most skilful leaders of the Celts, Saxons, and Danes have led their brave and sturdy men to battle. Here Norman knight has fought with hardy Scot, and fierce border factions have wrangled and sought speedy justice. Puritan has fought Cavalier, and Jacobite has faced Hanoverian. Kings, generals, and warriors of many centuries have found a fitting meeting place before or behind the walls of Carlisle. An open, airy, quaint city. There is not very much that is old in it, for the old was not allowed to stand long enough. But on the top of its principal hill, the tall, truncated cathedral presents a picturesque figure, and if we stand there or by the castle, the eye commands fine ancient walls and very delightful distances. It is a place of lingering memories, and if these are chiefly of strife and bloodshed, we do not forget that to the border folk the city was Merry Carlisle. End of section. 29. Section 30 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27. Kinmont Willie. Or oh, have ye not heard of the false Sakeld? Or have ye not heard of the keen Lord Scroop? How they have taken bold Kinmont Willie on Harry B. to hang him up. The story of this famous freebooter, William Armstrong of Kinmonth, 
belongs to the time of Queen Elizabeth, when Lord Scroop was warden of the Western Marchers, and Mr. Sackeld of Corby Castle was his deputy. Kinmont Willie was a descendant of the famous Johnny Armstrong of Gilnocky, and his capture was a violation of the existing truce between Scroop and Buccleuch, the keeper of Liddesdale. Elizabeth was indignant at Buccleuch's action in rescuing Willie, and as the Scots at that time were very anxious not to offend her, Buccleuch was sent to England and came before the Queen, who asked him how he dared to undertake such an adventure. "'What is it?' answered he, "'that a man dare not do.' With ten thousand such men, said Elizabeth, turning to a lord in waiting, our brother of Scotland might shake the firmest throne of Europe. The ballad tells of the capture of Kinmont Willie, and how the false Sackeld and his men treacherously seized him. They bound his legs beneath his horse, and tied his hands behind his back, and with five men on each side to guard him, brought him over Little Ford and through Carlisle Sands to Carlisle Castle. When he arrived there, Willie addressed his captor in these words, My hands are tied, but my tongue is free. Who will avow this deed or answer for it to bold Buccleuch? Hold thy tongue, thou rank robber. Never a Scot shall set thee free. Ye shall take farewell of me before ye cross my castle gate, said Scroop. Fear ye not that, my lord, answers Willie, for by the faith of my body never did I yet lodge in a hostelry, but that I paid my reckoning before I went. Word was sent to Branxon Hall, to the keeper of Liddesdale, that Lord Scroop had captured Kinmont Willie, whereupon the keeper smote the table with his hand, till the red wine sprang on high. A curse on my head, he cried, if I be not avenged of Lord Scroop. Is my helmet a widow's cap, or my lance a twig from a willow tree, or my fist a lady's lily hand, that an English lord should appraise me so lightly? Have they taken Kinmont Willie in spite of the truce, and forgotten that the bold Buccleuch is keeper on the Scottish side? Have they taken Kinmont Willie so fearlessly, and forgotten that the bold Buccleuch can back a steed and wield a weapon? Were there but war between the lands, then would I slight Carlisle Castle, though it were built of marble. I would set it on fire and drench it with English blood. But since there is peace, and not war, I'll set the Kinmont free, yet never harm English lad or lass. So Buccleuch called forty bold marchmen, all of his own name and kin, except one Sir Gilbert Elliot, laird of Stobbs. They came spur on heel, and armour on shoulder, with gloves of green and feathers of blue. Five and five came first with hunting horns and bugles, five and five more came with Buccleuch, like warden's men arrayed for battle. Five and five came like a gang of masons, carrying long high ladders, and five and five came like broken men, and so they reached Woodhouse Lee. When they had crossed to the English side, the first man they met was the false Sackeld. "'Where are ye going, ye keen hunters?' quoth Sackeld. "'We go to hunt an English stag that has trespassed on Scottish ground. "'Where are ye going, ye martial men? "'We go to catch a rank robber that has broken faith with the bold Buccleuch. "'Where are ye going, ye mason lads, with all those long high ladders?' We go to harry a corby's nest, not far from here. Where are ye going, ye broken men? said false Sackeld. But Dickie of Dryhope, leader of the broken men, had never a word of learning, and answered nothing. Why trespass ye on the English side? Stand, ye raw-footed outlaws. Never a word yet, said Dickie, but for answer ran his lance, 
clean through the body of the false Sackeld. On then they went to Carlisle town, crossing the Eden at Stainshaw bank, nor lost they either horse or man, though the water was high in flood. When they reached Stainshaw bank, the wind was rising, and the laird ordered them to leave their horses for fear they should stamp and neigh. The wind blew loudly enough then, but when they came beneath the castle wall, there was wind and rain and flying sleet. On they crept on their knees and held their breath till they placed the ladders against the wall. Baclou himself mounted first, took the watchman by the throat and flung him down upon the leads. Thou hadst gone on the other side, said he, had there not been peace between our lands. Sound out the trumpets, quoth he. Let's wake up Lord Scroop. Then loud blew the warden's trumpet to the tune of O oh, wa dam meddle we me. To work they went speedily, and cut a hole through the lead, gaining thus the castle hall. Those inside thought the castle had been taken by King James and all his men, yet it was only twenty Scots and ten that had put a thousand in such a stir. They hammered and banged at the bars until they came to the inner prison, where lay Kinmont Willie. Do ye sleep or wake, Kinmont Willie, on the morn when ye shall die? Oh, I sleep lightly and wake often. It's long since sleep was frightened from me. Give my service to my wife and bairns and all good fellows that inquire after me. Red Rowan, the strongest man in Teviotdale, lifted him up. Stay now, Red Rowan, till I take farewell of Lord Scroop. Farewell, farewell, my good Lord Scroop, he cried. I will pay ye for my lodging when first we meet on the border. With shout and cry, Red Rowan bore him on his shoulders down the long ladder, the irons clanking at every stride. Many a time, said Kinmont Willie, have I ridden a horse both wild and unruly, but never have my legs bestrode a rougher beast than Red Rowan. Many a time have I pricked a horse over the furrows, but never since I backed a steed have I worn such cumbrous spurs. Scarcely had they won the Stainshaw bank, when all the bells in Carlisle were ringing, and Lord Scroop was after them with a thousand men on horse and foot. But Baclou has turned to Eden water, even where it flowed frae bank to brim, and he has plunged in we all his band, and safely swam them through the stream. He turned him on the other side, and at Lord Scroop his glove flung he. And if ye like na my visit to merry England, in fair Scotland, come visit me. All sore astonished stood Lord Scroop. He stood as still as rock or stain. He scarcely dared to true his eyes when through the water they had gain. He is either himself a devil frae hell or else his mother a witch mun be. I would na have ridden that one water for all the gold in Christenty. End of section 30Section 31 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 28 Dick of the Cow. Fair Johnny Armstrong to Willie did say, Billy a riding, we will gay. The ballad of this name, a popular one in Lidsdale, relates like that of Kinmont Willie to the time when Lord Scroop was warden of the West Marchers and governor of Carlisle. Dick of the Cow seems to have been his fool or jester. Dicky, some years after the events described in the ballad, fell a victim to the vengeance of the Armstrongs. There had been no raids from Lidsdale for a considerable time, and no riding, and the horses had all grown so fat that their dare scarcely stir out of their stall. Then fair Johnny Armstrong said to his brother Willie, Brother, we will go a-riding. We have long been at feud with England, and perhaps we shall find some spoil. 
So they rode to Hulton Hall and round about it, but the laird, a wise man, had left neither goods nor cattle outside to steal, except six sheep in a meadow. Said Johnny, I'd rather die in England than take those six sheep to Lidsdale. But who was that man we last met as we came over the hill? Oh, he's an innocent fool, and men call him Dick of the Cow. That fool has three good cows of his own, and as good as there are in Cumberland. Betide me life or death, they shall go to Liddersdale with me. So they came to the house of the poor fool, broke down his thick wall, loosed his three cows, and took also three coverlets from his wife's bed. In the morning at daylight, when the loss was discovered, there were loud lamentations. "'Hold thy tongue, wife,' said Dickie, "'and stop thy crying. "'I'll bring thee back three cows for each one thou hast lost.' So Dickie went to Lord Scroop. "'Hold thy tongue, fool,' said Scroop. "'I have no time for jesting.' "'A shame on your jesting, my lord,' said Dickie. "'Jesting agrees not with me.' Lidsdale was in my house last night, and has taken my three cows. I can no longer dwell in Cumberland as your poor faithful fool, unless you give me leave to steal in Lidsdale. I give thee leave, fool, said Scroop, but thou speakest against me, and my honour, unless thou give me thy hand and pledge, that thou wilt steal from none but those who stole from thee. There is my right hand and my pledge. May my head hang on Harry B., and may I never again cross Carlisle sands if I steal from any man who stole not from me. Dicky joyfully took leave of his lord and master, and went and bought a bridle and a pair of new spurs, which he packed up in the thigh of his breeches. Then he came on as fast as he could to Puddingburn House, where there were thirty-three Armstrongs. Oh, what has come to me now, said Dicky? what great trouble is this? for here is but one innocent fool against thirty-three Armstrongs. Yet he went courteously up to the hall board. Well may ye be my good lads, jock, but the devil bless all your company. I'm come to complain of your man Johnny Armstrong, and of his brother Willie, that they came to my house last night and took away my three cows. Quoth fair Johnny Armstrong, We'll hang him. Nay, said Willie, We'll slay him. But up spoke another young Armstrong. We'll give him a thrashing and let him go. Then up spoke the good laird's jock, the best fellow in all the company. Sit down a while, Dickie, and we'll give thee a bit of thine own cow's thigh. Dickie's heart was so sore that he couldn't eat a bit. But he went and lay down in an old peat house, where he thought to sleep the night. And all the prayers the poor fool prayed were, I wish I had amends for my three good cows. Now, it was the custom of Puddingburn House and of the house of Manderton, whose laird was chief of the Armstrong clan, that any who came not to the table at the first summons got no more meat till the next meal. So some of the lads, hungry and weary, had thrown the key of the stable above the door head. Dickie took good notice of that to turn it to his own account went into the stable where stood thirty-three horses, and tied thirty of them with St Mary's knot, tight to their stalls. Of the remaining three, Dickie took two, which belonged to Johnny and Willie Armstrong, and the one belonging to the laird's jock he left loose in the stable. Leaping on one, he took the other along with him and rode off as fast as he could. When day came, there were great shouts and cries. Who has done this? quoth the good laird's jock. See that ye tell me the truth. It is Dicky that has been in the stable last night and has taken the horses. Ye never would listen to me, said the good laird's jock, though I told ye true tales. Ye would never stay out of England, but would steal everything, till ye were crooked and blind. Lend me thy bay, said fair Johnny. He is the only horse loose in the stable and I'll either fetch back Dickie or the cow, or he shall die. Lend thee my bay, said Jock. He's worth gold and good money. Dick of the cow has taken two horses. I would not ye make them three. Johnny, however, took the laird's steel jacket on his back 
and a two-handed sword by his side, and a steel cap on his head, and galloped after Dickie, who was barely three miles from the town when Johnny overtook him on Canaby Lee, on the borders of Liddesdale. "'Abide, abide, thou traitor thief!' cried Armstrong. "'The day is come that thou shalt die.' Dicky looked over his left shoulder and said, "'Johnny, hast thou no more in thy company? "'There is a preacher in our chapel who teaches all the live-long day, "'and when day is gone and night has come, "'there are only three words I remember. "'The first and second are faith and conscience. "'The third is ne'er let a traitor free.' What faith and conscience was thine, Johnny, when thou tookst away my three cows? And when thou hadst taken them away, thou wast not satisfied? Thou sentest thy brother Willie, and took away three coverlets off my wife's bed. Then Johnny let his spear fall low by his side, and thought he would have killed Dickie. But the powers above were stronger than he, and he only succeeded in running through the fool's jerkin. Dickie, out with his sword, and ran after him, and when he couldn't get at him with the blade, he felled him with the butt-end over the eye. Fell Johnny Armstrong, the finest man in the South Country. Gramercy, said Dickie, I had but two horses, thou hast made them three. And he took Johnny's steel jacket off his back, and his two-handed sword, and his steel cap. Farewell, Johnny, said he, I'll tell my master I met thee. When Johnny wakened out of his swoon, he was a sad man. "'Art thou gone, Dickie?' he said. "'Then the shame and woe are left with me. "'Art thou gone? "'Then, Dickie, the devil go in thy company, "'for if I live to be a hundred, "'I'll never again fight with a fool.' "'Dickie came home to the good Lord Scroop "'as fast as he could. "'Now, Dickie, I'll neither eat nor drink "'till thou art hanged on high.' "'Shame speed the liars, my lord,' said Dickie. "'This is not the promise ye made me.' for I would never have gone to Liddesdale to steal if I had not got leave from thee. But why did ye steal the laird's jock's horse? Ye might have lived long in Cumberland before the laird's jock had stolen from thee. Indeed, I knew ye lied, my lord. I won the horse from fair Johnny Armstrong, hand to hand on Canaby Lee. There is the jacket that was on his back, and the two-handed sword that hung by his side, and the steel cap that was on his head. I brought all these tokens to show thee. If that be true, that thou tellest me, and I think thou durst not lie, I'll give thee fifteen pounds for the horse, all told out in the lap of thy cloak. I'll give thee one of my best milk cows to maintain thy wife and three children, and they will be as good as any two of thine would be. Shame speed the liars, my lord, said Dickie. Do you think I to make a fool of me? I'll either have twenty pounds for the horse, or else I'll take him to Morton Fair. So Scroop gave him twenty pounds for the horse, all in gold and good money, and one of his best milk cows to maintain his wife and three children. Then Dickie rode as fast as he could through Carlisle town, and the first man he met was my lord's brother, Ralph Scroop, bailiff of Glossenbury. "'Well be you met, Ralph Scroop,' said Dickie. "'Welcome, my brother's fool,' said Ralph. "'Where did you get Johnny Armstrong's horse?' "'Where did I get him? I stole him,' said Dickie. "'Wilt thou sell me the bonny horse?' "'Aye, if thou count out the money in the lap of my cloak, "'for never a penny will I trust thee. "'I'll give thee ten pounds for the horse, "'and count it into the lap of thy cloak, "'and one of my best milk cows to maintain thy wife and three children.' "'Shame speed the liars, my lord! "'Do you think I to make a fool of me?' I'll either have twenty pounds for the horse, or I'll take him to Morton Fair. So Ralph gave him twenty pounds for the horse, all in gold and good money, and one of his milk cows to maintain his wife and three children. Then Dickie leaped and laughed and cried, May the neck of the third horse be broken, if either of the two were better than he. So he came home to his wife, and ye may judge how the poor fool had succeeded. For her three stolen coverlets he gave her two score English pounds, and two cows as good as her own three. And here, said he, is a white-footed nag that I reckon will carry us both. But if I stay longer in Cumberland, the Armstrongs will hang me. So Dicky took leave of his lord, and went to live at Burg under Stanmuir. 
End of section 31. Section 32 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 29 The Lochmaben Harper. The castle of Lochmaben is said to have been the residence of Robert Bruce, while Lord of Allendale. Hence, as a royal fortress, the keeping of it was always granted to some powerful lord. There is extant a grant giving to one of these, Robert Lauder, the office of captain and keeper of Lochmaben Castle for seven years. And among his perquisites were lands stolen from the king. The inhabitants of four small villages near the castle have each still to this day a right to a small piece of ground. These people are descendants of Robert Bruce's retainers, to whom he assigned these portions of land in reward for faithful service, and there are still to be found some families, for example the Richardsons of Lochmaben, who hold their lands direct from the times of Bruce without a break. O oh, heard ye now of the silly blind harper, how long he lived in Lochmaben town, and how he would gang to fair England, to steal the Lord Warden's wanton brown. But first he gaed to his good wife, we all the haste that he could thole. This work, quoth he, will ne'er gay well without a mare that has a foal. Quoth his wife, Thou hast a good grey mare that can jump both high and low, so set thee on her back and leave the foal at home with me. Away went the harper to England as fast as he might, and when he came to Carlisle Gate, who should be there but the warden himself? Come into my hall, thou silly blind harper, and of thy harping let me hear. Oh, by my sooth, quoth the silly blind harper, I would rather her stabling for my mare. The warden looked over his left shoulder, and said unto his stable groom, Get take the silly blind harper's mare, and tie her beside my wanton brown. So the harper harped and sang, the lordlings danced, and so sweet was the music that the groom forgot all about the stable door. Still the harper harped on till all the nobles were fast asleep, when he quickly took off his shoes, crept softly down the stair, and hied with light tread to the stable door, which he opened and entered. He found there three and thirty steeds, he took a colt's halter, which he had hidden in his hose, slipped it over wanton brown, tied it to the grey mare's tail, and turned them both loose at the castle gate. Away they went over moor and moss and dale, and the mare never let wanton rest a moment, but kept him galloping home to her foal. So swift of foot was she, and knew her way so well, that she reached Lochmaben a good three hours before daybreak. When she came to the harper's door, she neighed and snorted. "'Rise up!' shouted the harper's wife. "'Thou lazy lass, and let in thy master and his mare.' The lass rose up, put on her clothes, and looked through the lock-hole. "'By my sooth!' cried she. "'Our mare has got a fine brown foal.' "'Hold thy tongue, thou foolish wench. "'The light is dazzling thine eyes. "'I'll wager all I have against a groat.' that it's bigger than ever our foal will be. Alas, alas, cried the cunning old harper, alas that I came here. In Scotland I have lost a brown colt foal, and in England they have stolen my good grey mare. Cease thou lamenting, thou silly blind harper, and go on harping. We'll pay thee well for the loss of thy colt foal, and thou shalt have a far better mare. So the harper harped and sang, and so sweet were his harpings that he was paid for the foal he never had lost, and three times over for the grey mare. End of section 32
of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30 The Rook Hope Ride. This Durham border song is supposed to be spoken by a Weardale man who begins by denouncing the inhabitants of the Tyne Valley and all their companies thereabout as false thieves, minded to do mischief, and at their stealing stands not out. It must be confessed that the Tyndale men had an unenviable reputation. They were such lawless desperadoes, so addicted to rapine, that during more than two centuries the merchants of Newcastle regularly refused to make an apprentice born in that district. The date is December 1572. The rebel Earl of Northumberland, who had taken up arms for Mary Queen of Scots and for the old religion, had been betrayed by the Scots and beheaded at York. Owing to this rebellion, there was great confusion in the northern counties. Hence the time was well chosen by the Limmer thieves of Tyndale to make a predatory raid on their neighbours. They gathered together the stoutest men of arms and the best in gear, a hundred or more in number, and in the forenoon, about eleven o'clock, they came into a by fell and stopped for a meal, the last which some of them would eat. When they had eaten, they chose their captains, Harry Corbill, Simon Fell, and Martin Ridley. Then they rode on over the moss, with many a brank and view, saying to one another that they were men enough. For Weardale men have a journey to Ain. They are so far out o'er yon fell, that some of them's with the two earls, and others fast in Bernard Castle. There shall we get gear enough, for there is nane but women at home. The sorrowful fend that they can make is loudly cries as they were slain. They came in at Rookhope Head, which is the top of a rocky valley about five miles long, at the end of which Rookhope Burn empties itself into the River Weir. This valley is as wild and open today as it was then. In some four hours they gathered together about six hundred sheep, and they were engaged in shifting the horses, when the hue and cry was raised by one Rowley, whose horse they tried to take. He was the first man to see them. The cry spread rapidly down Rookhope Burn, and through Weardale, and word came to the bailiff's house at the east gate. He was out, but his wife had his horse saddled and sent it to him, together with his sword, spear, and jacket quilted with iron plates, the sort of harness worn by the moss troopers and other light horsemen of the time. The bailiff had already heard the bad news, and was sorely troubled thereby. His own brother had been attacked three days before by marauders, and lay sick with nineteen wounds. Yet the bailiff shrank not at all, but hied fast after the sheep-stealers, with as many of the neighbours as he could gather to bear him company. The pursuers overtook the thieves in Newton Clough, and gave them all the fighting they wanted. Not one of them ever thought to see his wife again. They bore three banners against the Weardale men, as if the world had been all their own. The fray lasted only an hour, but many a tall man lay weaponless and sore wounded, before that hour was done, and four of the Northumbrian prickers were slain, including Harry Corbill, whom they had chosen to be their captain. Eleven of them were taken prisoners. Only one of the Weardale men fell, but these Weardale men, they have good hearts. They are as stiff as any tree, for if they'd every one been slain, never a foot back man would flee. And such a storm amongst them fell, as I think you never heard the like, for he that bears his head on high, he oft times falls into the dyke. And now I do entreat you all, as many as are present here, to pray for the singer of this song, for he sings to make blithe your cheer. End of section 33. Section 34 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 31 
Bathroom's Dirge. The story of how this ballad came to be preserved to us is a very interesting one. A Mr. Surtees, who was very interested in the old ballads, used to give work to a poor old Scotswoman to weed in his garden. Finding that she had learnt ballads in her young days, he encouraged her to talk about them, and this was amongst those which she recited to him. She told him that it referred to a young man named Bertram, or Bathram, who made love to a young lady against the wish of her brothers. The cruel brothers slew him, but the lady had him buried at the very spot where he was wont to come to visit her in the days of their love. Sir Walter Scott thinks that perhaps Bathram was an Englishman and the lady was Scottish, and that the anger of the lady's brothers against him was partly on that account. It must be remembered that in those stormy days when border rivalry was keen and all the border chiefs on both sides were men of warlike mould, intermarriage between the two races was punishable by border law. Each side felt equally that such mixed marriages would sooner or later produce a race that was neither loyal English nor loyal Scotch. A spirit of aloofness and rivalry was deliberately encouraged right up to the time of the union of the two countries under one king. Bathroom's Dirge They shot him dead at the nine stone rig beside the headless cross, and they left him lying in his blood upon the moor and moss. They made a bier of the broken bough, the sauch and the aspen grey, and they bore him to the lady chapel and waked him there all day. A lady came to that lonely bower, and threw her robes aside. She tore her long yellow hair, and knelt at Bathram's side. She bathed him in the lady well, his wounds so deep and sere, and she plaited a garland for his breast, and a garland for his hair. They rode him in a lily sheet, and bare him to his earth, and the grey friar sung the dead man's mass as they passed the chapel garth. They buried him at the murk midnight, when the dew fell cold and still, when the aspen grey forgot to play and the mist clung to the hill. They dug his grave but a bare foot deep by the edge of the nine stone burn, and they covered him o'er with the heather flower, the moss and the lady fern. The grey friar stayed upon the grave and sang till the morning tide, and a friar shall sing for Bathram's soul while the headless cross shall bide. Mr. Surtees observes on this passage that in the return made by the commissioners on the dissolution of Newminster Abbey, there is an item of a chauntery for one priest to sing daily ad crucem lapideam. Probably many of these crosses had the like expiatory solemnities for persons slain there. They certainly did bury in former days near the Ninestone Burn, for Sir Walter Scott found there lying among the heather a small monumental cross with initials, which he reverently placed upright. End of section 34「Section 35 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 32 Queen Mary and the Borders The brief reign of Mary, Queen of Scots, was so crowded with incident that she was left with little time to visit the disturbed borderland of her kingdom. Nonetheless, her few visits to this district were fraught with important consequences. In 1565, when she married her cousin, Lord Darnley, the head of the Douglas faction and a Roman Catholic, the Protestant nobles took up arms. In her very honeymoon, she headed her soldiers, pursued the rebels to Dumfries, entered the town with a pistol in each hand, and laughed heartily at the fun of making her enemies skip like rabbits 
over the border. She was only 22 years old, a fearless, dashing, attractive woman with a clever head, a strong will and a wild and lawless disposition. In the next year, she again visited the border, but on a very different errand. Mary had developed an extreme fancy for that bold border lord, the Earl of Bothwell, whose castle of hermitage commanded the picturesque and important valley of the Liddell. The Queen had given him authority to control the fierce borderers, and when the Earl was riding out, he met the most lawless of them, Jock Elliot, of whom the couplet, My name is little Jock Elliot, and who dare meddle wi' me? Bothwell fired straight at Elliot with his pistol, wounding him in the leg. Elliot aimed a mighty blow at Bothwell with his two-handed sword, giving the Earl so sore a wound that he was glad enough to gallop home while there was yet time to save his life. Mary was holding solemn court at Jedburgh when she heard of her favourite's danger. She straightway took horse and rode to Hermitage, a hard cross-country ride of twenty miles, through a district infested with reckless men. When she galloped back to Jedburgh, she was in high fever and nearly died. Later on, in the misery of her long imprisonment, she often said, Would I had died at Jedburgh. Years later, a broken piece of a silver spur was found at Queensmire on this difficult and dangerous road, just where Queen Mary's horse was said to have come to grief. Yet another time Queen Mary came to the border, this time to cross it after her imprisonment at Loch Leven, her escape and the disastrous rout of her followers at Langside. Daring and resourceful as ever, she fled across the Solway in an open boat. Scotland had failed her. She sought the protection of England. She landed at Cockermouth and was led to Carlisle by Sir R. Lowther and kept there, in reality a prisoner, while Elizabeth was musing of the dangers of the position. The earls of Northumberland and Westmoreland took up Mary's cause and attempted to rescue her. But the warden of Carlisle, Lord Scroop, defended the town successfully against the two earls, and they were soon in flight eastward for their very lives. After this attempt at rescue, Mary was, for greater safety, sent down to Bolton Castle in Yorkshire. Leonard Dacre, a member of the powerful Cumberland family of the Dacres, seems to have played a treacherous part, first promising the earls his help, and then betraying them to Elizabeth. He seized Narworth Castle, which properly belonged to his young niece, and collected together 3,000 men to the old border war cry, a red bull, a red bull, probably the nickname of some fierce red-haired Celtic champion. The defeated earls came to Narworth for shelter, and Dacre refused to harbour them. But by this time, Elizabeth was convinced of Dacre's treason, and ordered Lord Hudson, the governor of Berwick, to arrest him. Hudson appears to have marched by rather a roundabout way, for Dacre met him at Geltbridge on the west of Naworth. A bridge is always a good point of vantage for meeting an enemy, especially when the river runs, as the Gelt does, through a deep and wooded gorge. The enemy has only a narrow way by which to approach, and no doubt Dacre posted his archers behind the trees and among the great rocks. The fight was a desperate one, but Hudson's men prevailed and pursued their foes far up the hill of Gelt, scuffling fiercely among the forest trees and dyeing a deeper hue the red sandstone cliffs and quarries. All the rebels who could escape fled across the border to Scotland, where the borderers, who were till then their enemies, received them with that open and fair hospitality which was one of their many great qualities. Elizabeth demanded that the leading nobleman should be given up to her, but although the Scottish regent, Murray, made a pretence of trying to secure the Earl of Westmoreland, the Scots had too much sense of honour to allow him to proceed. The Earl of Northumberland was, however, betrayed to the Scottish regent by Hector Armstrong of Hare Law. But this the gallant borderers held to be shameful, and Armstrong was a ruined man from that day forth. 
Two years later, this earl was actually sold to Elizabeth and beheaded at York. Thus ended this small rebellion, called in history the Rising of the North, but which is known locally in Cumberland as Dacre's Raid. There is a little stream which rushes down a deep and beautiful glade to join the River Gelt above Geltbridge. This stream is known as Helbeck, and villagers tell us that the reason for this name is that it was stained with blood for two whole days after some battle that took place there. The battle is probably the one spoken of here. A wicket gate by Geltbridge leads us to the path through Gelt Woods. The noble gorge is deeply cleft through the grand red sandstone rocks. Below roars and dashes the impetuous river. The path winds, sometimes high, sometimes low, through wonderful weeds, carpeted with beautiful mosses, gemmed with delightful flowers. On one of the rocks is an inscription carved by a Roman soldier over 1,500 years ago. Follow the river up, up, till the little Helbeck is seen trickling down from the east. Cross the little bridge and follow the streamlet on its opposite bank, along a path so little trod as to be scarcely visible. Wander among ferns along one of the loneliest glens in the whole of Britain, passing the great railway bridge, under if the stream be low, or over if it be high, till you join the main road again. There is no spot more beautiful or more peaceful, yet this is the Helbeck where men fought and hacked and slashed and slew among these woods up and down these steep hillsides. These old trees, when young, have felt warm blood at their roots, and all because of a young, wild, willful queen who fascinated men's hearts then, and the memory of whom fascinates them still. End of section 35section 36 of stories of the scottish border by mr and mrs william platt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 33 the raid of the reedswire to deal with proud men is but pain for either must ye fight or flee or else no answer make again but play the beast and let them be reedswire the name of a place about 10 miles from Jedburgh means the Red Swire. Swire is an old northern term for the descent of a hill, and the epithet red may refer to the colour of the heath. The affair about which we are to tell took place on the 7th of July, 1575, at a meeting held on a day of truce by the wardens of the marchers for redressing wrongs and adjusting difficulties which could not be prevented from arising upon the border. The Scottish warden was Sir John Carmichael, and among his followers were the Armstrongs and Elliots, Douglas of Cavers, a descendant of the Douglas who fell at Otterburn, Cranston, whose ferocious motto was, Ye shall want ere I want, Gladstone, good at need, and the ancient head of the Rutherfords, called in tradition the Cock of Hunt Hill, with his nine sons him about. The English warden was the haughty Sir John Forster, and he had full 1,500 men with him, chiefly Northumbrians, Tyndale and Reedsdale men, who looked with scorn upon the much smaller array of their hereditary foes. The meeting, however, began, meekly enough, with merriment and jests. Such border meetings of truce, though they might wind up in blood, as was to happen now, always began as occasions of marketing and revelry. Both parties came fully armed to such a tryst, yet intermixed in mutual sports and familiar intercourse. Some gave to drink and some stood still, and some to cards and dice them sped. The Scots planted their pavilions or tents and feared no ill, even when they saw 500 Fenix, a powerful Northumbrian clan, marching in a flock. The clerk began to call the rolls and to deal with one complaint after another, for the loss of cows or ewes or other property. 
In the course of the proceedings, an accusation was raised against an English freebooter named Farnstein at the insistence of a Scotch complainant. A true bill was found against the man, which means that he ought to be handed over to justice, but the English warden alleged that he had fled and could not be found. Carmichael, considering this as a pretext to avoid making compensation for the felony, bade the Northumbrians speak out plainly and cloak no cause for ill nor good. Upon this, Sir John Forster, a proud and insolent man, began to reckon kin and blood, by which picturesque phrase the ballad probably means that he swiftly added up his forces. Then he drew himself up, backed by his dalesmen, all fingering their bows, and with insulting expressions against Carmichael's kin, he bade him match with his equals. The men of Tyndale, who only wanted a pretext for a quarrel, drew their bows and let off a flight of arrows among the Scots. The more moderate men on both sides at first tried to quell the tumult, but in vain. The fight was bound to come. Then there was naught but bow and spear, and every man pulled out a brand. The English showed their usual dexterity with the bow. The Scots, for some reason, never took to this weapon. They had firearms, pistolets, and the like. The terrible cloth-yard arrows from tackles flew, and the old proverb bade fair to justify itself that every English archer carried twenty-four Scots under his belt, an allusion to his bundle of shafts. Success seemed certain for the English side. Some of the foremost men among the Scots fell, and even Carmichael was thrown to the ground and was within an ace of being made a prisoner. The air resounded with the rallying cries of the English, the names of their captains. A shafto, a shafto, a fennec, a fennec. The Scots had little harness among them. Only a few had the jack which served them as a defence for the body. Nevertheless, they laid about them sturdily with dints full dower, and there was many a cracked crown. Then suddenly a shout was heard. Jedburgh's here! A body of Jedburgh burgesses appear to have arrived just in the nick of time, to add to the outnumbered force of Scots. They probably wore armour and what were called white hats, that is, steel caps. Meanwhile, the English, too confident of easy victory, instead of slaying more Scots and turning the repulse into a rout, thought only to plunder the unhappy merchants, who, trusting to the truce which had been proclaimed, had attached themselves to the meeting. Had it not been for the English greed, the Scots would have been defeated. As it was, the Tyndale men, throwing themselves on the merchants' packs, fell into disorder. Their adversaries recovered from their surprise, and the timely arrival of the Jedburgh men turned the tables. A short, sharp bout ended in the triumph of the Scots, and the Northumbrians fled, down o'er the bray like clogged bees. The Scots took many prisoners, amongst whom were the English warden and his son-in-law, Sir Francis Russell. But the most gallant soldier taken that day was that courteous knight, Sir Cuthbert Collingwood, to whose family Admiral Collingwood belonged. Several of those Fenix Fierce, who had turned up 500 strong at the commencement of the fray, had the mortification of being carried off in triumph by their enemies. All these prisoners were sent to the Earl of Morton, Regent of Scotland, who detained them at Dalkeith for some days, until the bitter feeling natural after such an affair had died down, at any rate in part, and by this prudent precaution the regent is thought to have probably averted a war between the two kingdoms. He ultimately permitted them to return to their own country, parting from them with great expressions of regard. The interest taken in the matter by Queen Elizabeth and the representations of her ambassador at Edinburgh no doubt had something to do with this happy issue. It will probably occur to the careful reader of this book as somewhat strange to find the ruling powers of England and Scotland both set upon peace. But it must be remembered that at this period in the reign of Queen Elizabeth, the heir apparent to the English throne was the young James the Sixth, King of Scotland, who would naturally not wish for any quarrel with the country which he hoped later on to rule. 
Elizabeth, on the other hand, had Mary, Queen of Scots, as her prisoner, and did not wish in any further way to strain the already delicate relations between the two countries. Carmichael mentioned in this ballad, known in full as Sir John Carmichael of Edrum, Scottish Warden of the Middle Marches, was afterwards murdered by one of the Wild Armstrongs, who is said to have composed the night before his execution the following manly and pathetic Good Night. The third and fourth lines show clearly the disrepute into which this once honoured clan was falling. The seventh and eighth lines could only have been written by one who, despite his faults, had the true gallant instincts deep in his blood. Armstrong's Good Night This night is my departing night, for here no longer must I stay. There's neither friend nor foe o' mine but wishes me away. What I have done through lack of wit, I never, never can recall. I hope you're all my friends as yet. Good night and joy be with you all. End of section 36. Section 37 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 34 Jock of the Side. He is well kenned, John of the Side. A greater thief did never ride. The subject of this ballad bears some resemblance to Kinmont Willie, and such adventures were not uncommon in those turbulent times. The events we are to relate originated in a raid ridden by the famous Liddesdale Spearmen, the hardiest of the Scotch moss troopers, upon English ground. They had better have stayed at home, for the outcome was that one of their best men, Michael of Winfield, was killed, and Jock of the Side, nephew to the Laird of Mangerton, was taken prisoner and promptly lodged in Newcastle jail. When the news reached Jock's mother, she kilted her coats up to her knee and ran down the water with the tears falling in torrents from her eyes. She ran to Mangerton House on the banks of the Liddle and told her brother, the good old lord, the bad news. Michael is killed, and they have taken my son, John. Never fear, sister, quoth Mangerton. I have eighty-three yokes of oxen. My barns, my byres, my folds are all filled. I'll part with them all ere Johnny shall die. Then he thought out his plan. Three men I'll send to set him free, all harnessed in the best steel. The English loons shall feel the weight of their broad swords. The laird's jock shall be one. The laird's what? Two. And hobby noble, thou must be the third. Thy coat is blue, and since England banished thee, thou hast been true to me. Now this hobby was an Englishman, born in Bewcastledale, the wildest district in Cumberland. Like numerous other English outlaws, he had made his own country too hot to hold him. His misdeeds had banished him to Liddersdale, and he was now in high favour with the Laird of Mangerton. The Laird gave the dauntless three orders to reverse the shoes of their horses so that anyone crossing their trail might think they were proceeding in a contrary direction. He also warned them not to seem gentlemen, but to look like corn carriers, not to show their good armour, nor appear like men of war, but to be arrayed as country lads, with halter and cart collar on each mare. So Hobby mounted his grey, Jack his lively bay, and Watt his white horse, and they rode for Tynewater. When they reached the Tyne, they lighted down at a ford, and by the moonlight they cut a tree, with fifteen nogs on each side, to serve them as a scaling ladder, to climb Newcastle Wall with. However, when they came to Newcastle Town and alighted at the wall, their tree proved three ells too short, and there was nothing for it but to force the gates. At the gate, a proud porter attempted to withstand them. The Armstrongs wrung his neck, took his life and his keys at once, and cast his body behind the wall. 
Soon they reached the jail and called to the prisoner. Sleeps thou, wakes thou, jock o' the side, or art thou weary of thy thrall? Jock answered dolefully, Often I wake, nay, sleep seldom comes to me, but who's this knows my name so well? Then out and spoke the laird's Jock, his cousin and namesake. Now fear ye not, my Billy, quoth he, for here are the laird's Jock, the laird's Wat, and Hobby Noble, the Englishman, come to set you free. Jock of the side did not think it possible that they could effect his release. Now hold thy tongue, my good cousin, said he, this cannot be, for if all Liddlesdale were here the night, the morn's the day that I must die. They have laid full fifteen stone of Spanish iron on me. I am fast bound with locks and keys in this dark and dreary dungeon. But the laird's jock replied, Fear not that, faint heart, never one fair lady. Work thou within, we'll work without, and I'll be sworn we'll set thee free. They loose the first strong door without a key. The next chain door they split to flinders. The laird's jock got the prisoner on his back, irons and all, and brought him down the stairs with no small speed and joy. Hobby Noble offered to bear some of his weight, but the laird's jock said that he was lighter than a flea. When they had all gone out at the gates, the prisoner was set on horseback, and they all joked wantonly. Oh, jock, they cried, you ride like a winsome lady, with your feet all on one side. The night was wet, but they did not mind. They hied them on full merrily, until they came to the ford at Cholliford above Hexham. There the water was running mountains high. They asked an old man, Honest man, tell us in haste, will the water ride? I've lived here thirty years and three, replied he, and I never saw the tyne so big, nor running so like a sea. The laird's what counselled them to halt. We need not try it, the day is come and we all must die. Poor faint-hearted thief, cried the laird's jock. There'll no man die but him that's fated. I'll guide you safely through, lift the prisoner behind me. With that they took to the water and managed to swim through. Here we are all safe, said the laird's jock triumphantly. Poor faint what, what think ye now? They now saw twenty men pursuing them, sent from Newcastle, all English lads, stout and true. But when their leader saw the water, he shook his head. It won't ride, my lads, said he. Then he cried to the party of Scots, Take the prisoner, but leave me my fetters. But the laird's jock was not a Scot for nothing. I what we'll know, he shouted back, I'll keep them. They'll make horseshoes for my mare, for I am sure she bought them right dear from thee. Then they went on their way to Liddesdale as fast as they could, and did not rest until they had brought the rescued prisoner to his own fireside and made him free of his irons. End of section 37section 38 of stories of the scottish border by mr and mrs william platt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 35 hobby noble keep ye will frae the traitor mains for golden gear he'll sell ye all in the ballad of jock of the side we have seen Hobby Noble act a distinguished part in the deliverance from captivity of Jock, cousin of the Laird of Mangerton, chief of the Armstrong clan. Now, in the following ballad, we shall learn how ungrateful the Armstrongs were for his faithful services. The Armstrongs were one of those outlawed or broken clans whose hand was against every man, and living as they did in what was called the debatable land on the frontier between Liddesdale and England, these stark cattle lifters and arrant thieves levied tribute from English and Scotch alike. Halbert, or Hobby Noble, was an Englishman, a Cumbrian born and bred, but his misdeeds were so great they banished him never to return, 
and he established himself among the Armstrongs. From their territory, he continued his depredations upon the English, in resentment of which they at length offered a bribe to the Armstrongs to decoy him into England under pretence of inviting him to join them in a foray. At Kerr's Hope foot the tryst was set, Kerr's Hope of the Lily Lee, and the name of the chief traitor and leader of the gang was Sim of the Mains. Hobbie harnessed himself, both with the iron and with the steel, buckled spur on his heel and belted brand to his side, leapt upon his fringed grey and rode down the banks of the Liddle. As soon as he saw the others, "'Well be ye met, my comrades five, he cried. "'Now what is your will with me?' They all answered with one consent, "'Thou art welcome here, brave noble. "'Wilt thou ride with us into England, "'and we will be thy safe warrant? "'If we get a horse worth a hundred pounds, "'thou shalt soon be upon its back.' But Hobby said that he dared not ride into England by day, as he had a feud with the land sergeant, an officer under the warden, to whom was entrusted the arrest of delinquents. "'But will ye stay till the day go down, "'and till the night come o'er the ground, and I'll be a guide worth any two that may in Liddersdale be found. Though the night be black as pitch and tar, I'll guide ye o'er yon hill so high, and bring ye all in safety back, if ye'll be true and follow me. They let him guide them over moss and moor, over hill and hope, and over many a down, until they came to the fool bog shield. But meanwhile, Word was gone to the land sergeant in Askerton, about seventeen miles from Carlisle. The deer that you have hunted so long is in Bewcastle Waste this day. The sergeant understood at once. Quoth he, Hobby Noble is that deer. He carries the stile full high. He has often driven our bloodhounds back. Now, go warn the bows of Hartley Burn. See they sharpen their arrows on the wall. Warn Williver and Spear Edom. Take word to them that they meet me on the Roderick Haw at break of day. We will on to Conscourtout Green, for there, I think, we'll get our quarry. In the meantime, Hobby had alighted and was sleeping in the Fullbog Shield. He dreamed that his horse was shot beneath him, and he himself was hard put to it to get away. The cocks crowed, the day dawned, and if Hobby had not wakened, he would have been taken or slain in his sleep. Awake, awake, my comrades five, I trow here makes a full ill day, yet the worst cloak o' this company I hope shall cross the waste this day. Thus cried he to his companions, thinking the gates were clear, but alas, it was not so. They were beset by the land sergeant's men, cruel and keen, and while the Englishmen came before, the traitor Sim of the Mains came behind. Had Noble been as masterful a champion as Wallace himself, he could not have won under such untoward circumstances. He had but a laddie's sword, but he did more than a laddie's deeds, for that sword would have cleared Conscourthart Green had it not broken over one of the English heads. So his treacherous companions delivered Hobby up to the officers of justice. They bound him with his own bowstring, but what made his heart feel sorest of all was that it was his own five who bound him. They took him on to Carlisle. They asked him mockingly if he knew the way. He thought much, but said little, though he knew it as well as they did. As they took him up the Carlisle streets, the old wives cast their windows wide every woman whispering to another, "'That's the man loose jock of the side.' The poor fellow cried out, "'Fie on ye women! Why call ye me man? It's no like a man that I'm used, but like a beaten hound that's been fighting in the gutter.' They had him up through Carlisle town, and set him by a chimney fire, where they gave him a wheaten loaf to eat, and a can of beer. "'Confess my lord's horse, Hobby,' they said, and tomorrow in Carlisle thou shalt not die. How can I confess them, says the poor man, when I never saw them? 
and he swore a great oath by the day that he was born, that he had never had anything of my lord's. He had but short shrift, and they hung him the next morning. According to the ballad, his last words were of manly pride. Yet would I rather be called Hobby Noble, in Carlisle where he suffers for his fault, than I'd be called the traitor mains that eats and drinks a meal and malt. Thus died the doughty noble. It is proper to add, however, that the Armstrong's chief, Lord Mangerton, with whom Hobby had been a favourite, took a severe revenge on the traitors who betrayed him. The contriver of the scheme, Simmer the Mains, fled into England to escape the resentment of his chief, and was there caught by the English, and himself executed at Carlisle, two months after Hobby's death, in the same place. Such is, at least, the tradition of Liddesdale. End of section 38section 39 of stories of the scottish border by mr and mrs william platt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 36 the laird o'logie in 1592 the earl of bothwell francis stuart failed in an attempt against king james the 6th whom he tried to surprise in the palace of falkland among his adherents whom he sought about the king's person, was the hero of this ballad, the Laird of Logie, who was taken prisoner and laid in Edinburgh Chapel in the keeping of Sir John Carmichael, the hero of the ballad called The Raid of Reedswire. Carmichael was at this time captain of the king's guard and had the keeping of state criminals. I will sing if ye will hearken, if ye will hearken unto me, the king has ta'en a poor prisoner, the wanton laird o' young Logie. Young Logie's laid in Edinburgh Chapel, Carmichael's the keeper o' the key, and may Margaret's lamenting sir, all for the love o' young Logie. Lament, lament na, may Margaret, and of your weeping let me be, for you maun to the king himself to seek the life of young Logie. May Margaret has kilted her green clothing, and she has curled back her yellow hair. If I canna get young Logie's life, farewell to Scotland for evermore. When she came before the king, she kneeled lowly on her knee. Oh, what's the matter, May Margaret, and what needs all this courtesy? A boon, a boon, my noble liege, a boon, a boon I beg of thee, and the first boon that I come to crave is to grant me the life of young Logie. Oh, na, oh, na, may Margaret, forsooth and so it mauna be, for all the gold of fair Scotland shall not save the life of young Logie. But she has stolen the king's red in came, likewise the queen her wedding knife, and sent the tokens to Carmichael to cause young Logie get his life. She sent him a purse of the red gold another of the white money. She sent him a pistol for each hand, and bade him shoot when he got free. When he came to the tollbooth stair, there he let his volley flee. It made the king in his chamber start, e'en in the bed where he might be. Get out, get out, my merry men all, and bid Carmichael come speak to me, for I'll lay my life the pledge of that that yon's the shot a young Logie. When Carmichael came before the king, he fell low down upon his knee. The very first word that the king spake was, Where's the laird a young Logie? Carmichael turned him round about. I wot the tear blinded his e. There came a token frae your grace, has ta'en away the laird frae me. Hast thou played me that, Carmichael, and hast thou played me that, quoth he, the morn the justice courts to stand, and Logie's place ye mourn supply. Carmichael's away to Margaret's bower, even as fast as he may dree. Oh, if young Logie be within, tell him to come and speak with me. May Margaret turned her round about. I wot a loud laugh laughed she. The egg is chipped, 
the bird is flown. You'll see nae mare, O young Logie. End of section 39「Section 40 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 37 Jamie Telfer of the Fair Dodhead. Note, the Telfers, though they had become Scotch at the time of this ballad, were originally a Norman family descended from the knight Ty Fair, cut iron who came over with William the Conqueror. "'Tis I, Jamie Telfer, of the fair Dodd head, and a harried man I think I be. There's nothing left at the fair Dodd head but a woeful wife and bairnies three. About Martinmas time, when border steeds get corn and hay, the captain of Bewcastle rode over to Tividale to forage, and first he met a guide in hard horsewire, and next he met a guide low down in Borthwick water. What tidings, what tidings, my trusty guide? No tidings have I. Yet if ye go to the fair Dodd Head, I'll let ye see many a cow's calf. Right hastily they came to the fair Dodd Head, loosed the cows, and ransacked the house. Jamie Telfer's heart was sore when he saw this, and the tears ran down his cheeks, and he pleaded with the captain to give him back his gear, or else he would have revenge upon him. But the captain only laughed and said, Man, there's nothing in thy house but an old sword without a sheath that could scarcely kill a mouse. The sun was not up, though the moon had gone down, and there was a sprinkling of new-fallen snow upon the ground, when Jamie Telfer ran ten miles afoot between the Dodd Head and Stobbs Hall. When he came to the tower gate, he shouted aloud, and old Gibby Elliot came out and asked the meaning of such disturbance. It is I, Jamie Telfer of the fair Dodd Head, and a harried man am I, for nothing is left at fair Dodd Head but a sad wife and three bairnies. Go and seek help at Branksom Hall, for ye shall get none from me. Seek help where ye paid blackmail, for man, never did ye pay me any. James turned him about, his eyes blinded with tears. Never shall I pay blackmail again to Elliot. My hounds may all run masterless, my hawks may fly as they will from tree to tree, and my lord may seize the lands of his vassal for never shall I see again the fair Dodd head. He turned him to Tiviot's side, and made as fast as he could for Coultart Clough, and there he shouted aloud until out came old Jock Grieve, and asked who it was that made such a noise. It is I, Jamie Telfer, of the fair Dodd head, and a harried man am I, for nothing is left at fair Dodd head but a weeping wife and three bairnies, and six poor calves stand in the stall crying aloud for their mothers. Alack, quoth Jock Grieve, alack, my heart is sore for thee, for I married the eldest of three sisters, and you married the youngest. So he took out his bonny black horse, right well fed with corn and hay, and set Jamie Telfer on his back to take his troubles to Catslock Hill. When he came to Catslock Hill, he shouted aloud, until out came William's Watt to ask what was the matter. It is I, Jamie Telfer, of the fair Dodd head, and a harried man am I. The captain of Bewcastle has driven away my gear. For God's sake, rise and help me. Alas and alack, quoth William's Watt, my heart is sore for thee. Never did I yet come to the fair Dodd head and found thy basket bare. He set his two sons on coal-black steeds, and he himself mounted a freckled grey, and with Jamie they rode to Branksome Hall, where they shouted so loud and high that old Buccleugh came out to ask what was the matter. It is I, Jamie Telfer, of the fair Dodd head, and a harried man am I. 
There's not left at fair dodd head but a weeping wife and three bairnies. Alack, quoth the good old lord, my heart is sorry for thee. Go call Willie, my son, to come speedily. Go call up hastily the men that live by the waterside. They who will not ride for Telfer's cattle, let them never again look me in the face. Call up Wat O'Harden and his sons. Call up Borthwick Water, Gordylands and Allenhoff. Call Gilman's Kloof and Commonside. Ride by the gate at Priest Horse Wire, and call the Curras of the Lee, and call brave Willie of Gorimberry, as ye come down the Hermitage Slack. So the Scots rode and ran bravely and steadily, shouting, Ride for Branksome. And when Willie looked ahead, he saw the cattle being driven fast up the Frosty Lee Brook and to the plain. Who drives yon cattle? cried Willie Scott, to make us a laughing stock. Tis I, the captain of Bewcastle. I will not hide my name from thee. Let Telfer's cattle go back, or by the faith of my body, said Willie, I'll wear my dame's calf skin on thee. I will not let the cattle go back, neither for thy love nor fear. I will drive Jamie Telfer's cattle in spite of all your company of Scots. Set on them, lads, cried Willie. Set on them cruelly. There will be many an empty saddle before they come to Ritterford. So they set to with heart and hand, and blows fell like hail, until many were slain, and many a horse ran masterless. But Willie was struck by a sword through the headpiece and fell to the ground, and old Wat of Harden wept for rage when he saw that his son was slain. He took off his steel cap and waved it thrice, and the snow on Dinley Mountain was never whiter than the locks of his hair. Revenge! Revenge! he cried. Lay on them, lads! Willie's death shall be revenged, or we will never see Teviot's side again. The lancers flew into splinters, and many another brave rider fell, and before the curse hope forward was reached, the Scots had got the victory. John of Brigham was slain, and John of Barlow, and thirty more of the captain's men lay bleeding on the ground. The captain himself was run through the right thigh, and the bone broken, and never would woman love him again, if he should live a hundred years. "'Take back the kai,' said he. "'They are dear kai to some of us. Never will a fair lady smile on me.' if I should live to be a hundred. Word came to the captain's bride in her bower that her lord had been taken prisoner. I would rather have had a winding sheet, said she, and helped to put it over his head, than that he should have been disgraced by the border Scot when he led his men over little. There was a wild gallant there named Wattie Woodspurs, or Madspurs, who cried, let us on to his house in Stain Girth's side, if any man will ride with us. So they came to Stain Girth's side, pulled down the trees, burst open the door, and drove out all the captain's kai before them. An old woman of the captain's kin cried, Who dare loose the captain's kai, or answer to him and his men? It is I, Watty Woodspurs, that loose the kai. I will not hide my name from thee, and I will loose them in spite of him and his men. When they came to the fair dodd head, they were a welcome sight, for instead of his own ten milk guy, Jamie Tilfer now had got thirty-three. He paid the rescue shot in gold and silver, and at Willie Scott's burial there were many weeping eyes. End of section 40section 41 of stories of the scottish border by mr and mrs william platt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 38 muckle mowed meg the scott family was very powerful on the border in the days of queen elizabeth the bravest and strongest of them being the bold lord of buccleuch his name is often mentioned in border history and so is that of another Scot, old Watt Scott of Harden. He was a fit man for these wild times, being both brave and canny. 
He married a beautiful border lass, the flower of Yarrow, and it is surprising how many able men have descended from this marriage. Not only did Sir Walter Scott and Robert Louis Stevenson claim descent from this fine old freebooter, his daughter Maggie married Gilbert Elliot of Stobbs, nicknamed Gibby with the Golden Garters, and from them were descended George Augustus Elliot, Lord Heathfield, famous for his splendid defence of Gibraltar, worthy of the best border traditions, and also the Elliots of Minto, who have twice been viceroys of India, once late in the 18th century and once early in the 20th century. One of the sons of Scott of Harden came perilously near to finding out how far his neck was capable of carrying the weight of his body. It was late in Queen Elizabeth's reign, and King James VI of Scotland was extra anxious to live at peace with England, for he expected now very soon to be king over both countries. So he told his warden, the bold Buccleuch, to restrain the wild Scotch freebooters, and you may imagine that the order was little to their liking. Young Willie Scott, Scott of Harden's son, quickly determined that cattle he must steal anyhow. He was his father's son, and did not his father once say as he gazed longingly at a fine English haystack, if only ye'd got four legs, haystack, ye would not be standing there. So, as Willie Scott was forbidden to steal English cattle, he decided to steal Scotch. Sir Gideon Murray of Ellibank Castle was an old enemy of the Scott family, having once been told off to punish them for some audacious act of theirs. And Sir Gideon had some cattle that would make any borderer's mouth water, and his arm itch to drive them home. So Willie and a few boon companions started off one night for Ellibank. But a warning voice had reached Sir Gideon, and Willie received a warm reception and was taken prisoner. He lay in the castle dungeon all night, reflecting on the folly of being caught, and fully expecting to be hanged very early next morning, perhaps without even his breakfast to comfort him. But early on the fatal morning, Lady Murray startled her husband by asking him if he really meant to hang Willie Scott. He looked at her as if she were mad. Of course, what else was there to do? Then she unfolded her scheme. She had a very plain-looking daughter, known as Mucklemoud Meg, or Margaret, with the extremely large mouth. Young Scott was handsome and of good family, and poor Meg would never again have such a chance of getting a good husband. Why not release Willie Scott if only he would marry Mucklemoud Meg? They were men of action in those days, and the priest was instantly sent for. Then, all being ready, the prisoner was brought forth. He was shown, on the one hand, the priest and the girl, and on the other hand, the tree and the noose, and was asked to take his choice. His first proud feeling was that he would be mocked at if he married such a girl on such terms, and he walked bravely towards the rope. But the nearer he got to it, the uglier it looked. He had to confess to himself that it was not at all a comfortable-looking rope. He had a nasty feeling round his neck from merely looking at it, and thought it would probably feel worse when it got round his throat. Then he looked at the girl. She certainly was not as beautiful as his mother, the lovely flower of Yarrow, and a borderer loved a beautiful wife. But if he hanged, he would have no wife at all. Then he suggested that he should have three days to think it over, but Murray said no. Neither priest nor noose was prepared to wait. He must decide at once. Then he looked again at Meg and saw a kind glance in her eye. She felt sorry for the handsome young fellow. Then he knew she had a good heart, and that decided the matter. He went up and kissed her with a good grace, and the priest married them straight away. Afterwards, he became Sir William Scott, and an important man on the border. And best of all, Meg proved to be a real good wife to him, and he never regretted the day when he elected to suffer the knot to be tied by the priest instead of by the hangman. End of section 41
Section 42 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 39 The Dowie Dens of Yarrow. This is one of the most famous and widely known of all the border ballads, and has proved a source of inspiration to several poets, including Wordsworth, who wrote three poems upon the subject. The Bard does not relate the full particulars, but gives only the barest outlines of facts, which were well known in his day and still live in tradition. The story tells of a duel between two brothers-in-law. The very spot where it took place is still pointed out, a low muir on the Yarrow banks. The slain knight was apparently Walter Scott, one of the ancestors of Lord Napier. His murderer was his brother-in-law, John Scott. Dowie means melancholy, and den is a word used to describe a narrow rocky valley, usually wildly beautiful. Late at e'en drinking the wine, and ere they paid the lowing, they set a combat them between, to fight it in the dawn. O oh, stay at home, my noble lord, O oh, stay at home, my marrow, my cruel brother will you betray, on the dowie homes of Yarrow. O oh, fare ye well, my lady gay, O oh, fare ye well, my Sarah, for I must go, though I ne'er return, from the dowie banks of Yarrow. She kissed his cheek, she combed his hair, as oft she had done before, O. Oh. She belted him with his noble brand, and he's away to Yarrow. And he gaed up the tenny's bank, I wot he gaed with sorrow, till down in a den he spied nine armed men on the dowie homes of Yarrow. O oh, come ye here to part your land, the bonny forest thorough, or come ye here to wield your brand on the dowie homes of Yarrow? I come not here to part my land, and neither to beg nor borrow. I come to wield my noble brand on the bonny banks of Yarrow. If I see all ye are nine to one, and that's an unequal marrow, yet will I fight while lasts my brand on the bonny banks of Yarrow. Four has he hurt and five has slain on the bloody braes of Yarrow till that stubborn knight came him behind and ran his body thorough. Gehame, gehame, good brother John, and tell your sister Sarah to come and lift her lethal lord, he's sleeping sound on Yarrow. Yestreen I dreamed a doleful dream, I fear there will be sorrow. I dreamed I pulled the heather green, we my true love on Yarrow. O gentle wind that bloweth south, from where my love repaireth, convey a kiss from his dear mouth, and tell me how he fareth. But in the glen strive armoured men, they've wrought me dole and sorrow, they've slain the comeliest knight they've slain, he bleeding lies on Yarrow. As she sped down yon high, high hill, she gayed with dole and sorrow, and in the den spied ten slain men on the dowy banks of Yarrow. She kissed his cheek, she combed his hair, she searched his wounds all thorough, she kissed them till her lips grew red on the dowy homes of Yarrow. Now hold your tongue, my daughter dear, for all this breeds but sorrow. I'll wed ye to a better lord than him ye lost on Yarrow. Oh, hold your tongue, my father dear, ye mind me but of sorrow. A fairer rose did never bloom than now lies cropped on Yarrow. End of section 42。section 43 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 40 Belted Will and the Baronry of Gilsland. 
When for the lists they sought the plain, the stately lady's silken rein did noble Howard hold. Unarmed by her side he walked, and much in courteous phrase they talked of feats of arms of old. Costly his garb, his Flemish ruff fell o'er his doublet, shaped of buff, with satin slashed and lined. Tawny his boot and gold his spur, his cloak was all of Poland fur, his hose with silver twined. His bilboa blade by marchman felt, hung in a broad and studded belt. Hence in rude phrase the borderers still call noble Howard, belted Will. Scott, Lay of the Last Minstrel. One of the many picturesque figures of border history was belted Will, or to call him by his proper name and title, Lord William Howard, a younger son of the powerful Duke of Norfolk. His mother had died when he was an infant, and his father, the foremost Roman Catholic nobleman in England, took up the cause of Mary Queen of Scots, whom he wished to marry. For this treason against Queen Elizabeth, he was beheaded in 1572, when young Lord William was only nine years old. At the age of 14, the young lord's guardians arranged for him a marriage with Elizabeth Dacre, a member of a powerful border family and heiress to the baronry of Gilsland. As the bride was even younger than her boy husband, let us hope that they both went to school again immediately after the marriage. When he grew to manhood, Lord William warmly supported the Roman Catholic cause and was imprisoned by Elizabeth. But when James became king, he was released and restored to his estates on the border. Throughout the remainder of his career, he was the most notable man of his district. He knew how to make himself respected by his wild neighbours. His fame and power were great. He founded the fortunes of his family so surely that he it is who is usually thought of as the ancestor of the Earls of Carlisle, though his great-grandson was the first to hold the title. Lord William had great energy and many interests, and was remarkable as being an all-round man. He was equally a leader of men and a lover of books. No detail in the management of his estates was too small for him to study. He was a good husband to his wife and a splendid father to his fifteen children. He selected the most beautiful of his several castles, that of Naworth, and repaired and almost rebuilt it. He took there the fine old oak ceiling from the ancient castle of Kirk Oswald, which was ornamented with portraits of all the kings of England. Visitors to Naworth can see today the Hall of Belted Will, by kind permission of the present Earl of Carlisle. He was something of a poet, and very much of an antiquarian. His estates were full of interesting things, and none knew them better than he, there were miles of the Roman wall, still in excellent condition. There were many Roman altars and inscriptions, which he copied and translated. Quite near him, at Coombe Crags, was a Roman quarry, which can still be seen today, with marks of Roman tools on its stones. It stands in a beautiful wood by the side of the lovely river Irthing, and only a little further on, standing on a fine cliff overlooking the river, is the old Roman station of Amboglana, a fort that covered five and a half acres, with walls that were once five feet thick, the main foundations of which are still standing, clear enough for anyone to trace them out. It is quieter there today than it was in Roman times, or in the stirring days of belted will. It is good to think that this broad-shouldered, gallant, powerful nobleman, who could ride, shoot, fight, and keep this wild district in order, was at the same time such a clever student and bookworm. They tell a story that he was once sitting in his library intent on a book, when his men brought in a robber whom they had caught red-handed and asked Lord William to try him. Belted Will, angry at being interrupted, cried out, Don't disturb me, hang him. Half an hour later, he rose and came down to try the man, but finding that he was already hanged, he went on with his book. 
it is only fair to add that robbers in those days expected no mercy when caught. One of the many clever things that Lord William did was to have figures carved in oak to represent soldiers. These he placed on the top of his high towers and deceived the Scots into thinking that he had a large and very watchful garrison. These figures can still be seen at Naworth. Near Naworth Castle is Lanacost Priory, where King Edward I stayed on his way to Scotland. There is a secret passage from Naworth Tower which is supposed to run under the river to Lanacost. No one is allowed to go through it, as it is considered dangerous. The people of the district say that the last man to do so was Oliver Cromwell. Visitors to Naworth today should certainly go on to Gilsland itself, the picturesque, straggling little town which was the head of the baronry which Elizabeth Dacre brought to her boy husband. The Irthing at Gilsland runs through a wonderfully beautiful gorge, rocky and wooded, wild and romantic. Stand on the venturesome stepping stones near the old church, with the river rushing at your very feet, and see if this is an exaggeration of the beauties of the scene. Right in the midst of the glen, you can see the Popping Stone, where Sir Walter Scott walked with the lady of his choice and asked her to marry him. Readers of Guy Mannering can see in Over Denton Church near Gilsland the grave of Meg Merrilies, who died here at the age of 98. The town is also interesting for the fact that the county border is at Gilsland, and there is an inn so built that it stands in both counties, and contains a bed in which you can sleep, with your head in Northumberland and your feet in Cumberland. There is a story of Belted Will that tells eloquently of the strength of his character. When he was released from prison by King James, he found his estates so ruined by careless management that he knew that great care was needed to put things right again. So until he got his affairs into order, all the pocket money that he would allow himself was 20 shillings per month. Bold William, Belted Will, gallant Lord Howard, as you will, died at Naworth in 1640, aged 77, one year after the death of his devoted wife. His descendants were, like himself, students and men of action. The present Earl of Carlisle is directly sprung from him and is very proud of the fact. End of section 43《セクション44 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 41 Gilderoy. Gilderoy was a celebrated and most daring highwayman who roamed far and was well known all over Scotland and indeed in London. His death inspired a very striking ballad, but this is hardly a border lowland ballad but refers chiefly to another border district, namely that between the Lowlands and Highlands. Just as the Scottish Lowlanders thought the English their legitimate quarry, so the Highlanders in turn looked upon the Lowlanders as created to supply them with all they lacked. There is a story on record of a Highland chief who, finding his men had carelessly robbed another Highlander, returned the spoil with a handsome apology and issued stringent orders that in future nothing was to be taken except in the lowlands, where all men make their prey. Among the robber clans of the highlands, the MacGregors stand easily in the first rank. In a long series of Scottish Acts of Parliament, they are habitually referred to as the wicked clan Gregor, so long continuing in blood, slaughter, theft and robbery. One of their most famous exploits was the Battle of Glenfruin, when they defeated their enemies, the Colhouns, and slew 200 of them. The Colhouns appeared before the king at Stirling, with the bloody shirts stripped off their dead, 
and the law was put in motion against the MacGregors more vigorously than ever. This was in 1603. The execution of Gilderoy, as described in our poem, took place in 1638. His real name was Patrick MacGregor, and the fact that he belonged to this Ishmaelite clan, whose hand was directed against every man, and whose very name had been solemnly abolished, may well serve as an excuse for his career of crime. Gilderoy in Gaelic means the red-haired gilly, or lad, and besides the name, there are many other points of similarity between him and Rob Roy, who was the head of the clan MacGregor in the following century. Both Gilderoy and Rob Roy were professional blackmailers. That is, they could be relied on never to plunder anyone who was prudent enough to buy them off by paying a fixed contribution. This is what is meant in the following lines of the ballad. All these did honestly possess, he never did annoy, who never failed to pay their cess to my love Gilderoy. The cess is the blackmail or insurance against robbery. The widespread reputation of Gilderoy is attested by the many legends of him which are printed in the old chapbooks and lives of the highwaymen. According to these authorities, Gilderoy once robbed Oliver Cromwell near Glasgow. But an even more romantic episode of his career was a roaming trip upon the continent, in the course of which he is said to have picked Cardinal Richelieu's pocket while he was celebrating Mass in the King's presence at the Church of Saint-Denis in Paris. He made his way even to Madrid, where he succeeded in carrying off the Duke of Medina Cell's plate. Altogether, a most notorious and dashing cataran. The ballad is supposed to be spoken by a young woman who had all her life been attached to him. Gilderoy was a bonny boy, had roses to his shoon. His stockings were of silk and soy, with garters hanging down. It was, I ween, a comely sight to see so trim a boy. He was my jo and heart's delight, my handsome Gilderoy. My Gilderoy and I were born both in one town together. We scant were seven years before we gan to love each other. Our daddies and our mammies they were filled with meckle joy to think upon the bridal day of me and Gilderoy. But there intervened the spirit of adventure which had ever been the birthright of all of his surname. Oh, that he still had been content with me to lead his life but ah, his manful heart was bent to stir in deeds of strife, and he in many a venturous deed his courage bold would try, and now this gars my heart to bleed for my dear Gilderoy. No doubt those who knew Gilderoy personally would have agreed, as was actually said of Rob Roy, that he was a benevolent and humane man in his way. My Gilderoy, both far and near, was feared in every tune, and boldly bore away the gear of many a lowland loon. For man to man durst meet him none, he was so brave a boy. At length with numbers he was tain, my winsome Gilderoy. He was not so fortunate as Rob Roy, who ultimately died peacefully in his bed. Gilderoy had lost the game, and he had to pay the stakes. Of Gilderoy, so feared were they, they bound him fast and strong. To Edinburgh they led him there, and on a gallows hung. They hung him high above the rest, he was so trim a boy. There died the youth whom I love best, my handsome Gilderoy. Thus perished one of the characteristic products of an age whose standards were so different from ours that we can hardly judge him fairly. He was banned before his birth, a scion of a race so indomitably and innately ferocious that the law attempted to extirpate them root and branch. The very name of Gregor could be given by no clergyman at baptism under penalty of deprivation and banishment. Cunning and politic neighbours were not slow to take advantage of the stubborn disposition of the MacGregors and gradually strip them of their once extensive lands in Argyll and Perthshire. Gilderoy might well consider 
that he was an honester man than stood on any of their shanks. And we may be excused for feeling a very lively sympathy with him, and for echoing in our inmost hearts the exquisitely feminine point of view expressed by the lady composer of the ballad. If Gilderoy had done amiss, he might have banished been. Ah, oh, what sore cruelty is this, to hang such handsome men, to hang the flower of Scottish land, so sweet and fair a boy. No lady had so white a hand as thee, my Gilderoy. When he had yielded up his breath, I bear his corpse away, with tears that trickled for his death, I washed his comely clay, and sicker in a grave so deep, I laid the dear loved boy, and now for ever mon I weep, my winsome Gilderoy. End of section 44section 45 of stories of the scottish border by mr and mrs william platt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 42 archie armstrong's oath and oft since then to england's king the story he has told and i when he gan rock and sing charlie his sides would hold Archie Armstrong lived in Eskdale, where he did his best to keep up the grand reputation of his family as being among the very boldest sheep stealers of the border. His house was at Stubham, where the walk up stream runs into the River Esk, near where the picturesque town of Langham now stands. Living in the reign of Charles I, after the Union of Crowns, the profession of freebooter was far less honourable than of old. He could not now plead that he was a border soldier fighting against his nation's enemy. The wild border blood in him might cry out for the old adventurous career, but he could no longer hope for the aid of powerful border families. When cornered, his sole protector would be his own wits, and woe betide him if they failed. Archie's house was about eight miles from the border, and he could not help strolling towards the fascinating line and tasting the sweetness of temptation. When the chance came that seemed to him sufficiently safe, he would go home in company, though he had walked out alone, the company being a good, fat English sheep. One night a shepherd had marked him lingering about, and had watched him and raised an alarm. Away went stout Archie at a marathon pace. Halfway home he passed Gilnocky Tower, where his ancestor, bold Johnny Armstrong, lived so gaily. Alas, thought Archie dolefully, he too was hanged in the end. He got home well in front of his pursuers, but his wife gave him small encouragement. With typical Scottish dourness, she remarked to him, Ye will be tain this night and hanged in the morning. But Archie put a braw face on it and declared that he would never hang for one silly sheep. Quicker than any butcher, he skinned and roughly trimmed the dead animal, throwing the rejected parts into the swift stream. Then, rejoicing in the fact that his child was away with its aunt, he put the carcass carefully in the cradle and began rocking it and singing a lullaby to it, as if he were the most loving father in all the British Isles. The pursuers now rushed in and began to accuse Archie triumphantly, but he rebuked them for making so much noise, telling them that his child was at death's door. As for stealing their sheep, he took a solemn oath that if he had done such a thing, he would ask to be doomed to eat the flesh this very cradle holds. Such an oath on the borders was a very serious matter. They little knew that the only flesh in the cradle was sheep's flesh, which Archie asked nothing better than to devour. 
Impressed, but not convinced, his enemies carefully searched the whole of Archie's house and garden. It was only with very great unwillingness that they at last decided that they must miss the supreme pleasure of hanging him. They went away, saying that they must have been deluded by the devil or by witches, and the shepherd resolved to hang a branch of a rowan tree, mountain ash, by his fold, for that was well known to have the power to keep witches away. As soon as they were all on their way to England again, Archie skipped about like a dancing fiddler. Wife, he said, I never knew before that I would make such a good nurse. After this, Archie wandered down to London, and his wild jests becoming famous, he was made court jester by King Charles I. And many a time he acted the story to the king, rocking a pretended cradle and singing a persuasive lullaby to the king's intense amusement. Nevertheless, Archie lost his place by his boldness. These were the days of Archbishop Lord, 1637, who was hated by the Scots. One day, as the Archbishop was about to say grace before dinner, Archie asked the king's permission to say grace instead. The king consented, and the jester's double-meaning words were as follows. All praise to God, and little Lord to the devil. The Archbishop, in many senses a little man, had Archie dismissed in disgrace, but such were the chances of these uncertain times, the Archbishop was executed in the end, while the sheep stealer escaped that fate. End of section 45「Section 46 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 43 Christie's Will The resourceful Archie, whose tale we have just told, was not the only one of the reckless Armstrongs to keep up the old freebooting habits in the reign of Charles I. There lived at Gilnocky Tower, the old residence of the famous Johnny Armstrong, in the parish of Canobie, a notorious Willie Armstrong, known as Christie's Will. Like Archie, he more than once owed his life to his ready wit. He was shut up in Jedburgh Jail when the Earl of Traquair, Lord High Treasurer, paid the prison an official visit. When he asked Will the cause of his being there, the freebooter answered, for stealing two halters, my lord. Traquair was surprised, but Will afterwards owned that there was a fine colt at the end of each halter. Traquair was amused and pleased by the boldness of the man and had him set free. Some little time afterwards, Traquair was involved in a lawsuit which was set down to be decided by Lord Dury, who seems to have let it be known beforehand what his opinion was upon the case. Nothing would save Traquair's interests, except that Dury must be got out of the way before the case began. But how was it to be done? Christie's will was appealed to, and merely said, Leave it to me. It was the judge's habit to take horseback exercise on the sands of Leith without any attendant. One morning, while so riding, a well-dressed and gentlemanly stranger on a good horse happened to overtake him. A courteous greeting led to a friendly conversation, in which the stranger proved himself so affable and entertaining that the judge rode on by his side without suspicion. Suddenly, when they had come to a lonely spot, Lord Dury found himself seized by this muscular gentleman, smothered up in a big cloak, whisked off his horse and on to the strangers, who galloped off mischief knows where. It was Christie's will, carrying out his promise. The judge's horse galloped home riderless. Search was made, but the judge could not be found. It could only be supposed that he had been thrown off into the sea. His successor was appointed, and Lord Traquair's case was heard and won. Lord Dury had languished for several months in a dreary underground vault. I wonder if he thought of the many poor wretches he had sentenced to a similar fate. Suddenly, 
at midnight he was roughly awakened, muffled up as before, and carried away again by his captor on horseback. Next morning, by the light of the newly risen sun, he found himself on the very spot by the sands of Leith from which he had been kidnapped. We will hope that everyone, including his successor, was glad when he thus came to life again. When the Civil War began, the Earl of Traquair was faithful to King Charles I. Having some papers of importance that he wished to have given into the King's own hands, he entrusted these to the bold freebooter. Christie's will did his errand and received an equally important answer. But spies at court had given Cromwell word of the matter, and the command was sent up to Carlisle that Will Armstrong must be intercepted there. Not knowing his danger, Will halted in the town to refresh his horse, then pushed forward to the bridge which crossed the Eden on the northern boundary of the city. Cromwell's soldiers were waiting for him. The bridge was high and narrow. The broad Eden waters were swirling in high flood. Christie's will, without one second's hesitation, spurred his horse over the parapet. He sank, he came up, he sank, he came up, he sank, he came up, this time at the very bank. He cut his heavy, dripping cloak from his shoulders. Relieved of the weight, his horse struggled to the land. Away went Will, away went the troopers after him. It was a hard race to the River Esk, and this also Will had to swim. But now he was in Scotland, and his friends were at hand. Gaily, Will turned to his pursuers, who dared not cross the water. Good friends, cried he, come over and drink with me. But they showed him their backs and their horses' tails, and he saw no more of them. Such were the exploits of Christie's Will. He was the last of the freebooters, but he certainly knew how to live up to their boldest traditions. End of section 46. Section 47 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 44 Northumberland at the Time of the Civil War. During the stormy days of King Charles I, the borders, and especially Northumberland, saw many stirring scenes. It must be remembered that shortly before the Long Parliament was elected, King Charles almost came to war with the Scottish Presbyterians, because they would not obey the harsh rule of Archbishop Lord. The Scots raised an army under the lead of shrewd General Alexander Leslie, the old, little, crooked soldier of great experience trained by the great Gustavus of Sweden. In 1639, Charles sent ships up to the Forth, in reply to which Leslie marched his army to threaten the border. The old quarrel between the two countries began to blaze up again. King Charles led an army to the border and was received with splendid applause at Newcastle. Many joined his army and shouted with joy at the thought of meeting the Scots in battle but they were an untrained, disorderly crew who fired off their guns at random and kept no military order whatever. Gallant Leslie marched his men down to Dunn's Law in South Berwickshire and was ready to fight. But King Charles would not trust his army that length. He made terms with his opponents, promising them the reforms they set their hearts upon, and the two armies melted away like schoolboys at the end of the term. Things were soon as bad as before. Lord Conway was sent by the King to put Newcastle into a strong defensive state. His greatest difficulty was to get money for the purpose, for the King's quarrel with his various parliaments had deprived him of supplies. The badly paid troops mutinied, and the ringleader was shot. Very soon the Scottish army came across the Tweed, the Highlanders armed with bows and arrows. They pitched their camp on Hedden Law, and soon proved to the country folk that they had not come for plunder, but would pay for all they wanted to eat. This reassured the country people, who had no real quarrel with the Scots, 
and even became most friendly to them. With Lord Conway it was otherwise. He was the king's officer and was bound to offer resistance. His opinion was that if once the Scots crossed the Tyne and attacked Newcastle from the south or Gateshead side, they were sure of victory. Accordingly, leaving a strong garrison to protect the town, he marched out with 2,000 or more foot and fully 1,000 horse to command the important ford across the Tyne at Newburn, a place five or six miles due west of Newcastle. It is interesting to remember that here also the Romans had had fortifications along the line of the wall, and the very spot where the Scots and English fought may well have been the scene of contests between the Roman legions and the wild Picts. The English arrived first on the south bank of the river and threw up earthworks hastily. Very soon they saw the Scots march into Newburn village on the north bank, where they employed themselves by hauling their cannon up to the church tower. Remarkable cannon they were, made out of bar iron hooped together with cord and wet raw hides. But they were not required to carry any distance, the foe was only on the other side of the Tyne. All the morning the enemies looked at one another across the river, each hesitating to fire the first shot of the war. At last an English officer shot a Scotch officer, and the fight began. The Scots were on the higher ground, and their cannon, rough as they were, sent heavy shot onto the English. Then, when the river tide went down, the Scots rushed across the ford, and the battle was soon won, the royal standard being taken. English runaways rushed through the woods and into Newcastle, crying, Fly for your lives! Naked devils have destroyed us! Whether they referred to kilted highlanders is uncertain. Anyway, Leslie and his Scots entered Newcastle in triumph, but were afterwards bought off with a payment of £60,000 and recrossed the Tweed into Scotland. This was in 1641, a year in which King Charles was quarrelling bitterly with his long parliament, though the actual civil war in England did not begin until 1642. Early in 1642, it was decided that so important a town as Newcastle ought to be put in a stronger state of defence. William Cavendish, Earl of Newcastle, was made governor of the town, but he was much hindered in his plans by lack of money. King Charles, however, promoted him from Earl to Marquis of Newcastle, and the lack of funds he made up as best he was able. However, the governor of Holy Island, off the Northumberland shore, found himself left for 16 months without any pay. He wrote to the king's treasury a protest in verse, beginning, The great commander of the cormorants, the geese and ganders of these hallowed lands, where Lindisfarne and Holy Island stands, these worthless lines sends to your worthy hands. The allusion in the first two lines is to the fact that Holy Island and the Farne Islands were then, and are still today, so thinly peopled that seabirds gather there in large numbers, adding greatly to the wild beauty of these islets and rocks. In January 1644, a serious struggle began. Leslie and his soldiers crossed the Tweed at Berwick Bridge and again entered Northumberland. General Bailey marched his men from Kelso across the frozen river and joined Leslie at Annick. Walkworth Castle, though it contained cannon and provisions, surrendered at once. The Scottish general gravely told Bemerton, the governor, that if he had learnt to fight as well as he had learnt to dance, his castle could never have been taken. The country districts of Northumberland had no quarrel with the Scots, and it was soon evident that the real fight would be at Newcastle, bravely held by the Marquis and by the Mayor, Sir John Marley. The Scottish murdering pieces, as the cannon were called, were brought down by sea, and the obstinate conflict began. Despite the terrible weather of a very rough February, frequent skirmishes took place while the Scots closed nearer and nearer round the gallantly defended town. Leslie soon found that the defences had been put into good order. 
The ditch round the town was dug deep and close to the walls. The walls themselves were strongly underpinned. The battlements were strengthened by stone and lime, but the top stones were loosened so as to slip if the enemy attempted to mount them. Every cannon was placed carefully to the best advantage. But the Marquis of Newcastle was called southwards by the needs of his king. With him were his thousand brave white coats, so called because they wore white coats, which they promised to die in the blood of the enemy. But they met the terrible Ironsides at Marston Moor, and in a conflict of furious bravery on both sides, all of the gallant thousand except thirty were slain on the field of battle. This was in July of 1644, but it did not affect the siege of Newcastle, which still dragged obstinately on under the skilful guidance of the dauntless mayor. By October, Sir John Marley was so buoyed up by his success that he sent a letter to General Leslie to ask if he was still alive. This the Scots took to be an insult, and a grand assault was begun. The Scots were furious, and the defence was desperate. The roar of the cannon and the rattle of the musketry were succeeded, as the assault got nearer and nearer to its aim, by the clashing of swords and the clanging of pikes. At last, the regiments of Loudoun and Buccleuch succeeded in forcing their way into the town. In vain the defendants made their last gallant charge. Their cause was now hopeless, and soon the marketplace was filled with fugitives, who flung down their arms and cried aloud for quarter at the hands of the triumphant Scots. In these days, the defender was often made to feel the anger of the victors, who, in the flush and cruelty of victory, avenged their dead only too terribly upon the losing side. Not so at Newcastle. Prominent in its day, it stands out because of the mercy of the Scottish conquerors as much as for the heroism of its defence. In this, the last great struggle on English ground between Scots and English, it is pleasing indeed to recall facts that redound to the high honour of both parties. End of section 47section 48 of stories of the scottish border by mr and mrs william platt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 45 montrose and leslie james graham the great marquis of montrose who at first sided with the scottish covenanters against charles i was so out of sympathy with the extreme turn which affairs took later against that unhappy monarch, that he went over to the king's side. Gathering the Highland clans under his standard, he marched southward and defeated the Covenanters in a series of brilliantly fought battles. He occupied Edinburgh and laid great plans to complete the conquest of Scotland by subduing the borderland. If the borders had remained in their old fighting state, no doubt many a border chief would have joined Montrose's army and aided his bold plans. But, unfortunately for King Charles, the borders had been tamed and disarmed since the union of England and Scotland under James I. Only a few adventurous spirits, like Christie's Will, remained as examples of the old wild days. The remnant of the army of the Covenanters was commanded by the stern General David Leslie, not the Alexander Leslie, who figures in the preceding chapter, and was somewhere in the border district. Gay, gallant Montrose did not bother as to exactly where this army was. He despised it too heartily. He himself was at Selkirk, while his army was encamped on the neighbouring plain of Philip Hoare. Montrose was busy writing a cheering message to King Charles, to the effect that he had now no enemy left in Scotland who could offer an effective resistance to his arms. Little did he think that General Leslie was gradually creeping nearer, nearer, and was now actually within four miles of his army. With the advantage of a thick Scotch mist, 
Leslie's army actually burst upon Montrose's infantry without a single scout having seen them to give warning of their approach. In such confusion, Montrose's men had no chance whatever. The Marquis galloped up, only to find his soldiers hopelessly defeated and great numbers slain. There was nothing left but for those to escape who could. The Marquis succeeded in cutting his way through and gathered his troops to fight again later on, but his efforts were doomed to failure. A popular ditty of these days, sung to a stirring tune, was called Leslie's March. Sir Walter Scott seems to regard this as wholly serious and ranks it as a covenant a song. It appears to me, however, that many of the lines have a very sarcastic flavour. No doubt the covenanters did really think that there's none in the right but we of the old Scottish nation, but they would probably have phrased it a little less baldly. To me it appears as if this song were the work of an onlooker and not a partisan, one ready to see the faults of both sides and very much inclined to hold back his final opinion till he saw which was going to win. But let the march speak for itself. Leslie's March. March, march. Why the deal do you now march? Stand to your arms, my lads, fight in good order. Front about, ye musketeers all, till you come to the English border. Stand, dilt, and fight like men, true gospel to maintain. The Parliament's blithe to see us a-coming, when to the kirk we come, we'll purge it ilka room, free popish relics and a sick innovation, that all the world may see there's none in the right but we of the old Scottish nation. A truly partisan ballad of the day describes the Battle of Philip Hoare and exults in the defeat of Montrose, our cruel enemy it calls him. As a ballad, it has no great poetic merit. The very sober covenanters probably regarded ballad-making as a frivolity, but it describes rather graphically how an aged father from the countryside led Leslie's army very cautiously and wisely to the very tents of the foe. These details are no doubt accurate, though the ballad writer, whoever he was, displays his ignorance of other matters by making the old soldier say that he was at the Battle of Solway Moss, which took place 100 years before, and at that of Dunbar, which was not fought till five years later. The following are the opening verses of the ballad, giving an idea of its plain, straightforward style. On Philip Hoare a fray began, at Hare Head Wood it ended. The Scots out o'er the Grahams they ran, say merrily they bended. Sir David Frey the border came, we heart and hand came he. We him three thousand bonny Scots, to bear him company. We him three thousand valiant men, a noble sight to see. A cloud o' mist them weel concealed, as close as e'er might be. When they came to the shore burn, said he, Say weel we frame, I think it is convenient that we should sing a psalm. It is not necessary to quote more of it, but it may be remarked that in place of the last line, as given here, the unregenerate substituted that we should take a dram. In point of actual fact, both versions are probably true. End of section 48「Section 49 of Stories of the Scottish Border by Mr. and Mrs. William Platt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 46 The Death of Montrose During the imprisonment of King Charles I, at a time when active war on his behalf might do the unhappy monarch more harm than good, the gallant Montrose had retired to France. His bright military fame, his courteous manners and manly bearing made him friends everywhere. And when he visited Germany, the Emperor conferred on him the rank of Marshal. Hearing of the execution of Charles I, Montrose at once placed himself at the disposal of Charles II, 
now a fugitive in Holland. This prince named him Captain General of Scotland, and the daring hero set out for the Orkney Islands with about 500 paid soldiers, mostly adventurous Germans and Dutchmen. Only a reckless spirit like Montrose would have undertaken so wild a commission. Scotland was heartily sick of war, and learnt with consternation of the arrival of this firebrand. Leslie was sent forward with 4,000 men to attack Montrose's 500. Colonel Strachan led the advanced guard, which fell unexpectedly upon the invading army, and after a brief, fierce struggle, totally defeated it. Montrose, disguised as a peasant, entrusted his life to one he believed to be his friend, Mudloud, Laird of Assant. But this unworthy man betrayed him to his bitterest enemy, General Leslie. Thus, at last, this brilliant commander was in the hands of the bitter Covenanters, into whose hearts his brilliant victories had once spread such terror. Their treatment of him is a black stain upon their memory. For days he was led about in the peasant's disguise which he had put on. He was carted through the streets of Edinburgh, accompanied by such insults that the populace cried shame upon his captors. When tried before the Scottish Parliament for treason, he made a most eloquent defence, one of the most notable of his assertions being that he had never stained his victory by slaughtering his foes in cold blood after the battle. In this, he was far above his enemies, who had disgraced their victory of Philip Hoare by many an execution, and who were now bent upon taking the life of Montrose himself. The sentence against him was probably decided before his defence had been heard. It ran thus, that James Graham should next day be carried to Edinburgh Cross and there hanged on a gibbet thirty feet high for the space of three hours, then to be taken down, his head to be struck off on a scaffold and affixed to the prison, his arms and legs to be stuck up on the four chief towns of the kingdom, his body to be buried in the place set aside for common criminals. To this sentence, the great Marquis haughtily replied that he would rather have his head so placed than his picture in the king's bedchamber, and that he wished he had limbs enough to be dispersed into all the cities of Christendom to prove his dying attachment to his king. And in the one evening of life that still remained to him, this accomplished and fearless nobleman employed his time in turning these loyal sentiments into verse. Despite the fact that he triumphed undaunted over all the mean inventions of their malice, his enemies persisted to the end. The executioner tied mockingly round his neck the book that had been published describing his victories. Montrose thanked him, saying that he wore it with more pride than he had ever worn the garter of honour. He uttered a short prayer, then asking them what more indignities they had prepared for him, he patiently and with unbroken spirit yielded his life to the hangman at the too early age of thirty-eight. Whatever opinions we may have as to the rights and wrongs of this quarrel, this brutal killing of a gallant soldier and accomplished gentleman can only rank as a hideous blot upon all concerned in it. Every insult hurled at Montrose has returned in the verdict of time with redoubled force against the malice of those who stooped to such vindictiveness. The execution of a soldier who has violated no rule of war is at any time a thing that revolts the human conscience, and a sentence hoarse with the vile taunts of its utterers has so far lost all semblance of justice that it is needless to argue upon it. In the verdict of history, the great Marquis of Montrose, whether right or wrong in his political views, lived and died like a man of honour. The ballad of the gallant Grahams, written about this time, reflects very sincerely and touchingly the devotion and affection surrounding the great Marquis, accompanied by the very Scottish feeling that in addition to his own personal power and genius, he was also the head of the great border family of Grahams. The Gallant Grahams now fare thee well, sweet Ennerdale, 
Faith kin and country I bid adieu, for I mun away, and I may not stay, to some uncouth land which I never knew. To wear the blue I think it best of all the colours that I see, and I'll wear it for the gallant Grahams that are banished from their country. I have no gold, I have no land, I have no pearl, no precious stone, but I will sell my silken snood to see the gallant Grahams come home. In Wallace days when they began, Sir John the Graham did bear the gree through all the lands of Scotland wide. He was lord of the south country. And so was seen full many a time, for the summer flowers did never spring, but every Graham in armour bright would then appear before the king. They were all dressed in armour sheen upon the pleasant banks of Tay. Before a king they might be seen these gallant Grahams in their array. At the gowk head our camp we set, our leaguer down there for to lay, and in the bonny summer light we rode our white horse and our grey. Our false commander sold our king unto his deadly enemy, who was the traitor Cromwell then, so I care not what they do with me. They have betrayed our noble prince and banished him from his royal crown, but the gallant Grahams have ta'en in hand for to command those traitors down. In Glen Prozen we rendezvoused, marched to Glen Shee by night and day, and took the town of Aberdeen, and met the Campbells in their array. Five thousand men in armour strong did meet the gallant Grahams that day, at Inverlochy where war began, and scarce two thousand men were they. Gallant Montrose, that chieftain bold, courageous in the best degree, did for the king fight well that day. The Lord preserve his majesty. Then woe to Strachan, and he lack at baith, and Leslie, ill death, may thou die, for ye have betrayed the gallant Grahams, who I were true to majesty. And the laird of Assant has seized Montrose, and had him into Edinburgh town, and Frey his body taken the head, and quartered him upon a throne. And Huntley's gone the selfsame way, our noble king is also gone. He suffered death for our nation. Our mourning tears can ne'er be done. But our brave young king is now come home, King Charles the Second in degree. The Lord send peace into his time, and God preserve his majesty. The ballad writer's reference to the coming home of Charles the Second probably means his signing of the covenant and placing himself entirely at the mercy of the violent bigots who had killed his most faithful servant, Montrose. To this was Charles reduced by the desperate nature of his fortunes. But this course of action entirely severed the Scottish Covenanters from the English Puritans, and admirers of the gallant Montrose can take a grim pleasure in the fact that his arch-enemy, General Leslie, was most disastrously defeated by Cromwell at the Battle of Dunbar. End of section 49